Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the seventh biennial Grant Wood Symposium, a home and studio of one's own. I thank Jim Hayes, founder of the Grant Wood Art Colony, chair of its National Advisory Board, and current owner of Grant Wood's Iowa City Home and Studio. In the early 2000s, Mr. Hayes decided to revive Grant Wood's legacy at the University of Iowa. In cooperation with the University of Iowa president and provost, he established a rotating community of artists modeled after the colonies that Wood tried to establish in his lifetime. The colony seeks to provide a creative home for the next generation of artists and continue Grant Wood's creative advocacy in the School of Art and Art History and the Division of Performing Arts at the University of Iowa. In 1924, Cedar Rapids businessman John B. Turner invited Grant Wood to use his mortuary's hayloft as a studio. Wood realized that if he also made it his residence, he could quit his day job and focus entirely on his creative process. Thus, Turner, Grant Wood, Turner granted Wood time and space to make work. Mr. Hayes had a similar vision to continue Wood's legacy. He developed the Grant Wood Art Colony, which in addition to holding symposia such as these and conducting outreach, he would host fellows each year. These art fellows would live near Grant Wood's Iowa City home, teach one class per semester and have time and space to make work. This year, we are marking the 10th anniversary of the fellowship program and our 30th fellow. We conceived this symposium three years ago. Esteemed scholar and National Advisory Board member Wanda Korn might have seen it as a way to merge two of her board commitments, that on the Grantwood Art Colony and the Historic Artists Homes and Studios, also known as Haas. Little did she know that this topic also merged two of my passions, art history and historic preservation. While a student at the School of the Art Institute, I visited the Roger Brown studio and sat in awe of his collections, but was also thrilled when the in-house video featured Five Turner Alley, a hallowed place in my hometown of Cedar Rapids. This topic spoke to me. It also afforded the opportunity to work closely with Valerie Bayland, the director of Haas, and Sean Ulmer, the director of the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, to plan this symposium. Evidently, the topic spoke to all of you as well. Our call for papers reaped thoughtful insights into the what artists' spaces meant to those who dwelt in them. While we intended to hold the symposium in 2020, I think that now we can all better relate to our homes being sources of sanctuary and inspiration. During quarantine, many of us took up hobbies or redecorated to serve our creative cravings or an attempt to better reflect ourselves and inhabit our spaces. Over the next few days, you'll learn about the studios and homes in which artists created and sought refuge. In many cases, these spaces became works of art in their own right. To be honest, I'm a little concerned about some of the decorative ideas I might rationalize transferring to my own home. Finally, I would like to introduce Wanda Korn, Robert and Ruth Halpern Professor Emerita in Art History at Stanford University, author, and as I mentioned, Grant Wood Art Colony National Advisory Board member. Dr. Korn will now open this symposium. Let me welcome uh, you again, uh, those of you here in the room and those of you out there in the virtual world. It's my very pleasant job this afternoon to be the introducer, the introducer of the subject of this symposium, because it's a very unusual topic, given that it's not about the art that artists have made and left behind in museum and galleries. It's rather about something else that they made, the homes and studios where they lived and worked. So just as a way of maybe kicking this uh, off, let me ask rhetorically, since I can't see all of you, but how many of our audience, you can at least sort of uh, pretend that you're waving at me, uh, have visited the following two sites. This one, the site of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner in East Hampton, New York. I just see a few hands going up. Or this one the Georgia O'Keeffe Home and Studio in Abiquiu, New Mexico. And here we have, I would say maybe two to three times as many hands going up. That's terrific. But what I think I'm most impressed by is that many of you have not been to either site um, because I know that this topic or this 
kind of destination is relatively new uh, to our country and its availability has really only been uh, made manifest in the last 20 years or so. In fact, it's really only in the last quarter of a century that this country's begun to preserve and open and learn from artist domiciles. We've been much better at saving and interpreting er, artists, uh, excuse me, we've been much better at saving and interpreting presidents' homes and birthplaces or places where George Washington slept or Gilded Age villas and mansions of the very rich. Better at that than the places that creative artists have put together. Only recently have we realized the emotional and intellectual rewards of saving some of the extraordinary physical and material environments that artists created to support their habits and their vision. This symposium, symposium will introduce to you a wide variety of sites, some well-preserved that you can visit, some that alas have been lost, and some looking for fairy godmothers and godfathers to keep them intact. If you stay, uh, stay with us for the weekend, and we hope you will, we will have given you an, expl an exploratory roadmap to what can be learned and experienced in buildings, landscapes, and places that artists create to sustain themselves, their families, and friends. And to be perfectly candid, there's advocacy embedded in this program. We want you to get excited about what this country has done and needs yet to do to preserve a broad-based history of creativity. We want your help in saving artists' places. In my few minutes here, I wanna give you a touch of autobiography and then tell you a little bit about the formation of HAZ, Historic Artists Homes and Studios, that is a co-sponsor of this symposium. My remarks will be followed by a deeper exploration of Haas by Valerie Bellend, and then we will turn to Joni Kinsey's paper on Grant Wood's two monumental domestic creations, the two that you just heard referred to uh, by Mara, his loft in Cedar Rapids and his mid 19th century historic home in Iowa City. I am something of a junkie on artist homes and I try to visit at least two new sites every year. I began this in the late 1970s when I was a newly minted PhD art historian undertaking a self-generated self research project, The Life and Art of Grant Wood. In noodling around Iowa to find and talk with people who had known the artist, they invariably brought up Wood's offbeat homes and encouraged me to see them. Both were being lived in but I found ways to visit them. Uh, uh, and you're going to be hearing much more about them tonight from Joni Kinsey, and then uh, about one of them, the Cedar Rapids uh, studio uh, Sunday from Sean Ulmer. So I'm gonna say a little about them now. Other than this, those sites, once I got into each of them, and I did in the first summer that I was spending in Iowa, became an archive for me. They taught me things about the particular intelligence and talents of this artist that I would not otherwise have easily, if ever, uncovered. None of my art tr history training had taught me to probe the physical sites of an artist's life, what we in the academy like to call the material culture that an artist has left behind, to probe it and use it as a way of then explaining better his art. And it's become since then one of my mantras as a teacher, which is to tell my students when they're working on an artist, uh, if they're doing particularly a monographic study on an artist, make sure you go to the site of the crime. By which I mean, go to the site of where something happened, where they lived or where they worked. Wood's attention to detail, his keen sense of design, his humor, his metalwork in the Cedar Rapids loft styled space helped me to see the same elements in American Gothic, which is a painting he made in this very space. I learned for instance, that he had a builder's intelligence and knew something about architectural styles. No wonder that a little carpenter Gothic farmhouse with its oversized window called out to him in Eldon, Iowa. The fact that he had created with his own hands an unpretentious 
multi-purpose, multifunctional living space. Help me understand the degree to which he came from the same stock as his hardworking couple with their tidy homestead. I also tracked down Wood's home in Iowa City. And when I knocked on the door, this is in the mid 1970s, uh, apparently I guess I was un announced, at least that's what this nice guy in the lower right tells me, that's Mr. Hayes, Mr. Jim Hayes, who lives there. Uh, he let me in and showed me around. He himself had just arrived in the house uh, a few weeks or months earlier uh, and was just um, settling in. Let's jump ahead then to 1986, one decade later, when I was on a fellowship at the Smithsonian and I lived, I had the pleasure of living in what was called a studio house, capital S, capital H, of a Washington artist not well known today, but her name was Alice Pike Barney, lower right here. And this was the space that she had designed for herself in the early 1900s hundreds, by Waddy Wood on a very important circle, Sheridan Circle in Washington, DC. It's a most unusual structure for DC, built by a gilded age woman of means whose other homes were mansions. This one had living quarters in the upper stories, but basically the two lower stories were dedicated to what she thought of as her art spaces. And that's what you see in the two pictures um, in the middle, particularly one's uh, a hallway, or, or, well, they're both, they're both part of the same space, a very large space, as you can see, with a balcony for musicians um, uh, that is at the um, rear. Alice. Pike Barney was, like Isabella Stewart Gardner in, Wash in Boston, an advocate for the arts. And she saw DC as a cultural backwater, as it was in her lifetime. There were no, none of the museums it's famous for today had yet been established. She was in a poor marriage and she traveled abroad to study and basically to escape the home life that was not happy for her in DC. She studied primarily with Whistler, and, uh, and that was in both London and in Paris. And she brought back to this country his ideas about studios that would be open spaces that could serve both privately as a workspace, but also when needed could be cleared out um, or at least cleaned up uh, to become a public space. Her studio had a beautiful tiled floor, um, Tiffany-like windows and was large enough to host modern dance concerts and Ruth St. Dennis famously danced in it and also musicals or music ensembles. It also could serve as a gallery space to showcase her paintings and paintings done by her friends. And I should say that the floor is of Mercer tiles and we'll be hearing a great deal about Henry Mercer a little bit later on in another paper. It's a long story, but Alice Pike Barney's daughters Natalie Clifford Barney, the poet, lesbian poet, and Laura Clifford Barney gave their mother's home and artwork to the Smithsonian because she'd always wanted to create an art space and they received it in 1961. But then in the 1990s, the powers in charge decided to sell the house because as someone put it at the time, the Smithsonian did not own historic homes. They weren't collecting that of, of, of the many things they did. That was not one of them. I was continuing to educate myself uh, at that point about extant hardest homes across the country. And I had done enough work to learn that there were only a handful of urban studio houses of this vintage uh, and of this size, and that this was absolutely the only one in the country in the public domain. So when the Alice Pike Barney House was put on the market, I, with others, formed a group, Friends of Alice Pike Barney, to try and save it. Today, the Barney House is the Latvian embassy. In other words, we failed. The house was sold. But there was a silver lining. Our efforts raised the awareness of the National Trust, then located in the Washington mansion just a mile or two away. The trust mission 
is to save physical places of historic and cultural importance. And the Barney House loss made it clear that this country was not doing a good job preserving artist spaces. When this happened 20 years ago, there were artist sites here and there staffed and open to the public. But as I learned, because I researched it further, trying to understand the phenomena of the preserved home, but also the fact that, uh, there was, that, that we all knew so little about them, I found that they were scattered. They had little visibility beyond their local environs. There was no networking whatsoever between them. In what I would now call a visionary um, uh, initiative, the trust, the National Trust went after grant money. Thank you, Luce Foundation. And eventually other foundations like the Wyeth and Terra helped to, to create an umbrella organization of 20 properties across the country. One of the founding properties was the Grantwood Studio Home in Cedar Rapids. It was a membership program, a consortium we call it, that they then named Historic Artists Homes and Properties. These 20 properties be, uh, have grown to 55 in number today, hailing from 25 different states. It's a national organization. It includes, and just to give you a, a quick, very quick overview, it includes old master chestnuts like Thomas Cole's studio and not far um, away, the beautiful Olana or Frederick Church studio in Hudson, um, New York. It also includes less known artists um, who left behind unique spaces, often some of them anyway, are women. And you see here the Grace Hudson house. She was a painter um, and mostly of Native American um, portraits um, uh, in California, Clementine Hunter, an African-American artist who did the murals in Africa House at uh, Melrose Plantation, and Elizabeth Ney in Austin, Texas, who did this wonderful little um, uh, castellette uh, in uh, what was countryside then and, and did some farming as well. She was a very experimental uh, woman. Along with these, you get many 20th century studios of architectural distinction, such as the Freulinghausen Morris home in Lenox, Massachusetts, uh, that was put together by uh, Susie Freulinghausen and George L.K. Morris. This is in the Berkshires, just down the road from Tanglewood. And you can see there at the top two pictures, the in situ murals. This happened to be by Morris, but we have some by, by Susie in the dining room and others by Morris in the living room. They're, they're in situ, they're, they're wall murals. Um, and they also have a collection of European work and beautiful uh, Art Deco furniture. And below Donald Judd's um, rehabilitation of a 19th century industrial building, which you can see from the exterior um, in Soho, that he furnished with pieces he had designed, furniture that he had designed, and showcased, uh, use it also to showcase his and his friend's minimalist um, art. Haas sites have to meet certain criteria for membership. They are, have to be authentic sites, not reconstructed. They have to be cared for, open to the public, that's very important, and interpreted. Their ownership and administration, however, we have no rules about because it could not be more varied. Some are run by foundations, some by grassroots organizations, some are state or city properties, Others belong to art schools, universities, and museums. Two are national parks, San Gardens and Weir Farm, and one, Chesterwood, like the home of Daniel Chester French, is owned by the National Trust. And Chesterwood, by the way, is where the head office of Haas uh, is nicely located. Some are completely furnished. Some are bare bones. Some have lots of art, like the two examples that you're looking at now, some little to none. However, what they have is site and place. Haas organizes a member's workshop every three years and promotes the sites collectively on an impressive website and in their newsletters. And I encourage you to check that out. Very easy to find. Just put in artists, homes, and studios and it'll pop right back up. Um, um, I think perhaps I can say the grandest 
the, the grandest achievement that Haas has made over the last 20 years is to make the preservation of our homes and environments nationally visible. Before I hand over the podium to the woman who manages the consortium, I wanna make a last observation. Visiting an artist's home is a very different experience than going to a museum. There are far more var variables to the experience. For starters, visits usually require some planning because most artists don't live on USA uh, main streets. So getting to where they settled becomes part of the experience. And once you've arrived, it becomes an immersive experience in a new place. You move through an unusual space, usually with all your senses at work, seeing, smelling, hearing, and feeling the foreign terrain underfoot. You look in and out of the windows, taking in the nature of living spaces that most likely are different and foreign to your own. The experience may be highly curated by staff or having been highly curated by the artists before them, but often it is not. Many artist places encourage roaming and unstructured imagining as to what it would be like to live there and enjoying the creative soul who's constructed the space. Let me give you a couple of concrete examples of the strange and wonderful experiences that Haas sites afford. For example, getting to Abiquiu, New Mexico to see Georgia O'Keeffe's home and studio requires a major road trip. There are no trains, buses, airplanes that can get you to Abiquiu. Furthermore, you need a reservation, I might add, if you uh, are going to go make sure that you call with plenty of time ahead of time to get your slot because they take very small groups on very special days. You have to drive 60 miles northwest of Santa Fe and that's downtown Santa Fe in the upper right. You have to leave the bustle of the city, drive past the malls and strip culture of gas stations and fast food, get past Española and begin. And there's my map, our site is uh, the circled abiquiu. Um, I can see that Santa Fe has been, uh, hasn't been circled, but it's down there in the, in the middle of the, the bottom uh, part of the map. Anyway, you have, to, you have to get out of Santa Fe, past Española, the last big city you go, go by, um, or significant city, and begin to enter then into a landscape like the two pictures below show you that is untouched and lightly inhabited. You may even feel a little hallucinatory as you drive into this world that the locals, including the native and Hispanic cultures that have lived here for centuries, call home but is spectacularly foreign to those of us who live in cities and suburbs elsewhere. The journey from Santa Fe to Abiquiu um, is, it, it reiterates the very one the artist took. Uh, she went from city, New York, in, in fact, um, but even once she went from New York to New Mexico, she had to find uh, this particular space and she did it by moving further and further away from civilized centers such as Santa Fe and also um, Taos. So you, in fact, you kind of reiterate the way um, the artist left the hustle and bustle of um, an organized town uh, to get out uh, into the open spaces. And that's an important part of the experience, just getting there. It tells you how determined she was to live in this dry and lunar landscape of her own choosing and to carve out an alternate life from the one she lived in a New York high rise. You experience, in other words, something of her willfulness and independence, just getting to the beautiful home she made in the village of Abiquiu. Second example. Sometimes the journey to and from are, is not the memorable part, but just negotiating the site. Flat shoes with rubber soles are recommended footwear when visiting Manitoba, the home and grounds that Russell Wright, the mid-century designer uh, of dishware and furniture, built over a number of years. Wright acquired 75 acres of untouched boulders, waterways, and woodlands just off the main road in Garrison, New York on the Hudson River. His was something of a manic project the creation of a completely orchestrated world 
that today is presented as if Wright has just left momentarily, perhaps for a day of business in Manhattan. The tables are set, the beds made, the waterfalls are gurgling, the trees changing colors, the paths slippery with moss. Here's a modernist who wanted his lived environment to be simple and functional, but also a perfected multi-sensory miracle on the Hudson. He was a 20th century idealist, creating a domestic campus for himself, his family, and his friends, impossible to replicate today. It's a unique, utopian, very modern, visionary space. One final example to underline the depth and variety in artist sites. In this case, a city home that is relatively easy to get to in South San Francisco, if one knows it's even there amongst the taverna and burrito shops and other Victorian homes like it is itself. The house is there on the left. It sits in a landscape in the Mission District of noisy streets um, and ordinary work working and middle-class homes. This is David Ireland's project called 500 Cap Street. In the Mission District, a crowded, ethnically um, mixed region of the city. Ireland is a conceptual art, was a conceptual artist. He bought the house of 500 Cap to live in and proceeded to do so. But along the way, he decided to go hybrid and create his home as if he was creating a work of art. He spent years using the patinas, the distressed materials, and the things like brooms he found in the decaying building to create varnished mustard colored walls and, a ma magical, as and magical assemblages of artifacts. Visiting his house is a totalizing experience, one room after another of surprises and cleverness. You feel extremely alive in these spaces, privileged, in fact, to be a David's guest in a house he transformed. He too seems present, just off for the day. One last observation. I'm always looking for signs of new interests in artists' environments. Over the last decade or so, there has been a surge of books about artists' homes and studios. These I took right off my own library shelves. They tend, however, to be picture books, very heavy on color photography and very light, L-I-T-E, on history. But they do indicate a curiosity and respect, if you will, for the artist's way of life. They're almost voyeuristic, some of them, about the artist's way of life. These books highlight the artist's customary resistance to fashion and high style decorating and dwell rather on the nonconformity, the countercultural, and the hyper personalizing of living spaces. I confess that I yearn for fresh scholarship um, in my books on artists' homes and studios. And, and choke rather on those that sensationalize and over aestheticize offbeat spaces. My preference is for a book like this one written by our next speaker, Valerie Belent, The First Guide to Haas Properties. Valerie's account uses straightforward documentary photographs of each site accompanied by introductory historical texts. She gives us a fact-driven armchair journey across the country to visit these unique places, creating a hunger to get in your car and go see them for yourself. And I, um, I would recommend this book to you, which is easy to uh, find at almost any of the artist sites sell them, but you can also find it at, all, at your um, usual uh, depositories uh, for uh, book sales. Valerie is the senior program, man program manager of Haas. Before taking on this lead position, she worked at many different artist sites, including 17 years on the curatorial staff of Olana, the home of the Hudson River School painter, Frederick Church. Her Haas office is, as I said earlier, at Chesterwood, the home and studio of the 19th century sculptor, Daniel Chester French, whose studio you're seeing right there gracing the cover of her book. It's a National Trust property in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. I'm now going to um, 
have uh, Valerie step up to the podium and bring the story of Haas that I've introduced to you here into the 21st century. She's titled her talk, Yesterday and Tomorrow, Reframing the Historic Artists' Homes and Studios Program. So Valerie, we can, we'll edit this part out. Um, what we'll need you to do is share your screen. Good job, Wanda, excellent done, excellent work. Um, Does it work all right? Yeah. Um, so Valerie, can you, are you ready to do this or do you have questions? You're muted right now. And Wanda, you need to mute. Yeah, just I am, except I, I just, um, I need uh, just a minute or two to, I realized it's not open. I, I, I literally could not get into go to, I literally could not get into the last thing I was in until like halfway through because the, my computer just, it did things I've never seen it do before. So I, Probably, and so as I was finally on screen here, I was like, oh, the PowerPoint's on the desktop, but it's actually not open and I can't transition if that's what they want me to do. I actually can't do that. Um, also, I have a bunch of windows open still from when I was so yeah. um, desperately trying to get into GoToWebinar. So I wanna close those out okay. to make sure that my connection is optimized. So I'm just gonna, decrease um, this window a little bit while I sort of take care of that business. Hi, Wanda. Hi, Joni. <laughs> I, I will be, I'm going to stay here. I just need to look and, and get all of this like sort of underway. Does it matter um, to you if this is open as a PDF or as a PowerPoint? Nope. That doesn't matter to me at all. You just make sure it's full screen when you're presenting. Let me get that open. Let me close this. Let me close. What other things are working? So it's down. Apologies. No, no need to. Almost there. Okay. So let me get back here. Okay. Um, this slide is really throwing me off for some reason. Okay. Is that working? Look at me. Okay. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, let me just let me make sure this is working. I don't really want to look at myself, but I can avoid it. Okay. Um, I am ready. <laughs> Uh, you're muted. Yep, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. All right. Thank you, Wanda, for that lovely introduction and your opening remarks about the history and trajectory of this amazing program, which I consider it an honor to help steer into a robust future. Historic Artist Homes and Studios is delighted to serve as a sponsor of this event alongside the Iowa Arts Council and are grateful to our hosts, the Grantwood Art Colony the University of Iowa, and the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art 
stewards of a member of the Haas family, the Grant Wood Studio. I welcome our scholars who will present on these complex properties, and I invite attendees, both those with us in the auditorium and those joining us online, to consider this the only the first blush of an introduction to wonders that await you at these multifaceted sites with a sincere hope that you eventually set off on a pilgrimage or two or more. As Wanda Korn has touched upon, we have a history to be proud of at Historic Artists Films and Studios. And I know all who are involved in the program's leadership, several of whom are here at the conference, are excited about our future. As this program moves into its third decade, it has endless possibilities for growth, not only in its membership, but it's its programming, mentoring, and its advocacy work. But as the only organization in the nation dedicated to a site, dedicated to telling a site-specific story of our nation's art history, we're also striving to be a leader in meeting the current moment reframing traditional narratives and hierarchies to be more inclusive, allowing for a fuller and more accurate story of artistic legacy through place. We are also examining why certain artists have historically been overlooked for preservation and how we can be agents for changing that in the future. My comments today will introduce through specific member sites, the ways in which Haas is committed to efforts towards more equity and diversity, with much work still to do. While also acknowledging that the value of more traditional sites, most often preserved to white male artists firmly within the canon, as represented by images of Thomas Hart Benton and his studio in Kansas City, which you see on screen, can still bring to dialogue and study. While our presenters over the course of the next several days will provide us in-depth looks at the ways in which individual artists create personal home and workspaces that both reflect and foster their individual aesthetics. I will offer in broad, very broad strokes, a first excursion to the wealth of artist spaces that await your further exploration. My hope is that it will get you thinking about the commonalities that exist between these singular artists and places and those discussed in individual papers throughout this conference. One of the wonderful things about Haas is that it includes both artists who are highly recognizable in the public consciousness, such as Andrew Wyatt, pictured um, on top of your screen, as well as those who perhaps await further exploration, such as Indiana Impressionist T.C. Steele. Yet while about three quarters of all these sites were preserved through the efforts of women, and many women are at the forefront of stewarding these properties today, the images on screen hint at the fact that member sites dedicated to the legacy of women artists are severely underrepresented. Of course, Haas does include numerous sites centered to the legacy of women artists, uh, modernist Georgia O'Keeffe perhaps being the most famous as Wanda has already taken us on an excursion of, Sarah Roving will deliver a presentation on her New Mexico property on Saturday. But the majority of women artists currently represented in the network are associated with homes and studios that were occupied by artist couples. Helen Harrison will speak on Sunday about one such couple, Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner. But another example is Susie Freelingheisen, an opera singer as well as a painter, and who with her husband, as Wanda has noted, executed fresco murals in their rural retreat in the Berkshires of Massachusetts. Site-specific and in-situ works like these can often be found in artists' homes. Like many women, Freelingheisen did not exhibit or sell widely in her own lifetime. The result of, being, of there being less rigorous study or evaluation of her talents in scholarly discourse, and this is a common thread. Identifying and adding more sites with central women narratives is one way in which Haas is um, committed to reframing its membership. Of equal importance though, is amplifying the numerous stories of women of current Haas sites who served in vital roles as muses, models, collaborators, and indeed business managers, often setting aside their own artistic pursuits to assist in their husband's careers. 
Haas is also actively seeking to more fully represent LGBTQ voices in the network, such as that of current Haas member, Chicago imagist and folk art collector, Roger Brown, who lived and worked in this Chicago storefront he converted into a home with partner George Veranda. When the home of photographer Alice Austin first entered the Haas network, the site's interpretive focus represented a wholesale erasure of Austin's identity as a gay woman and her life with her partner Gertrude Tate. And you see both Alice um, on a fence post with the camera and Gertrude looking um, straight at us. Today, the site has re-entered itself around Austin's full self and is dedicated to larger ideas of identity empowerment. And Victoria Monroe will present on this dynamic reinterpretation of the site this coming Sunday. I want to touch briefly upon other artists who are underrepresented or do not traditionally fit into the main frame of art history and who we are seeking to bring into Haas self-taught artists, folk artists, indigenous artists, and people of color. I'll start with James Castle, a deaf, illiterate, and self-taught artist living and creating outside of the mainstream in Boise, Idaho. To the right, you can see um, one of his handmade paper animal constructions he made using everyday materials, including sewing it with twine. And you can also see one of his painted figures. You can see it's the same type of work that um, you see on his uh, drawing work table in the photograph of him in his space. For most of his life, his work was largely comprised of the small suburban home he lived in with his family. And over decades, he transformed this humble domicile into a series of immersive artistic installations, which included sculptures like the one you saw in the previous slide, creating, like so many artists, a living spaces that integrated his art. You see on screen uh, two drawings um, when he record, well, one where he recorded one of these uh, installations. Drawings such as these, um, the one showing the installation and one of um, actually his home, were often created using soot and his own saliva, exhibiting the ingenuity that artists often employ in process. Castle's home passed out of the family hands and became derelict. But only a few years ago, restoration was undertaken by the city of Boise, and it is now open to the public. It became a member of Haas in 2019, and in decades past, this house and legacy would never have been saved. So there is progress being made. Clementine Hunter worked her whole life as a field laborer and later as domestic staff on a rural plantation in Louisiana. She did not even begin to create art until she was in midlife and a grandmother using discarded materials from a visiting artist. And it just shows it's never uh, too late to tap into your own creativity. This is one of the buildings on site designed, built and used by enslaved people in an earlier generation than Hunter. But here is what she created in the spaces upper floor, a series of murals on plywood depicting her daily life on the plantation. I like to think of this as a bit of reappropriation of this space by her and on her own terms, but this is in part because she would have never been in a position to design and build her own signature home and studio. While recognized to some degree in her own lifetime, her encounters with racism and discrimination were also present. Two years before her death, she received an honorary doctorate from Northwestern State University in Louisiana, the same university had not allowed her to come see her own exhibition on view 20 years earlier due to segregation laws. While aspects of her narrative are inspiring, the singular place she has held until extremely recently as an artist of color within the Haas network is a signifier to all of the work still to be done in validating these contributions to our artistic legacy through preserved place. In 2020, Haas actively focused on adding women artists to coincide with the 100 year anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote. In our selections, we gave agency to women artists who were primarily arts educators, a role along with other long standing gender barriers to exhibition and sales opportunities 
which has largely regulated these artists to the fringes in terms of serious scholarly inquiry and recognition, despite the key impact that arts educators play in molding subsequent generations of um, professional artists. The breadth of those artists and sites selected were wide ranging, including the artistic art enclave Bauhaus trained master ceramicist and seminal author Marguerite Wildenhain, established in California's Russian River Valley. Wildenhain once stated, Pond Farm is not a school, it is a way of life. And I think this sentiment resonates throughout this convening, um, which is centered at the intersection of work and domesticity. The hub of this colony was the barn. Today, its preserved potter's wheels represent a singular, preserved and publicly open site of this kind in the country. Collective workshop spaces such as this represent a more expansive lens through which Haas is considering the definition of preserved artist home and studio. Finnish born Boya Saarinen oversaw the textile studio at the Cranbrook Academy of Art, the largest studio and commercial enterprise at this institution. While her work can be seen throughout Cranbrook and in the family home on campus, her story has often been overshadowed by that of her famous architect husband, Eliel Sarnin. Here you see Loya showing a cartoon for a future weaving to Eliel, and at right, Loya at the loom, while many of the other talented women weavers in the studio looks on. The site's inclusion into Haas illustrates another example of how the concept of an artist's studio can be redefined within the membership. Here, she is seated in front of a tapestry of her own design, and at right, the lush textiles that grace Saren and House throughout. The Long Island Home and Studio of artists and arts educators, Mabel D'Amico and her husband, which um, in a house co-designed with her husband. D'Amico proclaimed, art breaks the barriers of language, race, and creed. It is an international language. And I think this truism that she expressed captures what is so alluring, alluring about artists' homes more generally. And I um, personally think they operate on this universal plane and language as um, many visitors do um, when they um, experience them. Mabel could make art out of anything, including fishing buoys, as you see here um, at left on your screen. And the art school she established with her husband, the more famous Victor D'Amico, the first director of education at MoMA, continues today in a retired Navy barge they converted for this specific use. The home studio and outdoor sculpture designed by Dorothy Reister, preservationist, conservationist, artist, and arts educator who eschewed the more commercial art world to live in the rural New York lakeside town of Casanova. This is a total work of art. Inside her home, everything is of her design, from the floating staircase to the tiles in the kitchen to the lighting fixtures and the tableware. With the recent announcement of seven new member sites within the last two weeks, Haas has continued its commitment to diversity, including amplifying women's artistic voices, specifically women whose impact can be traced as educators. Adelia Armstrong Lutz, painter and arts educator, was instrumental in the formation of the Progressive Nicholson Art League in Knoxville, Tennessee, although her name has often been subsumed beneath her most our more famous male colleagues at the lead, an exhibitor at numerous um, national arts exhibitions. Lux helped design her home and impressive studio, including numerous decorative architectural elements, such as painted fireplace tiles and frescoed walls. The Soldner Center for Arts and Innovation represents the multi-year effort and dedication of Stephanie Soldner, daughter of artists and educators Paul and Ginny Soldner, to realize her vision for a public site. Her parents designed and built a home and artistic enclave based in sustainability practices, attracting artists of numerous disciplines. Paul, well known in decorative art circles, is recognized as the founder of American Raku Ceramics. 
while less known Ginny was an accomplished color field painter and oversaw the couple's commercial enterprise, enterprise Soldner's Pottery Equipment. Stephanie is here at the conference and I would urge you to seek her out and learn more about her work and her vision. Haas is actively seeking sites representing artists of color and bringing them into membership. Realities of racism, economic and social inequality have served as barriers to these properties being preserved in the first place as public sites or museums. A rare exception is the former home, studio and artist design, designed landscape of sculptor and activist James W. Washington Jr., a new Haas member whose legacy was secured by the artist and his wife during their own lifetimes. It's imperative that erased contributions of artists of color and the places associated with them are exhumed, while also ensuring that the key resources and support required by a current generation of artists considering site-based legacy are also provided. The addition of Robert Dash's property to membership represents the ways in which we are recognizing self-taught visual artists while also drawing attention to those who stretch their creative impulses to related disciplines as an extension of their practice. A talented painter and printmaker, this writer turned artist turned extensive gardener, uh, turned his East End Long Island home into his largest artistic creation. Here, Dash combined his passions and talents for painting, poetry, and garden design into one cohesive expression. Like many artists' homes, Medu, as he called it, became a forum for creative discourse and critique. Poet laureate John Ashbery, artist Fairfield Porter, William de Kooning, and Pulitzer Prize winning poet Jimmy Schuyler are among those who came to experience this confluence of art and nature. As the program continues to move beyond artist spaces that closely adhere to traditional concepts of home and studio, we have accepted for the first time vernacular artist designed environments into membership. Like Robert Dash at Medu, Eddie Owens Martin, who later named himself Saint Ohm, was largely self taught. He created Pasaquan, an immersive environment executed over the course of 30 years, includes six major structures and more than 900 feet of elaborately painted masonry walls. At Pasaquan, this LGBTQ activist used cultural and religious symbols and designs using global inspiration. Tomorrow, Lisa Stone will discuss this site in more depth, along with other artists working outside the mainframe, including the site created by African-American artist Noah Purifoy, who moved to the Mojave Desert after 11 years of public policy work for the California Arts Council. Purifoy transferred his practice completely outdoors, where he lived for the last 15 years of his life, creating 10 acres full of large scale sculpture on the desert floor. And in essence, the desert floor became the studio. Constructed entirely of junk materials, this environment breaks with ideas of conventional studio space and media all together. But amplifying news stories to reframe the canon can only work if artists and sites like these are not regulated to the category of other, but are discussed in the company of more traditional artists like famed illustrator Rock Norman Rockwell, who are um, firmly enmeshed within our nation's popular culture. In this Stockbridge studio, Rockwell executed the final painting of Golden Rule, a gathering of men, women, and children of different races, religions, and ethnicities, which may I say rivals Grant Wood's own American Gothic as one of the most recognizable images in all the visual lexicon. By bringing his studio into that network at the same moment as these other sites such as Pasaquan or Noah Purifoy's um, outdoor space, we are intentionally giving agency to these diverse stories and helping shift existing hierarchies and dialogue around our nation's art history. While we are proud of the work accomplished to date, we know we still have much to do. So what is next for Haas? We will continue to search out examples that push definitions of artist home and studio spaces for inclusion in the network. Sites such as Watts Tower, a collection of interconnected structures 
all hand-built over a period of three decades, or the second coming house created by Isaiah Henry Robertson, also known as Prophet Isaiah, after receiving a divine calling. Multi-denominational symbolism is hand-carved and painted inside and within the structure. After personally hosting visitors for decades, Robertson died only recently in January 2020, and the Kohler Foundation, a leader in the preservation of artist environments, has now secured its legacy as a public site. Haas is also considering other sites preserved by the Kohler Foundation, such as the Mary Nola Lakeside Home in Wisconsin, which is not regularly open to the public. In coming weeks, we will be announcing a new category of affiliate membership, which can offer pathways for those stewarding artists' spaces that may be in earlier stages of evolution as public sites or may not conform at all to traditional models of preservation, operation, or visitation. To tell, uh, to truly tell a fuller site-specific story of our art history, Haas is embracing and recognizing that certain communities may preserve sites using operational and legacy models that represent their distinct cultural and world views. For example, that indigenous communities might be far less likely to preserve a site honoring a specific individual, instead paying homage to an artist or artist mastery through the living legacy of contemporary artists still working at a site where the community resides. As in the enduring pottery tradition that can be found at Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico. As Haas see, seeks sites representing the legacies of indigenous artists, as well as those as Asian American, Latinx, and African American creatives will be essential to engage modern day communities of active partners in determining those sites they wish to hold up as examples of their artistic heritage. Recognizing that art history is not a closed and fixed point, we will continue to work with living artists or organizations assisting artists in preparing for legacy. The Pearl Friar Tuberary Garden is a singular site in the entire nation, which redefines sculptural media to include the natural environment. The University of South Carolina is working with the family and other partners, including Haas, to vision a future for this public site while Mr. Fryer can still contribute his own wishes for that future. New spaces are being preserved and activated all the time, but not always in the form of a traditional historic house museum, which often marks the preservation model of prior days. The Columbus Museum of Art recently rehabilitated the home of multidisciplinary artist and writer Amina Robinson. While her, present, her, her presence and the spirit of place, I would argue still remains very potent in spaces like the kitchen with walls that continue to be marked with her scribblings. Other rooms have been redesigned for use by artists and writer residencies. Haas will create opportunities for sites such as this one to participate in the network alongside more traditional member sites. Increasing membership is only one aspect of the work we do in drawing attention to these crucibles of creativity. We are actively expanding our public programming, which includes our second annual virtual road trip series, which begins April 18th, and will feature a monthly virtual visit with a total of six sites within the network. These are free of charge and with a deep dive hosted by each site. Postcards outlining the series will be available throughout the conference. We are grateful to our partner site, the James Castle House, for spearheading this program with us. In our work, we wish to educate our peers, scholars, and the public about evolving philosophies and practices of preservation, interpretation, and research at these sites. In May, we will partner with the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Connecticut for a second year present a series of case studies around larger themes such as climate change and sustainability, site reinterpretation, and amplifying new artistic voices. Florence Griswold commandeered a boarding house which welcomed hundreds of artists over several decades, a place for discourse, competition, and debate alongside painting. The site is the perfect host for this continuation of active dialogue. We hope some of you will join us for this free virtual series. Haas also continues to build collaborations with sites and networks overseas, 
and hopes to offer joint programming in the coming year with the European Artist Studio Museum Network based in the UK. And of course, convenings such as these are instrumental in drawing further attention to preserved artist spaces and Haas is honored to be included in this conference. With this afternoon's keynote, we will begin our first in-depth discovery of all the riches that these sites have to offer for both scholarly inquiry and public visitation. It is fitting that we will start with the artist who has created one of the most recognized images in all of American art, and which has been firmly appropriated into larger popular culture, Grant Wood and American Gothic, plastered onto lunchboxes, beach towels, and even the magnetized paper dolls that I have witnessed on Wanda Korn's own refrigerator. It has transcended its mere objectness as a painting. And so therefore, it is easy to forget that a painting like this one and others were made by a person and made in a place. This image of Wood at his home and studio in Turner Alley, now preserved as a public site, with his carefully crafted persona of overall starch shirt provides a touchdown back to the reality of art making while also promising wonderful entree into the concept of biography through place. A discussion of Wood's homes and interiors he created for others is a perfect place to start our journey, tracing the progression of this artist and his numerous talents through physical place and evolving concepts of home. On Sunday, a presentation of Wood's home and studio at Turner Alley will bookend this conference and complement our own individual experiences of the space through tours happening earlier that day. Wood's home and workspaces demonstrate many commonalities with other preserved artist sites, both inside and outside of the Haas network. Wood's transformation of the space to accommodate not just his work, but life needs is indicative of how many artists employ related created disciplines to model not just a house, but a home that singularly reflects them and which reveals something about an artist distinct from what can be found in viewing a painting on a museum wall or an object in exhibit vitrine. Certainly examples of lesser known stories like those I have mentioned earlier in this talk must be studied and championed. But likewise, those spaces associated with artists like Wood, firmly in the canon, and those artists discussed during this conference should consistently be re-examined and of course visited to better understand their value as an intrinsic part of art history. Thank you. Wanda, I think you do. Okay. <laughs> I, I, right? I'm good. <laughs> So when are you going to introduce uh, Joanna? I'll, I'll introduce okay. Joanna. So I, I am so you... sorry for the introduction. Intro Did you guys hear me on the phone? No. No. I didn't. Oh. Mara did. Just a little bit. You're fine. Uh, it was I very got... quick. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It'll 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 blend out. It'll be fine. Okay. If, if, I think I heard something, but yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I was on the uh, the dentist office call. <laughs> So I had to get, get back to my bed when you're not on dental emergency stuff. Okay, so are you? Am I going to be the uh, the single? Yeah. You know? Yep. Yep. I have you up there, and so I'm going to meet myself, and so then you'll just pass it off to Joni, and Joni will immediately screen share, and be good. And Mara, are you staying with us for this one? I know you yeah. have a date of some sort. Okay. So good. Okay, you're good. All right. Okay, I'm happy now to introduce my friend and fellow scholar of American art, Joni Kinsey, well known to many of you here for her many years of teaching art history to undergraduates and graduate students at the University of Iowa. Joni's research is wide ranging, but she is especially treasured for her books on American landscape painting of the West, especially her work on the painter and printmaker Thomas Moran, and on her books on art about the prairie. But it is her work on Grant Wood, particularly on the half dozen years when he taught at the university 
and moved his residence from Cedar Rapids to Iowa City that brings her to the podium today. Befitting our symposium theme, she will be taking a close look at Wood as the creator of two extremely different domestic environments, both of which we are so happy to report are extant. Joni's paper is entitled Grant Wood's Studio Homes, From Hayloft to Mansion, Overalls to Hollywood. Thank you so much, Wanda, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for being here today. As the Grant Wood Art Colony convenes its seventh biennial symposium, this time to consider artists' homes and studios, it's very appropriate that here in Iowa, we have several sites to consider, uh, especially those who uh, that were the homes and studios of Grant Wood, our most famous artists in Iowa as well as a number of other locations that still retain structures and design work that he did for other people. All of these projects reveal important aspects of his artistry and identity, in addition to his better known paintings and prints. Wood's intense involvement in designing spaces for living and working deserves to be better known and understood as fundamental to his artistic practice, his aesthetic sensibility, his dedication to craftsmanship and adaptive use of materials, his belief in the worth and dignity of labor, and his, his commitment to place and its significance. Homes and workplaces abound in Wood's imagery, but they also formed a real and significant part of his life. He worked for decades as an interior designer, home builder, renovator, restorer, often doing much of the craftsmanship himself employing a creative ingenuity that went significantly beyond what was required. The range of his work and attention to detail reveals a fascination with every aspect of domestic spaces, from the geometry and proportions of structures to the intricacies of surfaces, hardware, and decor. And all of this was intrinsically part of Wood's understanding of what such dwellings represented, culturally, socially, regionally, and personally. Ideas he regularly expressed as one of the uh, most articulate advocates of his time for the meaning and value of home and region for individuals and American culture more generally. Wood's wealth of experiences as a designer and craftsman from an early age ultimately made his most personal design achievements possible, namely his home and studio at Five Turner Alley in Cedar Rapids, where he lived and worked between 1924 and 1935 and his grander house at 1142 East Court Street in Iowa City, where he resided from 1935 until his death in 1942. I'll touch on his unique studio in Cedar Rapids today, but because we have another presentation by Sean Ulmer soon, I will focus more today on Grant Wood's Iowa City house and the developments that contributed to it. In retrospect, I might have titled this presentation Creative Ingenuity at Work in Grant Wood's Homes and Studios, since some, one of the most striking aspects of virtually all of his design and construction projects was resourceful and varied use of materials crafted and applied with a keen aesthetic sensibility. The now increasingly voluminous literature on Wood is replete with information about his innovative solutions to whatever need was at hand, Everything from fashioning a fireplace hood from a galvanized bushel bucket, a sink from a Victrola horn, to a door from a coffin lid. In his renovation projects, he turned storage areas into innovative bathrooms and kitchens, shaped crawl spaces and eaves into practical uses, and reconfigured discarded materials into new forms. Even in the several locations where he worked on new structures, he customized them with an array of local and handcrafted components, often made from salvage. Resourcefulness was hardly unusual in Wood's time, especially for those strapped for cash, as he usually was. And like most farm kids, he had to learn to make do with what was available far from stores. As the adage goes, necessity is the mother of invention. But what is remarkable is the variety of Wood's adaptations, his ability to transform the ordinary into the extraordinary, and the diligence and persistence with which he labored to make, make each component of a project useful and expressive of his aesthetic vision. 
These were the fundamental principles of the arts and crafts movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Ideas Wood developed through reading Gustav Stickley's The Craftsman magazine, and he studied these teachings firsthand during his two summers at the Minneapolis Handicraft Guild after graduating from high school. The Guild emphasized methods of design through hand craftsmanship and was strongly influenced by Ernest Batchelder, a prominent arts and crafts designer who taught there until 1909, the year before Wood enrolled. In his first summer, Wood took metalsmithing, probably with Douglas Donaldson, who has been called one of the most influential metal designers of the early 20th century. And here you can see some of Donaldson's work. Wood had already learned some metalsmithing while in high school, and he would go on to practice the craft in a number of situations, first with the jeweler Kate Loomis in Cedar Rapids in 1911, and in 1913-14 in Chicago with the Kalo Silversmith Shop and then at the Volland shop that he ran with his friend, Christopher Haga. He would also go on to incorporate unique handcrafted metalwork into many projects, you know, most notably his corn chandeliers at the Epley Hotel corn rooms in the 1920s, fireplace grills at various locations, metal screens at Five Turner Alley, and a hand hammered copper fireplace hood at 1142 Court Street where he lived. Wood's craftsmanship projects, large and small, are too numerous to elaborate in the short time I have today, and these are well discussed in the scholarship of Jane Malosh, Wanda Korn, Trip Evans, and Glenn Adamson. But it's essential to integrate what the artist called decorative adventures into our understanding of his art more broadly, since they were so fundamental to his work. They provided him a vital source of income, and perhaps most importantly, I believe, they offered a meaningful way for him to meld art and labor. This conjunction is exemplified in his early painting, Adoration of the Home, which he painted as a billboard for the realtor Henry Ely in 1921. In a classicized allegory, the goddess of the home holds a house that is notably not a mansion, but rather a modest middle-class dwelling. And she is surrounded by the workers and craftsmen who inhabit such structures and whose labors create them and their communities. Wood personally embodied these ideals, taking to heart John Ruskin's dictum, prominently proclaimed in the first volume of the Craftsman magazine, that every artist should be a workman. For a gay man in the early 20th century America, whose father had disdained his artistic inclinations and who went through long periods that many people might uh, describe as unemployed or employed merely as a teacher, and a decorator, it was especially important to do construction, wear the clothing of working men, and emphasize the value of honest labor. Tellingly, Wood usually wore bibbed overalls as he worked and painted, explaining that they were comfortable, and they are, but surely as significant was how the masculine garment asserted that his occupation, however aesthetic and domestic that it might be, was work. As Wood himself told his friend, the architect and builder Bruce McKay, with whom he had created an array of homes, to be a good artist is not a gift. A man isn't a genius because he produces a good painting. Art is like being a plumber or a carpenter. If a person works hard enough, he will succeed. The conjunction of art, home, and work is fundamental to many of Wood's images from early paintings in his formative impressionist style to later compositions that exemplify his quintessential devotion to regionalism. One of the most compelling in this regard is Dinner for Threshers, which offers a quaint cutaway view of farm workers being served their noon meal by equally hardworking women in a carefully tended home. These annual events of neighbors helping neighbors with their harvest were among the most important acts of generosity in farm country. And in Wood's view, this becomes a communion scene of male and female rural labor, all freely offered for the common good. Wood's own domestic labor and creativity, uh, creative productivity was prolific with early examples in two homes that he built for his mother, sister, and himself in the teens. First, the so-called shack, a rudimentary dwelling to replace the Cedar Rapids home that they had lost due to bankruptcy and then a more comfortable structure in Kenwood Park, also in Cedar Rapids, 
that Wood built along with others in the area with his friend Paul Hansen. We don't know a great deal about the interiors of these, although Wood's sister Nan describes some of his ingenious creations in the shack, including the sink that he made from a Victrola horn. The list of Wood's subsequent projects, included commis including commissioned work, is long, ranging from the stately Armstrong and Stamets house in Cedar Rapids, houses in Cedar Rapids, and in the later uh, and in the latter, he celebrated the house itself in his over mantle painting, which features the dwelling amid a stylized setting that evokes a nostalgic Courier and Ives scene. At the Douglas family's second home, called Bruce Moore, his decorative plastering of what's called Barbara's Porch created a whimsical surround for the family's daughter with swirling forms and an array of animals. And he did interior design for others, including Dr. Byron McKeeby, the dentist who had posed for American Gothic, a painting that of course features its own distinctive house that although not built by Wood, would forever be associated with him. And Wood's projects continue to be discovered. Only a few weeks ago, I received an email about a house on Kirkwood Avenue here in Iowa City, whose owners were told never to paint the green cornice in the living room because Grant Wood had chosen the color. And I recently learned of another home with Wood's touches, one that needs to be added to our list. When he did not have a patron, Wood's unfettered creativity was even more diverse and especially notable at three locations. In 1932 at Stone City Art Colony near Anamosa, Iowa, he reconfigured an old stone mansion into a lodge for students, complete with a charming European style Rathskeller in the basement. And his painted ice wagon fitted out as a camper for the summer season was an especially innovative project with a landscape that showcases the region the school was celebrating. In another example in Iowa City in the mid 1930s, Wood converted what is now the upstairs rooms at Prairie Lights Bookstore on Dubuque Street into an unusual space for an after lecture club called the SPCS or Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Speakers. And he delighted in filling it with patterned wallpaper, antiques and bric-a-brac in a style he called the worst of the Victorian period. During the same time, he created what he called an art clinic for weekly consultations with students and the public about art turning an unused medical amphitheater into a unique space for critiques and aesthetic analysis. At Five Turner Alley in Cedar Rapids, in a former hayloft, the Turner family provided him rent free in return for doing decorating work for and drawings of their adjacent mortuary, Wood created a remarkably efficient and comfortable home and studio with innumerable clever features to make the most of the small space including a bathroom with a sunken tub tucked into an eave, a tiny kitchen with a table that folded out from a cupboard, and a hand-fashioned metal grill work along the sides, a charming fireplace with a galvanized bushel hood, spaces for beds and canvases to be stored out of sight behind knee walls in the adjacent eaves. The apartment suited him, his mother and sister well, for one of the most productive times of his career. And it is one of the most distinctive artist studios in America. And there are several other views here that you can see uh, during his time and more recently, it's still remarkably intact, although some of the essential details are no longer there. And his own painting of this nook over to the side the special space for the phone and furniture and a charming card that he created showing himself in the space. Embarking on a new phase in 1935 with a new job as professor of art at the University of Iowa and a new wife to please, Wood purchased a, substan purchased a substantial home, uh, a brick home, at 1142 Court Street for $3,500, nearly the amount of his annual teaching salary. The house had been built in 1858 by Iowa City brick manufacturer Nicholas Oakes as one of the grander houses in town. But since Oakes' death, the house had been divided into a rooming home 
and had been fall had fallen into significant disrepair. Here we see the house in four different phases. The first on the upper left during the Oaks's period when the Italianate porch uh, was intact. The second on the upper right, the period after Oaks's death when the porch had been replaced with a more ordinary sort. On the lower left is a view from Wood's time after his renovations with the porch removed and on the lower right, the structure today. Even as he was teaching at the university, busy with painting and illustrative commissions, writing his biography with secretary and agent Park Reinard and traveling regularly as a speaker, Wood and his wife, Sarah, moved into the home and launched into major changes, eventually spending, uh, by his sister Nan's account, some $35,000 on the place, 10 times the purchase cost. With the help of his architect builder friend, Bruce McKay, and surely some carpenters and plumbers, perhaps an electrician or two, and a good deal of his own labor, Wood returned the structure to a graceful residence that although quite different from his earlier homes in its monumentality and classic character, was no less personalized with unique features of his own design. The most dramatic of Wood's changes to the house was the removal of the front to bring more light inside, the restoration of the large green shutters flanking the exterior windows, and the addition of a stone city stone wall and wood picket fence out front, its posts topped with carved acorn finials to acknowledge the Oaks family, and its gate fitted with a special mechanism topped with an ordinary doorknob that opens with just the bump of an elbow. Wood wanted to be able to open the gate, as he said, with an armful of groceries. Perhaps to compensate for the loss of the front porch, Wood rebuilt the house's side porch, adding a stone floor, a trellis enclosure, and a long folding table inside that makes the space eminently useful for summer entertaining, as Wood is shown doing in a conversation here with the famous artist Carl Sand, uh, famous writer Carl Sandberg. Inside the house, Wood did major renovations, removing the rooming house partitions and opening up the living room where he added paneling, a custom bookcase, and a fireplace with a hand-hammered copper hood. Across the central foyer where he restored the walnut stair railing uh, was a parlor that he turned into a bedroom complete with custom cabinetry and an adjacent bathroom. In the dining room, he crafted slots for glass shelving that made the large windows a showcase for glassware. And he added a custom buffet and wainscoting in the space, as you see here. In the adjacent kitchen, he built an antique table, that, uh, a unique table that could accommodate four people or be folded away when floor space was needed. All of these features, with the exception of the kitchen, remain intact today. The decorating world took note of the famous artist's ingeniousness, and the American Home Magazine showcased the house in 1937, including before and after photographs of commentary about the careful restoration of the structure's original character and decor. Wood is quoted as saying, we wanted a simple, comfortable home, and neither Mrs. Wood nor I have much use for the modernistic type. Modernistic furnishings may be satisfactory for stores, novelty shops, or hotels, but they are things of the moment with no tradition or future. And yet, Wood was modern in some ways, especially in his use of masonite, a pressed wood sheeting invented in the 1920s that many, including Wood, regarded as one of the new miracle products of the age. He not only used it instead of canvas as the foundation for a number of his paintings, but he also filled his house with it in an array of applications. Using a special router blade, he customized his own economical grooved paneling for masonite for the living room and dining room wainscoting, and similarly made simulated tile squares on masonite sheets to line the bathroom. The kitchen walls and the stairwell were installed in a work walled entirely in masonite, as was some of the upstairs. As the current owner, Jim Hayes, has said when he launched into his own renovations to the house, he says, we took out a lot of masonite.
but not all of it. The distinctive vertical paneling wood made for the living room and the dining room and the tile-like bathroom walls are still in place and they have held up very well. Wood also used masonite as a protective layer on the top of the long folding table on the porch and on the surface of the dining room table and buffet, coating them with his own mixture of stain and varnish that simulated the effect of walnut so well that the American Home Magazine author was fooled. And the window shelving was supported by masonite side panels, both carefully, decor carefully decorative, but also practical in their simple grooves that allowed for the shelves to be rearranged at different heights. All of this use of masonite made Grant Wood so well known for his love of the material that the manufacturing company featured him, his house, and how it showcased their product in a promotional brochure in 1937 a celebration of Masonite and one of the country's most famous artists that was reiterated in a 1939 article by Park Reinard in Our Home magazine. Wood also designed custom furnishings for his house and they received similar attention in the press. One of the favorites of these was a walnut cabinet in the front hall that had a special pull out metal lined bin for Wood's wet overshoes and umbrella. In the dining room, the 12 foot masonite tabletop rested on a metal grill work that the artist had salvaged from an old store and was flanked by 12 chairs created at the Amana colonies from his design. In the living room was the Grant Wood lounge chair made to the artist's specifications by a Cedar Rapids furniture maker named Henry Lubbin. Not too hard, not too soft, and these were sold in area stores alongside a cardboard cutout of the famous artist and sometimes his lithographs. You could get the chair in a variety of fabrics with fringe or without, and a matching ottoman could be ordered as well. And here too are views of some of the bedrooms and adjacent areas. We see the Grantwood lounge chair there on the left. The house at 1142 was a working studio as well as a home, and as at Five Turner Alley, Wood was photographed there, wearing his work attire, sketching, carving, painting, and drawing. Photographs show him signing his finished lithographs for the Associated American Artist prints, and elements of the house and barn were featured in two of them. Here is one of those, January, with a man coming down the stairs. And the stairs, of course, are flopped because a lithograph flops the image in the making of the print. And two, we see the back barn or something similar to it uh, on the wood property in December afternoon, another lithograph for the Associated American Artists. More significantly, even as those are, what uh, was the inclusion of the house itself, or at least a modified version of it, in one of Wood's last paintings, Parson Weems' Fable, where the big brick house, minus the shutters and with the windows no longer arched, uh, but complete with the distinctive star anchors that uh, anchor the interior beams that hold up the second story, here we see these things in the home of the ancestral estate of the Washington family, the George Washington family, telling the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. Since Grant Wood's death in 1942, 1142, the house on Court Street has had only two owners and the current one, Jim Hayes, is here with us today. A most careful steward of the house's historic legacy, he has not only kept the property in exquisite condition, but he has also purchased five properties adjacent to the big house that now comprise the Grantwood Art Colony, a compound of houses for artists in residence that teach at the University of Iowa. These are the Center for Ongoing Work that celebrates the history of Grantwood in our community and beyond just as this symposium is doing today and this weekend. Jim Hayes call, recalls Grant Wood's sister, Nan, saying that Grant Wood always considered his restoration of 1142 as one of his most important artistic achievements. 
It was in many ways the culmination of his career of craftsmanship that was no less a part of his artistic life than many of his other and than any of his other artistic accomplishments. All of the structures and elements that he created for these were in a physical embodiment of a life devoted to art, the fruits of labor, and the meanings of home. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, second day and the full day of our uh, symposium. My name is Jim Hayes, and I uh, own the house that you see in, in front of you. Um, I've gotten used to the fact that I'm, I'm better known as the guy that lives in the Grant Wood house than <laughs> my practice of law or anything else. But um, I, we very much appreciate the the uh, historic artists uh, uh, home studio program and especially uh, uh, Valerie uh, Ballant for being here and, and for the program uh, helping sponsor us. Um, last night was a, a very, well, yesterday was a great program with Joni and, and, and uh, Wanda and Valerie. And today is going to be a, a, a real full program. It's going to be a great program. But I just wanted to say a word about uh, last evening. I didn't get a chance to, to thank the Losanskis for the nice uh, reception that they gave because I sent Diego Losansky, who's another artist in the family, and a grandson of Mauricio, off to find people in the third floor of wherever of the 16,000 square foot studio house. And he never came back. And so there we were. We we're going to have a full program with the fellows discussing things with you all and that sort of thing. And it uh, just never came about. So I want to take a little opportunity today to thank the, the, the Lasansky family, including Adam Rake and, and uh, Rory Lasansky, all of whom were there last night. And I hope you had a chance to, uh, to talk to, to some of them. Um, very appreciative, as I say, for the program. I always want to especially uh, thank Maura Pilcher for her uh, great work in uh, guiding the Grant Wood program and Grant, Grant Wood Art Colony. Um, I've said many times, and she knows this, that uh, she's provided exactly the kind of leadership uh, that I ever expected anyone to uh, give us in the Grant Wood program. And we've come a long way. This is, I'm so proud and happy that uh, we're here for the, the 10th anniversary, a year late, um, of the Grant Wood Art Colony. The program started a little bit before that. We, we got to the colony, the, the concept, and I won't spend too much time on this, but the concept started back in 2002 uh, when I, entered into an agreement with the University of Iowa to gift my home and estate and uh, the houses surrounding uh, the property. There were three at that time, then four. Now we've added a fifth house. Uh, so that all of that will go uh, into the, the Grant Wood program um, uh, later on, <laughs> much later on, I hope. Uh, <laughs> but the... Um, Everybody loves a Grant Wood house, and, and I've given, I can't even say how many tours through the house, and so I, I have a great feeling for this very program, for um, historic artists' homes and studios, because Grant Wood not only lived here, he helped rebuild this house and refurbish it in, with his own hand, and he had been a, a contractor before, as we learned yesterday. But um, without exception, people love this house. And, um, and then we started the, you know, in my gift agreement, I said, just as, almost as an aside, um, that I'd like to have the, the houses adjacent to 1142 uh, used for visiting artists. And then in uh, 2009, uh, we had our first symposium of, on the upper lawn of the house and, and uh, Jane Malash and Joni um, and I put together a program there. Jane had people uh, from the Smithsonian. Joni came and talked 
and one of one of uh, uh, Jane's uh, associates. And that was the start. And then as a as an outpouring of that very successful event came the question, well, what's your idea for these houses? And I said, well, you know, Grant Wood uh, had a colony up at Stone City at one time, and maybe the houses can be uh, used for that purpose at my death. And uh, Doug True, who was at the meeting said, well, why don't we do it now? And so I thought, well, that's nice. Uh, before I hit the ground, you know, it'd be nice to see it. So that's how it got started. And um, he looked at, this was 2009, a year after the Great Recession. Budgets were, you know, crushed tightly. And poor Linda Maxson was chair of liberal arts at that time. And he looked over at Linda and he said, well, you can come up with $250,000, can't you? And I could just see her throat just tense up and she almost choked on her coffee, you know, and said, sure. So that's, that's how it started. And now we've had uh, 30 fellows and um, we're very proud of, of the program. And I, what I was getting to is that it's such a lively place. Uh, people, as I said, people always love 1142, the Grant Wood House. But I take them after a tour now, I take them through the garage and show them the Grant Wood Art Colony. And without exception, they say, oh my gosh, everybody should know about this. This is the best kept secret in Iowa. Well, part of the reason for the Grantwood Art Colony and the Grantwood program is not to keep Grantwood a secret anymore, you know? Um, so we want, we want people to associate American Gothic. Everybody knows American Gothic, but who painted it? So that's part of, of um, refurbishing or enhancing uh, his legacy is to um, have people know about the uh, colony. And we bring people in from all over the world. We have a very diverse uh, group of fellows. And it's just been a very exciting thing. You know, for, for 70 years, unfortunately, and this, this is not a secret that's not talked about, but for 70 years, the University of Iowa, who's such a great partner in this uh, wonderful adventure of the Grantwood program, our Grantwood uh, colony, for 70 years after Grantwood died in 1942, his name was never mentioned here at the university. There were no rooms named after him. There were no buildings where he had his studios. And that, uh, that, that didn't help his legacy after he died. And that came about because of several things, uh, pretty well documented, uh, that he was gay, that he only had a high school education, and that there, many of the faculty were very resentful because he was so famous. He was probably the most famous artist in America at the time, uh, coming off uh, American Gothic. And here this guy was just picked up by President Gilmore, and President Jessup, and appointed as a faculty member at the University of Iowa. <laughs> and that didn't go over so well. But the thing that really um, pushed it over the edge, as many of us believe, uh, was uh, his sexuality, that he was gay, that he was a homosexual. And thanks to Tripp, Evans, who's on our board and is here, and we'll, we'll talk to you next. Um, it was brought out uh, and talked about uh, more openly. And since that time, since trip, there have been many, many other uh, authors uh, who have addressed this topic. But when we had our first symposium uh, downstairs from this room, the uh, director at that time was the uh, director of the School of Art and Art History. And he said that uh, for 70 years, our university has ignored Grant Wood. And today we welcome him back. 
So that's part of what we're all doing here today and, and doing that as well. And um, just wanted to, we, yesterday we had our board meeting. We have several board members here, Trip, uh, Joni Kinsey, Jamie Walsh is here, Wanda Corn, of course, Randy Langley, Dr. Langley from Dubuque. Uh, I can't see back there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Kim's <laughs> the vice chair of the board for heaven's sake. <laughs> Um, and just let me address that, the Callahan topic. Um, John and Kim have been dear, dear friends for, for years. Uh, John is a very uh, prominent orthopedic surgeon. Put my hip in. But they've been very, very good to me and very good to the, to the uh, Grandwood Art Colony. Um, and they, uh, they funded the beautiful fence and, and gate that's prominent around the Grantwood Art Colony and makes it, makes it a, a real well-known entity in the city of Iowa City and the university and the state of Iowa. So our project uh, currently, the board's project, is to uh, begin uh, catalog raisonné or encyclopedic um, document of all of his all of Grantwood's paintings, and so uh, one of our board members, John Darcy, the pres uh, former president of the Board of Regents, Louis Peterson, or Louis Peterson, had given uh, a nice sum of money to seed this project. We're talking about grants, and John and Kim. Uh, announced to me last week that they are donating $100,000 to further this project. Thank you, Brown. Appreciate that very much. And that's part of the success of the program. And I'll just say one more thing. I, I just learned last night uh, that one of our fellows, uh, TJ Dido uh, Norris, who has been one of the seven former fellows of this program in our 11 years, seven fellows have been hired by the University of Iowa for faculty positions. Four of those were tenure track and three were lecture. Last night I learned that TJ has been given tenure and that she is the head of printing, uh, of painting and uh, drawing at the School of Art and Art History. So for us, for that, for us, that is success. Uh, so with that, I'm going to ask Tripp to come up. Tripp uh, Evans is one of our board members and a dear friend. And he is a, a professor of art history at Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts, and the author of Grant Wood, A Life. So with that, Tripp. Thanks. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, what a treat uh, it is to gather with everyone here uh, and to uh, hear these wonderful papers. Um, I have to thank uh, Wanda and Valerie and Joni yesterday for really setting the context for um, uh, this uh, extraordinary uh, group of speakers. I don't wanna uh, impinge too much on the time of the folks who are gonna be uh, speaking uh, in this first session, um, but let me just uh, say by way of introduction to these next three uh, papers that the, the theme that we chose for this first session is the art that is life. Um, Many of you all may be unfamiliar with where that comes from. It was the motto for um, the Rose Valley Art Colony, um, founded in 1901 in Pennsylvania, which was a sort of a utopian socialist arts and crafts kind of community. And the art that is life, what it meant for Rose Valley was that the life that was lived in that artist colony was its own form of artistic practice. Um, the meals that they had, the theatricals that they staged, the, the lives and relationships that were really fostered there um, were as much a part of the art that they were producing um, as the final products themselves. And I think you'll see in the papers today that um, this is also very much true uh, uh, of the, the 
the owners and residents of the houses that we'll be exploring, um, which include uh, Olivia uh, Armandroff is going to be talking to us about Henry Chapman Mercer's Font Hill Castle, um, the wonderfully eccentric home that he built for himself uh, uh, in Bucks County. Um, Michael Clapper uh, will be speaking with us about Maxfield Parish's The Oaks and the Cornish, Cornish colony um, that surrounded it. Um, and last, Karen Zakowski will be talking with us about Henry Varnum Poor's Crow House, where, you know, the house itself became a motif even in the production. Um, for all of these um, figures, um, I think they're, you know, one of their great productions really was um, the live that they produced within these houses. Um, and I, I hope we'll be able to explore, uh, maybe in our discussion afterward, um, how how those lives continue beyond the lives of their owners and creators, um, and just how fragile um, that uh, sense of a life um, and fragile, you know, sort of the material culture of these houses can be as well. Um, so I'm really looking forward to these. Uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping, um, just to keep us on track um, uh, for the speakers. I will uh, give you like a two minute warning uh, as you're getting towards the, the end. I am the worst offender of this when I'm giving a talk, so, um, so don't take it personally. Uh, and uh, afterwards, we'll have about a half an hour for discussion and Q&A, which I know will be robust. So really looking forward to it. And I will invite first up Olivia. Thank you, Tripp, for your kind introduction and for moderating this panel. I also want to emphasize how much I appreciate the work the organizers have put into this wonderful event. So Haas, the Grantwood Colony, Maura Pilcher, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. I also want to say how grateful I am to my fellow presenters, um, and I'm looking forward to learning so much from you all today, um, in addition to how much I learned yesterday. Um, I finally want to just acknowledge the Iowa, Meskwaki, and Salk people whose homelands encompass Iowa City and give thanks for the opportunity to be in this space and place right now. So this morning, I am very much looking forward to sharing my paper with you entitled Tiling a Life, Henry Chapman Mercer and his Font Hill Castle. So Font Hill Castle was the home of tile maker Henry Chapman Mercer, and it demonstrates competing interest in a romantic, sentimental version of the historical past with the advances being made towards a new and modern future. Mercer played a central role in the house's conception and production, and it was fabricated by a very small team of individuals who were expected to adhere to his vision. As a result, the finished structure is a unique and highly personalized testament to Mercer's tastes, evidencing a man who, at the turn of the 20th century, balanced a concern for the contemporary with simultaneous passions for the antiquarian. Mercer was keenly interested in Gothic fiction, including the work of Edgar Allan Poe, whose complete collections of, of writings he owned, as well as his inkwell. Um, and Mercer tried himself to write short stories in this style. Similarly, an interest in the Gothic really seems to have inspired the tile maker to look to medieval precedents when designing his own home. He remembered deriving inspiration as a child from his grandfather's medieval castles, um, prints of them on the, a lot of prints of medieval castles along the Rhine River. And in addition, his travels through Europe um, gave him design sources. So his wealthy aunt, Elizabeth Chapman Lawrence, fondly known as Aunt Leela, began sponsoring these trips during his childhood. And it was the inheritance of her fortune later in life in 1905 when Mercer was 49 years old that financed the construction of Bonhill Castle. In England, Mercer had visited Haddon Hall, a rural 12th century medieval manor and banqueting hall. And this had direct influence on his design of Bonhill Castle. Both structures feature irregular roof lines with towering chimneys and imbalanced ground plans and similar ornamentation, including the gray facing and leaded windows. 
Furthermore, Mercer's construction notebooks show he sought to achieve a similar effect to the paneling of, in the dormer room as is achieved in the medieval precedence banqueting hall. In some ways, Mercer's project recalls ones undertaken by many participants of the grand tour, such as Lord Burlington, who designed his own Palladian residence, Chiswick House, after his return to Italy, outfitting it with a collection he amassed abroad. Like, Mercer, like Burlington, Mercer embraced the role of amateur architect, using his travels as a source of his inspiration. Mercer's distinct approach to the planning process resulted in an irregular layout that resembled the floor plan of a medieval castle. Mercer had no architectural training, and although he knew several architects, he, there is no evidence that he consulted them on the project. While he did not make conventional blueprints, his construction notebooks um, show include sketches of the rooms and their floor plans, as well as dimensional calculations. Mercer primarily conceived of each room by molding blocks of clay in three-dimensional models that subverted rectilinear standards. Here, working with clay, Mercer adapted a medium he was most familiar with as a tile maker for a new project. Once the designs for the individual rooms were set, the blocks were each assembled together to form an interior layout. The 44 rooms did not easily conform to a consistent plan, and instead of large stairwells that brought the seven levels together, Mercer conceived of 32 stairwells that would connect the rooms, each of which had at least two doorways, allowing for irregular pathways through the house. Narrow passages and winding staircases enhanced the sense of mystery and surprise. In the end, Mercer worked from the, in, from the inside outward. For Mercer, this meant utility was prioritized above all, above all else. After finalizing the plan and making individual rooms, room plans to scale, Mercer turned his attention to the building's profile, experimenting with towers and roofs. Ultimately, he referred to the flat towered roof in the Jersey Terrace as afterthoughts. A final plaster of Paris model for the house pictured here was used during the building process. At the same time that Mercer conceived of a unique floor plan, his interest in individuation extended to all features of the house. His construction notebooks demonstrate the ways in which Mercer was working, Mercer was working with variations of doors, column capitals, even windows, of which there are supposedly 200. Unlike other structures, which conformed to the classical ideals of maintaining harmony, balance, and standardization, Font Hill Castle's designs celebrated its discontinuity. The construction process was experimental. Before beginning his tile-making business, Mercer had a long and successful career as an archeologist, and some of his scholarly pursuits endured into the second phase of his life. Mercer actively collected tools from across times and cultures until the end of his life, embarking upon a separate museum to house them after completing his home, the purpose-built Mercer Museum. This interest in making and the use of tools explains Mercer's investment in the process of building his home. As has been discussed, Mercer worked with a small crew of only 10 unskilled work laborers between 1908 and 1912 to realize this design. Mercer incorporated new technologies into the design, adapting medieval precedent to modern conveniences. For example, plumbing, an electrical system, an intercom system, and even central heating were part of the design from the beginning. Unlike medieval castles, which are well known for being chilly, Mercer augmented the heat that came from the fireplaces in nearly every room with a system for transferring warm air from the basement's coal furnaces. He also created a system of air shafts in the exterior walls to prevent condensation and dampness. Unlike a traditional castle built from granite, Mercer embraced the relatively new technology of concrete for the entire structure. Mercer subscribed to and contributed to the magazine Cement Age, which had given him an appreciation for contemporaneous projects being undertaken with the material. At the beginning of the construction process, Mercer had also attended the meetings of the American Portland cement manufacturers, which would have also provided a new understanding of concrete's uh, properties. Mercer was attracted to concrete's supposed permanence and recognized the benefits of its fire resistant capacity, especially given that his uncle had lost a valuable collection of armor in a fire. 
The cement age would even pick up an article from the local paper, the Doylestown Intelligencer, that reported how Mercer had celebrated his birthday with a bonfire atop the concrete mansion in 1910, causing unnecessarily, unnecessary alarm in the eyes of the article's, article's author amongst his neighbors. Because cement mixes were not yet normalized, Mercer's workers mixed the concrete by hand using recipes that resulted in a coarse texture that Mercer preferred. The mixed concrete was transported in iron wheelbarrows or boxes with handles and then hoisted to the upper levels through a horse powered pulley system. While the concrete was mixed anew, other materials in the construction were recycled. Frames were often constructed out of salvaged wood, including from old buildings and bridges and iron reinforcements were taken from junkyards. In some ways, Mercer's work foreshadows more modern assemblage techniques and that recontextualize found materials. Mercer was dedicated to the maxim of British architect and medieval revivalist, Augustus Pugin, who called on architects to demonstrate construction, not to construct decoration, sorry, called on architects to decorate construction, not construct decoration. In his own writings for the cement age, Mercer discouraged architects from disguising concrete with a facing of brick or stone, instead proposing they embrace it as a finished surface that could speak for itself. Here, Mercer again predicted a more radical turn in architecture toward revealing the inner industrial materials, including iron, that made architecture more modern structures possible. In the cement age, uh, articles followed the construction process of Font Hill Castle, and there were illustrated articles that showed this process. And once it was completed, Mercer's home was celebrated with for its unabashed use of concrete in a poem and illustrated front frontispiece shown here. Because concrete's plasticity meant it could be sculpted or molded into shapes, the material allowed Mercer to incorporate design features from furniture and, such as vanities and bookshelves, to structural embellishments such as columns and vaults. The concrete construction technique was especially well suited to Mercer's vision for tiled arches and vaults. In order to construct these arches and vaults, Mercer devised a system diagrammed in his construction notebooks. Before the concrete was poured, a curving layer of dirt would be mounted atop a wooden platform. The tiles would be fa placed face down in this dirt toward what would become the cavity after the concrete was poured, hardened, and the dirt was removed. So black and white photographs of the house seem to substantiate its connection to medieval castles of the past, and the concrete easily resembles cut gray stone. Here, as I flip through photographs taken by the Historic American Building Survey, the building is set against a cloudy sky, heightening its sense of mystery. The interior shots, which often emphasize the vaulted ceiling, reveal experimentation in, with dark and light as it plays out on the gray scale. Indeed, the lighting of these spaces was of great importance to Mercer. In his design, he took inspiration from his favorite images, including a print made after Rembrandt's The Philosopher in Meditation. At the same time as black and white the black and white images capture the play of light well, they obscure one of the key differences between Font Hill and a typical medieval relic, color. Instead, color images reveal the dynamism and playfulness of the structure. Most importantly, they capture the bright shades of paint applied to walls and doors and the brilliance of the art and tiles. From the beginning, Mercer intended the space to be a museum as well as a residence. Mercer owned over 7,000 prints and engravings, placing 900 on display, which were accompanied by paintings, French tapestries, and over 6,000 books. Here, this, in the study, he even used chicken wire to showcase his collection of ancient Etruscan pottery above in the guise of a cornice. Most importantly, Mercer was able to integrate his collection of tile into the fabric of the house. The origins of the tiles were important and their provenance was carefully tracked. Much of the 1,564 tiles in his collection were spolia from China, the Middle East, Spain, and Holland. 
While many of the tiles had been acquired in Mercer's travels, both from dealers and directly from potteries, such as the Triana Pottery in Spain, he began to aggressively add to the collection in 1914 after the completion of the construction project. Mercer rigorously pursued correspondence with expatriates, including military officers and YMCA workers, such as S.A. Filch, who was posted in then Peking, as well as Presbyterian missionaries, such as the Reverend Joseph R. Cunningham, who he contacted with form letters. In addition, he worked with American dealers, such as Lawn's Curiosity Shop in New York City, and still more historic tiles had been awarded to Mercer, such as an old Bengali tile given to Mercer by then director of the South Kensington Museum in 1900. And a set of Delft tiles were presented to him by the Harvard Lampoon Society in 1907. Among the oldest tiles incorporated into the house were a set of Sumerian tablets that had once been used as receipts for goods purchased at markets in the second millennium BCE. These had been acquired by the American diplomat, antiquarian, and novelist Edgar James Banks. In addition, Mercer had pieces of red clay that were said to have been made in Jerusalem at the time of Christ, and other tiles that were believed to have been part of the original Alhambra. Mercer found intriguing and visually exciting ways to feature this collection, such as this set of Chinese roof tiles that leap from the concrete wall, creating a line that mirrors the flared skirt worn by Mercer's aunt in this portrait that sits nearby. While some of the tiles were collected, many had been fabricated by Mercer himself at his nearby Moravian pottery and tile works. He had begun experimenting with tile later in life in 1897 after a career as an archeologist, and he quickly name, uh, made a name for himself in the business after he launched in 1899, ultimately patenting three different kinds of tile making techniques. At the time he embarked upon this project, Fawn Hill Castle, Mercer was outfitting homes across America and even abroad. From one of his first commissions, secured through his aunt for Isabella Stewart Gardner, such as in this image, which shows the tile floors of the House Museum's Gothic room, to ones across the United States, including in Texas, at King Ranch, and as we learned yesterday, for the floor of Alice Pike Barney Studio House in DC, which featured Mercer tile as well. In some ways, Mercer illustrated the dialogue between his collection of tiles and his own work by designing some tiles that were made in the guise of historical examples. So ceiling mosaics in the study are enlargements of similar reliefs in Toledo in the 16th and 17th centuries. Tiles in the yellow room that show a castle and eagle were inspired by two tiles excavated from the Church of Santa Maria in Seville, Spain. And more generally, many of Mercer's unglazed blue and white raised designs quote Wedgwood Pottery's iconic style. In this way, the house was intended to represent the history of tile production. But Mercer also paired historically inspired tiles with his most iconic and recent designs, which were being sold at the time. Thus, Font Hill Castle was not only a museum, but also, as Mercer referred to it, as an exhibition home, which, like any showpiece, was a savvy advertisement. Already during its construction, Font Hill was a spectacle that had attracted attention. A 1910 report in the Doylestown Intelligencer recounted how Mercer had acquired a rooster and a watchdog in response to aggressive, even belligerent visitors. Once the house was completed, Mercer hosted prospective clients, including John Wanamaker, as well as other notable figures, including Henry Ford, who shared his interest in collecting tools, Marcel Duchamp, and John Philip Sousa. These and other guests would have learned about the history of Mercer's firm through the visual narrative incorporated by Mercer's successful past projects. The Moravian Pottery and Tile Works derived its name from Mercer's interest in Moravian and other early 18th century colonial firebracks. And the design of, of these motifs were inspiration for his first tiles. In his home, he set these iron firebacks into the wall alongside the brocade tiles they inspired. Other series were incorporated too, such as a set of golfing tiles that was commissioned by a country club, which were installed in one of Font Hill's bathrooms. <laughs> as, and in one hall, Mercer set his scheme related to the Four Seasons, which had been designed for the Pennsylvania Capitol, which was one of his most successful and well-known, as well as extensive projects. Each room was dedicated to a specific subject, which dictated its tile scheme. The most complex arrangement at Font Hill was in the Columbus Room. Here, 
The ceiling is occupied with scenes of Columbus's supposed discovery of the new world. Among other images recreated in tile is a map by Leonardo da Vinci and other scenes adapted from 16th century woodcuts. In the adjoining bow room, Mercer dedicated the field, or sorry, the ceiling to a tiled map of ancient Mexico City. And finally, in the yellow room, um, there was tile work dedicated to the story of the pirate Bluebeard. The fantasy of travel and exploration was alive in this house in these rooms. While Font Hill was officially completed in 1912, Mercer lived until 1930 and continued to add tiles to the home throughout his life. The dynamic space is a testament to the artist's own creativity and his ability to channel the inspiration he derived from a range of sources into an utterly new and fantastic vision. Thank you. All right, good morning. Um, so uh, I'll now talk about Maxfield Parish. My, my talk's called Living the Dream, Maxfield Parish and the Oaks. Uh, Parish, who was one of the most popular and widely admired artists of the 20th century, also designed and largely built his own home and studio, which he named the Oaks, right? You're here seeing the main uh, Southern facade and the reflecting pool in the garden terrace. And he lived there and worked there for over 60 years. If we want to understand the nature of Parrish's art, and I'm showing you on the right Daybreak from 1922, his most well-known work, and perhaps get some idea of the reason why many people uh, liked it, we need to understand the Oaks as a material and experiential realization of an ideal way of life. This is what I mean by my title, Living the Dream. Um, Parrish's ex existence at the Oaks was a living out in practice of lifestyle aspirations that appealed to many, right? including Parrish himself, and that he also visualized in his artworks. Most people didn't have the means or the skills to live like Parrish did, but they could instead buy a Parrish print and through it, enjoy an idealized version of the way of life that he envisioned. So I, I want to get into the particulars of the character of the house and the grounds at the Oaks and how Parrish transposed significant features of his home into his art. But the larger case that I'd like to argue is that both the Oaks and Parrish's paintings embodied a dream lifestyle. A, a respite from the pressures and shortcomings of urban industrialized labor. This ideal lifestyle had a constellation of features, right? Including natural beauty, um, sophisticated culture, community, and freedom. A primary aspect of this dream was to enjoy and to live closely and regularly with the beauty of nature. So, you know, trees, mountains, water, skies, seasonal changes, uh, flower gardens, vistas. At the same time, this ideal world was cultured, right? Not rustic or crude or rough. Uh, freedom, right? To pursue self-directed activities rather than to labor for money was important. Yet so too was community with other cultured people. Thus the formation of the Cornish colony rather than isolated individual retreats. Uh, Parrish and his fellow colonists very much enjoyed socializing, conversation, letter writing, gathering at people's houses, um, putting on 
um, performances, musical and theatrical performances. In several ways, right, his dream existence entailed having the best of both worlds. So nature and culture, um, privacy, but also artistic community, living in the country while also maintaining connections to urban cultural centers. Lest this seem too much like mere self-indulgence, I should add that certainly for working artists like Parrish, um, the point of this existence was to be creative and professionally productive. So let's now go on to the particular case of Parrish and the Oaks and how he not only enjoyed crafting an aesthetically rich and satisfying home environment for himself, but also drew on his experience at the Oaks to imagine a closely related fantasy life in his paintings. Parrish's home was both the site and the model for his art. So let, let me show you uh, the house and highlight some of its key free features, in particular that its relationship to the land around it was one of its predominant aesthetic concerns. Parrish spied the spot for the oaks from his father, Stephen Parrish's home and studio, which is called Northcote. And so I don't have a view from, from Northcote to the Oaks, but here's a view right from the Oaks under construction sort of across a valley. And then you can see here is Northcote. What appealed to Parrish immediately was a small grove of mature oak trees, which he felt were calling out to shelter a house. Uh, to give you a sense of the topographical relationship and setting of the Oaks and Northcote, right? Um, here's a topographical map with a blue dot for the Oaks and an orange dot for Northcote. They're about a mile apart as the crow flies. Uh, at the left is the Connecticut River, which is also the border between New Hampshire where these houses are located and Vermont close by to the west. Note that both of the houses are at the end of long driveways and they sit on fairly steep hillsides, right? The light gray topographical lines on this map are at 40 foot intervals. And they face each other across a valley at the bottom of which flows a stream, which is called Blow Me Down Brook. Um, Parrish initially built a simple two room cabin. Here's a photograph of the work in progress with the help of George Ruggles, his neighbor and construction partner and handyman for over 30 years. The first year they only finished the kitchen. Uh, and let me say, uh, this is the first of a number of images I'll show that are from Parrish's own collection of thousands of glass plate photographs that are now in the special collections library at Dartmouth, which holds Parrish's papers. So 10 years on, right, in 1906, the two had mostly completed the compound. Here's a later aerial photograph. Um, and you can see it includes a two-story main house with gabled pavilions and a separate uh, studio building that Parrish uh, built starting in 1905 when after the birth of his second of four children, he found it was getting a little too noisy and chaotic to concentrate on his, his work in the main house. Throughout the building process, Parrish designed the house to accommodate and to take advantage of the trees and the terrain. So the main facade uh, faced south, looking out across a walled garden and below that pasture land that fell away rapidly. Uh, here's a view from th that pasture. And the house looks out toward the Connecticut River and beyond it to the landmark peak of Mount Escutney. It's about six miles away in the neighboring state of Vermont. Looking toward the main house from afar, it consisted of a conjoined set of simple gabled blocks nestled beneath and amongst the massive oak trees. 
uh, looking out from the house, the chief impression was of the beckoning prospect of a vast, rugged landscape. Parrish's notion of landscape was always a humanized environment, right? Vistas that were anchored by and centered on people, often framed with architecture. In some of the most celebrated works of his early and mid-career, and I'm, whoops, I'm showing you here a dinky bird, from 1904 at the left, at top Garden of Allah from 1918, uh, Daybreak, and then on the right, Ecstasy from 1930. The exultant or contemplative mood of the images derives from the relationship between the human figures and their surroundings. So this brings us back to the Oaks which was both Parrish's own crafting and experience of his ideal and the inspiration and model for many of his paintings. In some cases, the borrowings are quite obvious and specific. Uh, his illustration of the Arabian Nights story of Prince Agib features a large circular reflecting pool like the one on the terrace of the garden at the Oaks, which in turn derived from a similar reflecting pool in his father's garden at Northcote. The pool at the Oaks was larger, it was 16 feet across, more in relation to the house and the larger uh, open spaces around it. We also see uh, in his painting, the cascading spirea prominent in Parrish's garden. And you know, notice how these uh, shrubs similarly symmetrically flank a uh, central axis slash walkway. And the large decorative urns, right, like the one that Parrish received as a gift from landscape designer and architect Charles A. Platt and placed atop the uh, end of a wall in the Garden at the Oaks. One of the most uh, prominent and remarked features of the Oaks was the porch or loggia at its southwest corner. Uh, it's here uh, at the right. Uh, it was a space that joined interior and exterior and focused attention on the picture-like views of the gardens and the landscape beyond. And also I propose served as a key source and structuring conceit for Parrish's magnum opus, Daybreak. The loggia was built as a single story structure early on in the process of expanding the house with a second story later added to create the east wing. The interior of the loggia was a large room about 20 feet wide by 25 feet deep, mostly open to the surrounding landscape on two sides. Parrish directly used his porch and himself as model in his 1901 painting, the Cardinal Archbishop sat on his shaded balcony. This was a story illustration that first appeared in Scribner's magazine. And you see, yes, the distant view in the painting is of Venice, but Parrish has transcribed a lot quite directly from his own reference photo. So notice the bench with the cushions, the squared pilasters, the, the lion-topped column and the table with pewter tea service and china teacups. The most notable architectural departure from the reference photo is the archway, right? And that is similar to the grand arched gate at the west side of Parrish's garden. Daybreak follows a similar pattern of patching in a landscape background very different from what Parrish saw from his porch at the Oaks, right? In this case, it's the sort of craggy, arid, rocky landscape in blue and orange that had so impressed him during a 1902 trip to Arizona 
on assignment for the Century Company, for which he produced a set of illustrations for a series of articles um, titled The Great Southwest, right? They did a series on regions of the country. These images were initially reproduced in the Century in black and white. Just a couple of them in color, though, showed that color was so crucial to their effect that they later reprinted seven more of them in color. So compare one of these, right, the Grand Canyon of the Colorado, with the colors and forms of the landscape in Daybreak. Along with the color plates, uh, Century, they printed a long letter that they had solicited from Parrish in which he remarked, quote, one has but to stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon, look across at the other wall 13 miles away and watch it at sunrise or sunset in order to see color which can exist nowhere else. The low sunlight falls on the red towers and spires and causes them to glow as though they were lit within them. And thousands of feet down into the chasm falls the shadow a blue from dreamland, a blue from which all the skies of the world were made. So this transformative experience of Western landscape was the inspiration for similar landscape backgrounds in several of Parrish's subsequent paintings. But of course, these are starkly different from the landscape that he actually saw from the Oaks. Here's a view looking south from the loggia in winter with Mount Ascutney in the distance on the right and the remains, the wintry remains of the uh, grape arbor hanging down below the cornice. Yet though the landscapes are so different, right? The Arizona landscape and this landscape, notice how similar is the visual structure of the view from Parrish's porch and daybreak. A broad horizontal rectangle is divided symmetrically by two columns, right? The central opening is a perfect square. Lush foliage, right? Not grapevines in daybreak, but more like the profusion of spirea that we saw in the Prince Agib painting, hangs down somewhat miraculously from an unseen support above. At the skyline, contours of distant mountains ripple downward. So as Parrish mauled over and crystallized Daybreak, his first and most successful so independent art print that it's not an illustration or a commercial commission, the view from his own porch, deeply familiar over many years, gave him the cue for its pictorial organization. Uh, many of Parrish's paintings feature a more extreme version of the paradoxical features that he brought together at the Oaks, right? a realm that is once at once wild and desolate, but also orderly and lush. Vast, sublime natural vistas, but seen from and incorporating the welcoming built environment of a grand home. Freeing isolation, yet within uh, a community and affording sociability. The Oaks was not unique or isolated, but was part of a close-knit community of residences and studios that comprise the Cornish colony. And as such, it has a few distinctive features, but it is also an instance of a type. Uh, following the lead of Augustus St. Gaudens, the sculptor who came in 1885, several dozen artists and writers and musicians gathered near the rural New Hampshire town of Cornish um, and built houses or refurbished houses. Um, many of the colony houses had names often chosen to create a sense of place and personal identity. And the two main naming conventions were natural features, right? Like the oaks, or uh, on the left, I'm showing you mast lands, right? The Nichols family home, uh, which in centuries past had been harvested for tall, straight pine trees used for ship masts, or family connections, like uh, St. Gaudens' house, he named it Aspet after the French birth town of his father, 
or I'm showing it on the right uh, again with reflecting pool in the garden terrace like at the Oaks. Um, the Churchill family's house Harlekenden, which was uh, the maiden name of Mabel Churchill. Cornish colony houses commonly had gardened grounds to the point where gardening was one of the renowned practices of the area. And several colony residents, including uh, Charles Platt, who gave Parrish the urn, and Platt's protege, Rose Nichols, were influential authorities on garden design who published books on the topic. Uh, here's, uh, this is Rose Nichols in her garden, and at the right, the terrace overlooking Charles Platt's garden. And again, notice the urns like the one that he gave to Parrish. Platt's idea of gardens as outdoor living rooms was particularly salient so that Cornish gardens tend to be formally structured terraces integrated with the houses by means of pathways and stairs and benches and hedges and low walls. Um, you know, also there are uh, trellises and gateways, common features linking the houses and the gardens. For fear that they would detract from his beloved Oaks Parish did not plant the Lombardy poplars, right? That you see here, this is at Aspet um, St. Gaudens house or uh, that his father, Stephen Parish planted. Uh, these are the studio buildings at Northcote, uh, but they're, they're reminiscent of the Italian gardens that had so inspired many of the colonists. It was unusual too that Parrish neither refurbished an existing house as St. Gaudens had, nor had a house design, right? Charles Platt did designs for a number of the Cornish colony houses. And Parrish himself also undertook an extraordinary amount of the Finnish carpentry and functional metalwork from furniture to cabinetry to hinges. And so on the left here is, is his dining room with a brick fireplace that he laid himself and on the right, the entryway and stair looking uh, back towards the living room in the West Wing. So that the Oaks, um, you know, like we heard yesterday about Woods houses and studio was truly and thoroughly an artistic work of his own creation, even while it shared uh, many defining traits with other Cornish properties. For the last 30 years of his career, Parrish painted almost exclusively landscapes, most of them as calendar images for the publishing company Brown and Bigelow. And this work, right, these, these uh, Brown and Bigelow calendar images were arguably the purest realization of his ideal, both of artistic activity, right, this is what he wanted to do is paint landscapes, and of lifestyle. The top sellers among dozens of such pictures, and I'll say uh, just quickly parenthetically that I tend to pay most attention to the images that sold the most copies because I take those to be the ones that were most culturally resonant and are thus uh, have the richest prospects for analysis of widely shared values and people's longings. The biggest hits among the Brown and Bigelow Calendars were the Mill Pond from 1948 on the left and Evening Shadows in 1953, each of which featured simple gabled buildings underneath gigantic old trees, a vista of distant hills seen across a foreground of rocks and mirror-like still plains of water, and both the sky and the water you see uh, rendered in what was the so-called Maxfield Parish blue, which was just a, a oil glaze of synthetic ultramarine. Um, in these cases, right, and in most of Parish's paradigmatic works, the basic subject is people inhabiting an idealized, humanized natural realm. But now there are no people visible just buildings. And except for the glassy reflective planes of water, which I would argue 
uh, parish has scaled up from the more obviously artificial garden conceit of reflecting pools, don't these idyllic calendar images look an awful lot like a distant view toward the oaks? As Parrish turned his back on figurative art and contentedly hold up at the oaks to paint what he pleased, he uh, asserted that landscape images were really what his audience most wanted and needed in their lives, and thus would be the new trend in popular and commercial art. In a 1931 interview, he declared, I'm done with girls on rocks. Uh, this is mostly a reference to the annual calendar images that he had been producing for General Electric since 1917. Uh, he kept trying to raise the price. It was 2000, it was 5,000, it's $10,000 just for one year's rights. And, but they kept paying him. So he, he had to keep doing them. Um, again, notice the orange blue Southwestern landscapes in all of these. Uh, again, continuing the quote, there are always pretty girls on every city street. So you see he, he's here imagining an urban heterosexual male viewer, but a man can't step out of the subway and watch the clouds playing with the top of Mount Ascutney. He could see that from his porch. Um, it's, the unimad it's the unattainable that appeals. Next best to seeing the ocean or the hills or the woods is enjoying a painting of them, end quote, right? So Parrish here presents a masculine ideal of refined country life and appreciation of nature as an antidote to urban living. At the Oaks, he could live this ideal every day and transmute that existence into his art, which could then become a next best, a vicarious art-mediated experience for his viewers. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me properly? Thank you. Okay. This is Crow House, uh, the home and studio of Henry Varnum Poor. Poor was best known as a ceramicist and a painter, but he also worked as a sculptor, an illustrator, a teacher, an arts organizer. And he had all the skills to make this house, hand make this house himself. He was at the center of an arts colony of actors, writers, musicians, and other visual artists on South Mountain Road um, in New City, New York, which is only about an hour north of Manhattan, but it's quite wild and, and rugged. It's um, just south of a big mountain called High Tor. This place sustained him for 50 years of creative life. And this is Crow House now. The property was allowed to decline after Poor's death and has been criminal, criminally neglected by its current owner, the town of Ramapo, New York. Why should Crow House be saved? Because the ties between this place and the work of Henry Varnum Poor are palpable. Saving the house and the land means saving a window into a creative process. Poor was 33 years old when he came to South Mountain Road. He was born in Kansas to a prosperous family of grain merchants and was expected to go into business. But throughout high school, he took manual and industrial arts classes. Then at Stanford University, he changed his major from economics to art. 
After college, he studied painting in London and Paris and looked at neo-impressionists, especially Cezanne and Matisse. He came back, got married, and briefly tried to make a go both of managing the family farm in Kansas and being a painter. Um, this did not work very well for him. So he went back to California to do teaching and exhibiting his paintings. By 1918, when he was drafted into the army, he had separated from his wife and daughter and established a studio in San Francisco with Marion Dorn, one of his pupils. He bloomed in France. He was a, a translator for his regiment and he was the regimental artist. After returning to the United States, he and Doran marry and decide that an art career was not viable on the West Coast, so they moved to New York. There, they quickly met Mary Mowbray Clark and her husband, John, who were both artists and had been organizers of the 1913 Armory Show and, and were much involved in everything um, new and world culture that was going on in New York. Mary Mowbray Clark and her partner, Madge Jennison, uh, founded something called the Sunwise Turn Bookstore, which was a more a salon than a bookstore. Um, it held readings, it published illustrated books, and it had exhibitions, including two of Henry Barnum Poor's paintings by in 1919 alone. Uh, uh, Henry and Marion were, <clears throat> excuse me, is there any water here? Thank you. Henry and uh, Marion were caught up in um, the circle of Mary Mulberry Clark and Sunwise Turn Bookstore. And they uh, often spent weekends at the Brocken, a place on a country road of South Mountain Road. And they, uh, Henry and Marion were easily convinced to buy land in the area, um, along with other artists, um, including Rollo Peters, who was a Shakespearean actor, and his companion, Amy Murray, a poet, folklorist, and musicians, and the textile designer, Ruth Reeves, and her husband, Leon Olds, an economist. Henry and Marion, who was quickly developing a career as a textile designer, moved to South Mountain Road by the end of 1919. Although Henry had no formal training as an architect, thank you very much. Thank you. As an architect or builder, but he had experience with the manual arts classes um, that he had uh, taken in high school and inspired also perhaps by vernacular French farmhouses he had seen um, in the war, and as well certainly by um, the Brocken, uh, this vernacular 18th century farmhouse that the Mowbray Clarks had remodeled themselves. He took all that and just went to work and started making sketches and um, started actually building almost by himself. It was an ad hoc process, a pragmatic process, using simple tools. It started in January of 1920 and was done about a year later. It's uh, the poor house, is, the crow house as it is called, is uh, sited on a slope and the buildings are built basically um, on different levels. It, it kind of marches up the hill. Uh, material used are mainly hyperlocal, sandstone from disused quarries uh, that were uphill from him, brick from a yard, um, a famous brickyard down the road in Haverstraw, and a fortuitous for him, chestnut blight had occurred five years ear earlier, leaving some trees all seasoned and ready to go and to be chopped down by hand and adzed by hand and, and worked into the framework of the building. There are some very ancient building techniques, hand tools to carve and shape stone and wood, some new materials like metal frame windows and lots of quirkiness, massive headers over doors made out of chestnut beams, flat roofs of concrete and tar paper, 
When an archway in the interior of the house began to separate, Henry just simply added a buttress on the outside to hold it up. Here are the two facades of the house, which I'm just simply calling lawn facade and creekside facade. Um, to orient you, um, unfortunately, the pointer on this thing isn't working, but look at the blue uh, doorway that gets you into the living room of the house. Um, the larger um, room on the right-hand side of the left screen is a... Oh, so you push the top button. It's not oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So this gets you into the living room. This is the studio. Um, there's a creek that basically where my green pointer is. Um, this is the kitchen backside of the kitchen wing. There's a Dutch door here that lets you out onto a terrace. And that is another door into the studio. This is the living room with one of those massive chestnut beams. Um, fireplace with stone lintels that Henry carved himself, that buttress or that archway held up by the buttress outside. Most of the furniture in the room was made by Henry. You go through that archway, enter into the kitchen with a massive stone sink carved by hand. This is the first studio of several I'll describe made by Henry. It's an irregularly shaped room um, with a spiral stair wooden spiral staircase that leads you both to kind of a loft for storage of paintings. And then if you continue up this way, gets you into the second floor of the house. Um, and look at the big north windows. Those big north windows there get you out onto the lawn where Henry um, established gardens and raised beds with ornamental plantings, uh, ornamental shrubs and trees. The structure here was a wor wood workshop as you can see, I hope you can see, ornamented with Henry Vernon Poor's ceramics set into the stucco work. The Creekside Terrace um, was a land work constructed by Henry um, and was the atmosphere and the whole sense of it was um, augmented or changed very much because Henry dammed the creek. And this area right here was a small pool of water that flowed through that doorway that turned a grinding wheel for making pigments. Just after finishing the first phase of Crow House, uh, Poor turned to uh, really dug into what was, become, what was to become one of his major mediums, which is ceramics. He basically taught himself how to make ceramics. Um, he ascertained that there really wasn't a market for um, the kind of high style, low technique ceramic that he had in mind. And so he set himself uh, he both researched the market and researched how to make ceramics and just went to it. Some of the early pieces were the bodies of the ceramics were um, technically not good, uh, very flawed with even with glazes that would flake away and crack. But within about 10 years, he was really quite, a, pr pr quite good at ceramics. And what he um, he always conceived of ceramics as something like a painting surface, 
rather than using conventionalized designs that other potters might use, uh, he treated you, he really treated the, the clay as a canvas. Before the close of um, 1920, before the close of 1921 and only one year, he had enough wares to sell to the Wanamaker's department store. And by mid 1922, he was on a $200 retainer from the Montrose Art Gallery, a place that also sold his paintings. And I want to suggest that um, Poor's, Poor once said that he spent too much time making ceramics and he would have been a better painter if he had never taken it up. But in fact, in his career, the two media inform each other. He used similar techniques in both ceramics and painting. In both mediums, he used a lyrical line like Matisse, sometimes painted on with a brush and sometimes scratched through the surface with the brush end. In other words, graffito, a ceramic technique um, or, or sometimes a plaster technique that he is applying to canvas um, as well as clay. So you can particularly see that in the way that the, the um, check marks of the pants are made with a scraping of a brush end. But after a few years of country living, his relationship with Marion Dorn soured, and by 1923, they were divorced. After a time in France, painting poor married Bessie Brewer, who was an editor, short story writer, and eventually a novelist. She was also the mother of 13-year-old Anne, whom Henry adopted. By 1926, Bessie and Henry welcomed a son, Peter, to the family. This was the third marriage for them both, and it stuck. By 1913, the family needed more room and they wanted more light in the living spaces and Henry wanted a pottery studio. The new addition was built into the hill, uh, into the uphill studio side of the house. Um, and basic, this is the new pottery studio. Again, poor works in an ad hoc fashion, but this time with a mixture of new and old materials. He, used, he still used massive wood beams to carry the roofs and much plaster and brick throughout, but now walls were constructed of concrete block and he made bigger windows with steel casements. He added another full story on top of that old studio and added stone facing onto the lawn side of the story. This new story became bedrooms and bathrooms. And basically where you see something painted brick, that's concrete block and it's a new addition. So this is the lawn side. So this is the new addition and that's the new addition from the creek side. This is, this structure here is the same as this structure here. And that was added on later in 1949. But back to the 1931 editions. The most impressive architectural tile in the house and perhaps in his whole career is this bathroom. Um, this was made in 1928 for the American Designers Gallery, a business venture that Henry Vernon Poor organized with other artists, um, mostly of the decorative arts, including Donald Dusky. Uh, and as well as several other South Mountain artists. The bathroom was much praised both aesthetically for the playful theme of the nude in the shower and technically for its glazes. He received several commissions for the bathrooms and one version ended up here installed at Crow House in 1931. The pottery is that one room addition built further up the hill, a fully equipped pottery with kilns, uh, work tables, um, and was, you know, the space he needed to make the enormous production that he, uh, an output that he made.
On the right, you see a bedroom um, and everything you see in the um, in that room was made by poor, including the table, the curtains, and that is a ceramic stove. And he never stopped tinkering with the Crow House property. In 1949, he added that bedroom bath wing to the kitchen end of the house. He built a small cinder block writing studio for Bessie. And in 1957, he built a studio for himself at the northern end of the property overlooking a small stream. Stylistically, this is the most modern of all his structures. And he used it as a painting studio. Poor was definitely an artist connected to his materials, to the place he worked, to his home life, to the quotidian, but he was also a prominent professional out in the world. The list of all his professional uh, affiliations is ridiculously long. Uh, I'll mention just a few. He never stopped being an easel painter and making ceramics and he showed often and everywhere. Uh, he was perpetually trying out new media, including fresco. Again, he taught himself this technique and by the 1940s was a major, major player in this field, often working with his daughter, Anne, who you see up at the top of the scaffold. He also made murals out of tile. He was a co-founder of Skokegan, an artist residency program in Maine, and remained an effective and energetic board member there. Um, he was a uh, for a period of a few years, he was a commissioner of fine arts, which oversaw the decoration of federal buildings in DC, in Washington, DC. He wrote two books and illustrated at least two others. And he served as an artist soldier in Alaska and World War II. And he also became the unofficial architect uh, or maybe the official architect for the houses along South Mountain Road that were built by his fellow um, artists, writers, screenwriters. First of all of these was the house of Ruth Reeves built right next door to him um, in a similar kind of style and technique as Crow House. It was completed just in the year after, um, after Crow House was actually while he was teaching himself ceramics. He did houses for Milton Caniff, who was a cartoonist, Maxwell Anderson, the playwright, and John Hausman, the actor. By this time, uh, by the later 30s, he was working in this much more modernistic style, using primarily um, concrete block. Houses faced the south so that they could follow the path of the sun. And usually on the south side of the house, there were terraced gardens. And um, he was an active maker of the gardens as well as Mary Mowbray Clark, who became quite a prominent garden designer. But I wanna bring this back to Crow House and how that place informed his work. March Sun of 1933 shows Bessie Poor, Peter Poor and Anne Poor. They sit in front of the garden window in Crow House with a cat sunning itself in the wan early light, early spring light. The painting combines several genres that Poor expressed on canvas, in his drawings, in fresco, and on ceramics, still life, portraiture, and landscape. In fact, most often the subject of Henry Varnum Poor's work in any media is Crow House, his family, their land, and the world of South Mountain Road. And I want to suggest that Crow House is not only the subject, but the catalyst for Poor's creative life. Those are various Crow House subjects. From the first, Crow House is a place to phys physically and really viscerally engaged with, with the materials that he found on the site. He's, he did this throughout his life, um, inventing new techniques of how to accomplish this all the while. This, the plate that you see on the right incorporates sand he brought back from a vacation in Florida, mixed in with the glazes to uh, give more texture to the plate. 
While building the new studio in 1957, he was working on illustrations for Call of the Wild, the Jack London novel. He devised a method of drawing on gessoed panel, which had been inked and sanded. This gave him textural richness, but also let him use that free flowing line of drawing that he so loved. I suggest that he worked out this method of illustration by making the overmantle in the studio, which uh, is, I believe, a fresco painting, also that kind of gritty um, subsurface with drawing on top. And Crow House is a place to envision and try out spatial ideas. The shape of the three-dimensional gable is echoed in the doors of the closet where it is flattened out into a uh, two-dimensional chevron. Then that chevron is portrayed on a bowl that illusionistically portrays three dimensions. Poor was fascinated with curving and spiral staircases. Uh, they appear um, in the first iteration of Crow House in stone and in wood. Uh, the, when rendered in two dimensions, that chevron can look like the stairs climbing up the curved surface of the bowl. And I want to suggest that Poor's creative life was immeasurably enriched by the colony of creatives on South Mountain Road. And at the head of this for Poor was Bessie Brewer. Bessie was wife, mother, hostess, and writer. She wrote short stories and novels, radio scripts, and one play. Her fictional work is about women struggling to assert their emotional, sexual, and social needs in their sidelined roles as daughters, wives, and lovers. She was certainly a part of the theater and film world of South Mountain Road. She was also a part of the design world. A quote from a 1928 review of a Ruth Reeves textile show in the American Designers Gallery exhibit is quite revealing. Miss Reeves has a sense of comedy, which she knows how to constrain into proper wall harmonies. One of her best linens involves herself, Martha Ryther, Mrs. Varnum Poor, a cat, a stove, various things and personalities important to her own home life. I don't have time, but there are so many avenues to look into with Henry Varnum Poor and his relationship with the South Mountain Road Colony. Um, Poor himself did work in textile, and this is um, a, an avenue that is not much known or looked into. Um, how he interacted with his first wife, or sec actually second wife, Marion Dorn, who was a textile designer, is not known. They apparently did remain on somewhat good terms. And his next door neighbor, Ruth Reeves, was a textile designer. And along with Martha Ryther, another of the um, South Mountain Road colonists who was married to a painter, Morris Cantor. So this interchange between painting and textile design is obviously critical. Uh, Poor made many, many drawings of military life and, uh, and paintings and his interactions with Milton Caniff and Bill Mal Malden, who were both cartoonists who uh, portrayed uh, the kind of um, drama and emotional richness of military life. That is something that could be looked into quite a bit more. Poor had ties to the theater world since his earliest days on South Mountain Road. And I think stage set and set design comes to influence his work. On the left is a ceramic that he entitled Romeo and Juliet. And it is obviously a, um, a three-dimensional realization of one of, or kind of a conglomeration of scenes from Romeo and Juliet. And on the right is a so-called poker room uh, that was made for Ben Hecht, uh, uh, the quite a, a somewhat notorious screenwriter. And as you can see, these two different things in two different scales are basically kind of pie-shaped, wedge-shaped structures, um, fantasy structures that are supposed to, um, um, they're, they're theater pieces.
Poor died in 1970, Bessie in 1975, and Anne lived on in the house until her death in 2002. Peter Poor decides that the house is too much of a burden for his family and he decided to sell it. Friends of Crow House was formed, an organization, a nonprofit, and to convince the next donors who wanted to raise the house to give them enough time to find some other solutions for it. Uh, the solution was that the town of Ramapo bought the house um, along, and it came with a preservation covenant that guaranteed uh, public access and preservation, preservation of the structures and the grounds. Well, almost immediately, the town of Ramapo um, just did not fulfill any promises and um, let the house uh, slide into really deep neglect. Electricity was turned off for a while, a hurricane, several hurricanes blew through. And for a while, the foot, the kind of little bridge over a creek to the house was blown out and, and um, the house was inaccessible. Um, but the town of Ramapo has much bigger issues um, because um, in 2018, the town supervisor was convicted of securities fraud that had little to do with Crow House, maybe. And um, he was sentenced to jail uh, and, you know, not much attention is being paid to Crow House. Um, the most recent town supervisor is um, a, more interested in Crow House and some mo uh, quite needed and emergency repairs have been done over the last uh, six months or so which is very good news. So why save Crow House? Because the physical place tells us so much about this artist. Poor's art and the house and the land live in symbiosis and the community too nurtured itself. All this history alone, of course, is worthwhile, but it's more than history. I think this symposium is demonstrating quite well that place and creativity are linked um, and that when we today come to these places, we have insight into creativity. But as good as these papers are, it's not as good as being there. But is it too far gone to save? Uh, there is, there has been much damage in the last 15 years, especially, but there are really, really good signs. Uh, the structure can be repaired. Garden is overgrown, several berms need showing up, but the bones of the land are not very damaged. Many of the furnishings are still owned by the family who are involved with the foundation and the papers of poor have been given to the Archives of American Art. What is the best, highest use for poor house? Of course, it could be a historic house museum. It could be an artist residency program or a scholar study or a conference center done in, profit, in partnership with a nonprofit. It could even revert to private use as long as there were um, um, accommodations made for accessibility and, um, main, and maintenance. So the hero in all of this is the Henry Varnum Poor Foundation. And just to close my talk, I'm going to be a bit of an activist here and say that I have brought along um, a letter written to the town of Ramapo supervisor, which if you all would like to sign would be most appreciated. Thank you very much this morning. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> So I'll use I'll use this microphone to make okay. it. Oh, I see. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much to uh, our speakers, uh, three incredible projects and houses um, that you all have uh, introduced us to. Um, I am going to uh, transition us now into um, uh, Q and A. Um, we will take a look at the chat for the for those of you who are joining us online. Um, encourage questions from the audience. Um, but I'm just going to take executive privilege here first and start us off by um, asking you all uh, to what extent the creators of these homes um, actively envisioned them as museum spaces. Um, I think it's maybe a little bit more clear for Mercer, who, who basically is sort of like, you know, tied his poor housekeeper to the house for the rest of her life as a tour guide. Um, but. Uh, I wonder if the three of you could talk about the ways in which um, these creators thought about the posterity of these buildings as public institutions and how that might have affected the way that they were created. We can just go down the line. I'm happy to get it started. Um, thank you. That's such a great question. So I mentioned in the talk that um, Mercer really envisioned his house to be a museum. At the same time, he went on to build a separate museum, the Mercer Museum, for his collection of tools. So the house is um, a little bit different uh, from the museum, which is you're more free to wander, I think, as like a, a typical museum. The house is more intended to be experienced through a tour. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, so Mercer used to give tours himself, um, but when he passed away, um, his the foreman of his factory, um, his, he and his wife had lived at the house. And um, his wife was kind of the caretaker of the house. And um, so in perpetuity, uh, Mercer left the house um, to Bucks County and um, requested that this caretaker um, remain on the property um, to give these tours. And so it was um, in some ways open to the public as a museum um, until she passed away, at which point um, it became more of the established museum that we see today. Uh, in, in Parrish's case, not at all did he think of it as a museum. It was a place for him to live and to work. And he, you know, he pretty much his entire career spent there. Uh, it, he stopped painting in 1962. He still lived there. He died there in 1966, by which time he needed a nurse, but still there was no talk of converting it or leaving it. Um, it remained private property. Um, a parish dealer and advocate, Alma Gilbert, bought the house in 1978, and she wanted she opened a, a museum, and she was going to try to fund that with a, a restaurant and, and hotel. But unfortunately, the main house uh, a year later in 1979 burned to the ground, and she rebuilt it. But I mean, so this is part of the reason why it's it's you know like it, it's not part of Haas because it's the, most of it is not there or it's been heavily redone. Stay. Poor definitely did not see his, his house as a museum. Um, I think he would have valued uh, this. He, it was an artist colony and it was a center of an artist colony. I think he would have valued um, saving that as an idea. Um, he valued the house, obviously, he valued the property. But as a public place, I don't, that was not part of his vision, I don't think. Thanks. Questions from the audience? Folks have questions out here. Yes. So all these uh, three buildings, um, really like design, by the artists. So are there any limitations to calling them works of art or of art? And would that you know, sort of benefit by declaring by sort of the categorical shift uh, from being like you know art school studio to actually it's such an artist work? Repeat the question. Oh, sorry, I should have done that. Um, so um, 
I'll, I'll try to do it justice, sort of like, are there limits to which these houses themselves uh, can be considered works of art? Is that is that a fair enough summary? I, I think of Poor's House as, yes, a work of art. The whole, not only the house, but all the structures and, and, the, and the land. Um, I, I'm a sucker for that argument. I, I really think of all artist houses <laughs> as, as artworks. And I think many uh, people who are not artists make houses that are, um, that are, that are artful, that, are, that, that function as immersive creative environments too. So you won't, you won't get any argument from me. Yeah, I mean, I know th there's a there's a practical side to that question about would it do any good for preservation and appreciation, and then there's a sort of conceptual categorical side to that. I mean, Parrish himself, you know, he he was remarked at the time as like, wow, it's it's amazing that uh, you know, as a painter, you're you're such a skilled mechanic, and he would joke like, no, actually, I'm a mechanic who also paints. Um, so it was it was an important part of his artistic practice as he thought of it, but but I don't know. Then I I would say, but then okay, you know, like as as you were like, well, what is the person most known for, or what is their best work? And I would say, in Parrish's case, like yeah, his house is really cool, but his paintings are what he's most highly regarded for, and and maybe you know, at the time and and for subsequent his main work. Although, yeah, as I said, like his house was remarked in his own day. It was it was published many times in, in magazines as to say, boy, this is a notable work of art in its own right. Thank you for your question. Um, I think it's really interesting to think, absolutely, I, I believe that Font Hill Castle is a total work of art. Um, at the same time, I think that, um, as I was saying, you know, there's individual tile schemes that he incorporated that are seen elsewhere. And so, um, the friction between thinking of those as individual art pieces and then reading them into the room as a piece of art and then what it needs to be part of the larger structure. I think that you can, there's various scales of interpretation. And so while I think of Font Hill Castle as a total work of art, I also think that you can think about all the individual pieces functioning almost independently as well as they function together. Yes. This is for Olivia. What's the biggest conservation challenge for you at the museum? And just to, to repeat, what is what is the, the greatest uh, conservation challenge at Font Hill Castle? Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you, um, but I can do some investigating and back, get back to you. <laughs> yes. Less a question than a comment on the discussion. Um, Something is a total work of art. I think it's a really good question for the last couple of days to, to sort of think about. And, and, and there is, it seems to me, at the turn of the 19th, particularly the 18th, 20th century, there is a notion of the home as a work or of the artist's home as a total work of art. And Mercer would be our today's best example of that, I think, where in some ways he's creating a space that in no way is just a little domestic dwelling. But rather something that is a vision, and and he's got to have a public in mind with it. It's public, the present, the public of the of, of the of the future. Um, and I do think, see within our house properties um, differences between those that make self consciously um, integrated um, a totality of vision. Not incrementally done procedurally, but really having a wholeness to it. That is a, a Kunstwerk or a Gesamt Kunstwerk. And then there are more like what I think the other two have been describing, which are homes that, while it would be wonderful if the oaks were still around, you have to have a lot of documentation to see from those, from those photographs. But really, that was just for a lifestyle of a particular moment and without. You say a sense of in perpetuity uh, and so on. And then maybe poor comes both out of that crafted tradition of the of the early 20th century 
but just given the character he is and his sounds like he didn't have much money as well as being very good at doing what he was doing um it's really for the moment and it's it's a particular well why i love saying something like that is because it describes really an individual moment and an individual lifestyle um and i think that's what's very much an alternative to a lot of other lifestyles at that moment and today so sometimes i think they should be saved just if they're if they've got as much to offer as well that's you can't somewhere well, I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to do my best, Wanda. So for our, for our virtual audience, Wanda Korn has just given a much more eloquent look at uh, uh, these artists' houses than I could probably recapitulate. But to, to put it in a nutshell, um, uh, you know, the notion really is that uh, the collection of houses under Haas's guidance, or that we think of as artists' houses, run a full gamut from uh, the total work of art, the Gesamtkunstwerk House, which is really conceived as a product un unto itself, to these houses that were settings for lifestyles or settings for a particular approach to an artist's practice um, that are in many ways you know, every bit is worth preserving um, as sort of windows into a particular moment or particular approach to craft or to art um, as something that is much more recognizably kind of a, you know, a, a work of art unto itself. Hopefully that was fair enough. <laughs> All right, others. Yes. Call it what? Architecture. <laughs> I like that as an as a new term for these. I I had a quick question about, well, maybe it's not a quick question of um, the in some ways the disconnect between um, uh, the artistic practice and the the homes that we're talking about. Um, I think often with artistic uh, or sort of artist homes, there is this belief that they are somehow showcases for clients or for patrons. Um, and, you know, when I, uh, when I think about Mercer's work, um, certainly he had, you know, a, a great range of clients, but, you know, those visiting his house might have like run for the hills if they had seen some of those interiors. Uh, you know, when we think about the oaks, um, it's almost as if uh, there's a green screen where the, you know, you see the house but it gets sort of inserted with these sort of much more kind of exotic landscapes in the, the that sort of earlier style. Um, and when you look at, you know, poor ceramics, you I think immediately it's like Italian Majolica or something along those lines, as opposed to, I wouldn't have immediately have associated them with that house. So I'm wondering if, if the three of you can talk about that disconnect between um, what was kind of privately created for, um, for themselves versus what the public or a patron or a client might have expected or wanted? Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about, I mean, there's a uh, rather obvious connection in terms of Mercer's artistic expression and that his house is embellished all over with tile and that's what his profession was. So you, I think, can see the immediate connection there. I think that um, one thing I was trying to get into with the concrete was kind of an exploration of an alternative materiality to clay. Um, so I think that in some ways, I, mean, he, I think he was really interested in this ostensible mold moldability of the concrete and that it could be cast into so many different forms. Um, so maybe thinking about um, kind of a, a translatable materiality and architecture. Um, at the same time, I think just to address your question about um, the role clients played, um, I think that he did conceive of it as a showcase, but he was also, um, I, I read some interesting stories about um, various people that did visit Fawn Hill Castle. Um, and I think that he was a little bit selective in his own um, invitations. Um, and so I, I do know that at least for Henry Ford, um, when he came to visit Font Hill Castle, um, he, uh, Mercer actually kind of 
didn't disinvite him, um, but he wasn't <laughs> allowed to stay overnight um, versus other people were. Um, so, um, so he was kind of required to go find some other place to sleep. Um, so I think that there, um, I, I would be, it would have, it would be interesting if there is more documentation, which I don't know about, um, to know more about how these visits took place, what Mercer's tour of the structure was like, um, and what kinds of interactions happened on that tour to kind of see um, whether people were, as you say, kind of overwhelmed and in some ways repulsed by the structure. Well, it seems like the rare client would have walked in and said, I've got to have that ceiling, <laughs> you know. Parish for the Oaks, I would say there are two types of visitors. One is people from the colony, from the Cornish colony. Um, that leftmost block of the house was built last was a music room. Um, it had a panel screen and theater at one end of it. So he's very much thinking of that as a place for the community to gather. But in terms of like client professional context, he's mostly trying to hold them at a distance, you know, so that he's, he's famous. People want to come talk, you know, I'd like to write a magazine article about you, or, you know, I'd like to, could, could I please convince you to, you know, do an ad for our company or, you know, the, and he would say to those people, he would say, oh, you know, that, they're certainly not in the winter. You, there's no way you can get up here. You know, the roads are, just, I, he would just use any excuse to try to say, please do not come if you're a professional contact. Right. Interesting. Um, I would say that I um, am not as knowledgeable about Poor's uh, professional career to speak really accurately to this question, but my, my sense is that uh, he, he understood how to market himself and, had, and his work. Um, and I don't think that had a huge amount to do with Pro House, although he, there were articles written about him and about Pro House, and that was a way of inviting the public in. Um, so I, I would say that the house was really for himself and his family and the colony mm -hmm. um, rather than, uh, and that Crow House up in the world was stagecrafted for broader public consumption because the colony was somewhat known. Um, through all sorts of magazine articles and uh, because the theater world was so well known. Um, and poor was always discussed as at the center of it all. But the specifics of Crow House were not really brought into that discussion, I think. Right. But I, I'd have to know more. Well, I mean, this sort of almost goes back to, you know, what Wanda was saying about the, the real value and range of these houses, which is that, you know, some were conceived as sort of show places that a, a public was going to be, you know, welcomed into, um, uh, both in the, the lifetime of the creator and, and later on. Those that become more kind of retreats for a, a small group um, or even for themselves, um, as museums become really kind of uh, fascinating ways for us to step into a space that we might not have been able to have approached in the, the lifetime um, uh, of the creator. We do have a, uh, a question here um, from our remote audience. Um, uh, uh, this is for Michael. Uh, uh, I'm struck by how Parrish's later calendar landscapes published by B&B seem to feature slightly more quaint, cozy cottages or farmhouses rather than the grand palazzos of some of the earlier work or illustrations for fictional works. In your view, do the houses of Parrish and his artist colleagues of Cornish seem more like grand country estates or more modest settings? I think of them as distinct kinds of escapism, the grand palaces of imagination versus the nostalgia of the country cottage, um, or are these not actually opposed? So how do those two different architectural types kind of play out? Yeah, so I mean, I think that just as, as it's implicit in the question that the, the earlier ones are fantasy castles and the later ones are more based, I mean, like I would say that they're based on his actual house. 
And then also, and this is something, I mean, I, I appreciate the question. Is this something that I'm still trying to, to think through and work through? Is I think that there, there's also a, a shift in um, cultural moment so that the calendars are post World War II nostalgia for a you know purportedly traditional New England way of life. So yeah, I mean I think that it, and, and and then also just th that that's related to the personal transition that Parrish has. You know he he wanted to get out of commercial art pretty much as soon as he got into it. You you know he got it. He was just as a you know, as a college student, he was he was beginning to be very successful, and then he wanted to quit, and he finally was able to quit, and you know, no more girls on rocks, and <laughs> this was what he wanted to do: is just paint landscapes and live as he did at the Oaks. And so I think you're getting a picture later on of, for like for you, for the viewer, it's a fantasy. For him, that was, he had succeeded in really living his ideal life. Right. Great. Thanks. Well, I, I, I know that I don't want to impinge too much on folks' uh, lunch lunch hour time. We may have time for one quick question, if, if, if we've got one. Yeah. I tried to find more information about it and I could not find it in what I had. Um, I wonder if there's anything with Duchamp's archives. I am very curious, but I also was so excited that he visited Crow House. Um, it seems like an interesting juxtaposition. Um, the way I figured it was that um, he was in Philadelphia um, for the Philadelphia Museum of Art or um, some other connection there. And then it just made logical sense. Um, yeah, the artist groups. In the, yeah, in there. So, um, so um, I, I, but I don't have more information. I'm sorry, but I, it's a, it's a to do on my research list. <laughs> right. Well, I was just thinking, thinking it was a nice way to So when he was a year and they made this before he made Bryce right there fast, before he decided to get okay, he went to the uh, frame fair show and he wrote some copies about the area of this. So he was in love with the idea of the frame. And in fact, that was the thing that was really changing and realized where am I going to go for neighbors now? Like there's more near a decorative park, but you know, he knows this area is starting to make a farm. So so he had a deep love. Yes, all I can say, I was delighted too to see that Marcel Duchamp, how, how much he got around. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> great. And, and I don't know a lot about why he ended up at Crow House, but the um, Henry Burnham Poor and a lot of the other artists he hung out with on South Mountain Road were very involved with the New York Dada scene and the New York uh, avant-garde. So it, it's not too surprising to find him coming up for lunch on the terrace. Yeah. And that's a great transition. Um, we are, <laughs> we are, uh, uh, you all are excused now for lunch. Thank you, thanks to our speakers once again. Good afternoon. I hope everybody had a very uh, delightful lunch and took in those sun rays, a um, bit of spring out there. It's my pleasure to welcome you back. Okay, guys, get your seat here. Um, I'm Jane Malosh. I'm supposed to introduce myself as, and I'm very happy to do so, as a Grantwood Art Colony board member. And I was fortunate enough to be one of the people that Jim Hayes invited to 1142 to kick off our grassroots first symposium, but it was so beautifully orchestrated. I mean, it's the kind of grassroots that you want. So it's really um, an honor to be back participating and hosting and chairing this uh, third session um, on, for the symposium entitled Visionaries. And I thought I would begin with a brief introduction or a brief introduction about Grant Wood's connection to being a visionary, but more than that, even just a definition of what is a visionary, because 
I think over the course of the papers we've heard so far, a lot of these people fall into that category as an artist, but I want to get a little more specific about what that word means. And the other work that the other word that has come up quite often is Gesamtkunstwerk. And so how does that connect up with um, what we're going to talk about with the two, the two presenters from, from two different angles? So the, I have two definitions on the, on the visionary, or almost three, but what is a visionary? Especially a person, I thought that was funny, thinking about or planning the future with imagination or wisdom, a visionary leader. Relating to or able to see visions in a dream or trance as a supernatural apparition, a quote, a visionary experience. A person with original ideas about what the future will or could be like. In a more religious definition of a visionary, a person who has a religious or spiritual experience in which they see a holy person who is not living or they see a holy event and they cannot be scientifically explained. And um, I think that's key because I, I think the one sort of thread between is this contemplative and performative aspect of these places and environments that we're seeing a deeply spiritual connection to the material connection, that these things are not broken up. And the guy that kind of started that idea is not a visual artist, but was a composer, Richard Wagner, also German. And so he came up with the term Kunstwerk to describe a total work of art in which the artwork of the future, he believed, would, would, would be only art with a capital A, would just be one thing. It would be so seamlessly connected all music, theater, light, all these sensorial things would come together with the actual material things. And so that they sort of dissolve, if you know Wagner, you know, you just sort of dissolve into everything. Um, but from that term, a lot of different art movements were launched. Most people are familiar with Art Nouveau. I'm more familiar with Jugendstil, but also the connection to the arts and crafts movement. And so um, thinking a little bit more about that Gesamtkunstwerk, Another definition talks about it being roughly, um, I just say this, um, survive, okay, Kunst, Kunstwerk survives mostly pr prominently in architecture, where all aspects of design, interior, exterior, and furnishing were connected to, comp to complement one another. And in, this influence can be seen in the artistic practices of movements, like I said, arts and crafts, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Jugendstil, Vienna Succession, Bauhaus, De Stiel, or my favorite example is actually uh, uh, Sagrada Familia by Gaudi. I mean, I think that one shines bright. And maybe the other thing to connect this to is Gothic architecture in general. So even when the very ultra modern art school Bauhaus was founded, Gropius used a woodcut by final lininger of a cathedral. And um, when we look at Gaudi, he ended up making a cathedral, but that wasn't necessarily what we, what we would have imagined as a traditional cathedral breaking all the rules. So um, how does this connect to Grant Wood and how does this connect, connect to artist colonies and the talks we're about to have? Well, recently I've had the opportunity to do a little more research on something we heard yesterday called the Iowa idea that started in the 1920s. And this idea that um, was President Jessup and I gotta get, yeah, he was the president and Carl Seashore was the Dean to bring in um, practicing professional artists to teach. So not people, I, somebody recently said something about people who can't make art teach. That's not the case here. It was actually the opposite in the sense that artists are real professionals. Being an artist is a profession. And so whether you're a writer, a musician, or a visual artist, the University of Iowa was the first place in the country in the US to allow creative work to be submitted as a master's thesis. And Elizabeth Catlett uh, was the first woman and a black woman to be given the MFA here at the University of Iowa. The first uh, official professor to be hired in the art school, and that was the other thing. Then the um, main premise of this idea was worked out by combining the School of Art with the School of Art History with the notion that um, Artists are going to be better artists if they have access to the current research. So while we're studying the past, what's happening now, how do you describe it? And so the art historians would see artists making art now in terms of what they're studying. So there was no division between the past and the present. It was, if you're gonna go forward, you have to know what is innovation. And I think that's really key 
you can really, you can maybe have a one-off innovation, but how do you sustain a vision? And I think all the examples that we're seeing today are people who are very well, very well aware of the past or what we'll hear from Lisa, I think a bit more, had a certainty of another world, that everything that we see isn't everything that there is, that there's more in the world, the things that we do not see that we do feel that are deeply spiritual. So, so the IOID connected with that. And so I kind of wrote sort of five characteristics that I, I think line up in relation to Grant Wood that they'll talk about in terms of their artists, the, the speakers and their topics I'll introduce in a minute. The first one is that a lot of visionaries are often autodidacts, they're self-taught. Now they may have learned in one area, but they tend to keep creating and keep inventing and teaching themselves various things. In Grant Wood's case, that is very much the case. He did have some formal training, but really he was most inspired uh, and taught himself through the Craftsman Magazine by Stickley, uh, initially metalworking and then taught, you know, illustration and so forth. And um, the second thing is dreamers. When Grant Wood um, became an uh, a middle school teacher, one of his famous projects is called Imagination Isle. And he wanted the students to come along and dream with him of a place far, far away. I wanted to read the script, but I can't find it right now. But in the sense, he was creating a creative project with his class. They designed a freeze that went around their classroom, which they painted in conjunction with music and a poem that was read. I mean, Wanda, they can correct me later because I can't remember exactly, but it was this powerful thing of that is that performative aspect, but you have to dream it into reality and then make it into reality. So he was very much a dreamer. Um, the third one we've heard a lot about in relation to Five Turner Alley. The one thing that maybe hasn't come up yet that I think is very important is the fact that he designed it to be a stage set. So he it was the theater Cedar Rapids company. So his living space was a performative space. It was a backdrop. He was a character who was stepping onto the stage. So, um, and not only that, he didn't want to be there by himself. He envisioned Five Turner Alley as part of a larger art colony that was going to, so Five Turner Alley was because there were going to be more artist studios, people joining him. So he always had this idea for a colony or vision of, you know, a, a way of bringing artists together, but also connecting with the community. Um, so there's that performative um, aspect, that staging aspect, and the environment that he built at, um, at uh, Five Turner Alley, um, just like we were seeing with Maxwell Parish, is just filled with objects he collected um, that you find in his paintings, but more than that, vistas and doors and metalwork, all these, all these things that we've heard. And finally, um, the, entire, the, the, the entire environment. So um, I think this is what's interesting about our two present presentations we're about to hear, the difference between the urban invention and the rural, this, this agricultural urban, and so when Grant Wood moved from Cedar Rapids, where he's in a carriage house, downtown Cedar Rapids, to this historic mansion in Iowa City, he also had grounds. He finally had gardens. So he was able to completely craft and even expand his environment, a way to, to relax from what was sometimes not the most exciting, uh, not always supported by the then direct, the first director of School of Art and Art History, um, Lester Longman, and Joni Kinsey wrote a beautiful fascinating essay about Iowa being the battleground for avant-garde and American regionalism. So I highly recommend that to people. But what we're gonna hear from today, just wanted to connect that with Grant Wood. Our first speaker is Lisa Stone, who I've had the pleasure of knowing since about the first time we discovered the Grant Wood studio still existed. When um, I went to Cedar Rapids to be a curator and the director said, hey, do you know the studio is still standing? <laughs> And I'd worked on a Grant Wood show with a colleague 10 years before, maybe not quite 10 years before, but we didn't know it, it was so intact. And um, Lisa was the first person we talked to and she invited us to see the Roger Brown studio. Uh, we got to go to the Chicago one, but he has another one. So, um, so Lisa is an independent curator and preser uh, preservation consultant. She was a senior lecturer in the Department of Art History, Theory and Criticism and curator of the Roger Brown Study Collection, both, at, both of these at the, based at the School of the Art, in, School of, the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And she retired in 2020. She earned an MS in Historic Preservation at Scholl at the, the Art, of, Art, Art Institute of Chicago. She works with Don Howlett on the preservation and planning and impl implementation through Preservation Services Incorporated. 
She presented on RBSCS for the Art Historic Artist Home Studios from 2000 to 2020 and currently serves on the Haas Advisory Committee. She's also co author with, with Jim Zanni of Sacred Spaces and Other Places, a guide to the grottos and sculptured environments in the upper Midwest, and a study exploring the impact of the grotto, the grotto of the Redemption in West Bend, Indiana, I'm sorry, West Bend, Iowa, on the builders of the region. Her title is called Home Base and Life Specific Art Environments. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our second speaker so that they can seamlessly transition. Uh, our next speaker is um, Zach Leicher. Zach is the founding executive director of the Edgar Miller Legacy nonprofit, whose mission is to preserve the work of the late 20th century artist designer, Edgar Miller. By advancing research of Miller's accomplishments and providing opportunities to learn from the artist's bold sense of creativity, work ethic, and artistic philosophy, Bleicher oversees the organi organization's growing physical archive of Miller's work and is directly engaged with art preservation communities in Chicago to raise awareness and ensure the proper care of Miller's unique architectural project on the city's north side, known as Edgar, Edgar Miller's Handmade Homes, which is what he's going to talk about today. Um, I, think, I think that that's the other thing, all the fundraising that goes beyond that. So, so I hope we can talk about that in our, in, our, in our exchange. So at this time, I'd really like to invite Lisa up to, to make the first presentation. This up. Is that about the right level? So good afternoon and thank you, Jane. Um, I'll just uh, say about her introduction, what she said, <laughs> and, we, and we didn't talk about this in advance. Um, I'm honored to, to participate in this conference, which brings together things I'm interested in, including Grant Wood, the genres of historic artists, homes and studios, and artist built environments. I wanna thank Maura Pilcher, Wanda Korn, and Valerie Ballant, and everybody else behind the scenes for crafting this conference, and the Grantwood Art Colony and the University of Iowa for hosting it. I'm going to briefly introduce the genre of artist-built environments, a current term for artists whose homes, studios, and in many cases, gardens or surrounding landscapes are the works of art, not just where they were made, such as Malda Rita and Walter Larson's architecturally modified home in Kiwani, Illinois, enlivened with their singular compositions and arresting color combination. And in some cases, such as the Larson's, the artists become intimately enmeshed in their visual and architectural programs, indistinguishable from them. When I was a kid visiting grandparents in Iowa, I was taken to the Grotto of the Redemption in West Bend. I could say that this is my family as it shows a mom, a dad, and two girls and a boy, but it's actually a stock souvenir color slide. But given how important Midwestern devotional grotto research eventually became for me, it's ironic that I was told that I slept through the entire experience. <laughs> I eventually woke up Years later, my colleague Jim Zanzi and I began doing serious research into the grotto phenomenon in, that eventually became um, a, a kind of a area of study. And we wrote a guidebook, which was really just the beginning of ongoing studies that Jane mentioned. And it's um, really poorly produced on a bus to choose string, but it works as a guidebook. <laughs> Um, so this is the builder, Father Paul Doberstein of the Grotto of the Redemption, who used the church rectory as his studio. Here he is making some of the many thousands of massive rosettes for his grotto in his living room, an early example of home, or in this case, rectory as studio. We continue to discover other artists who were inspired by the grand Catholic devotional grottos in Iowa and Wisconsin. And this is just a, a smattering of several in throughout Iowa, including William Leitner's Mother of Sorrows grotto structures in Cedar Rapids, which I mentioned to you because you may want to visit the campus of uh, Mount Mercy University on Sunday when we'll be there. So here are some teaser views. 
Artist Jane Gilmore, who chaired the art department at Mount Mercy University for many years, and is here in the audience, wave Jane somewhere, there you are, <laughs> worked tirelessly planning and implementing major restoration projects, literally saving the structures. Thank you, Jane. I had the great fortune to work as curator of the Roger Brown Study Collection, an artist's home museum special collection and archive of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And the Roger Brown Study Collection became a member of Haas in 2000, right at the get-go. So I have been honored to represent the site, or I was honored to represent the site for and with Haas for over 20 years. And I was supposed to talk about <laughs> the study collection. Sorry, Wanda, <laughs> I'm going to wander away. Um, so I don't have a time to give you a tour of the collection, but you can take a virtual tour on the collection website or visit in person if you're in Chicago. While at the RBSC in 2002, I worked with Jane Malash and Cedar Rapids Museum of Art staff on their acquisition of the Roger Brown painting, Great American Farmer from the school's Roger Brown estate collection. And there's no need to state how Grant Wood inspired Roger Brown's composition is to this audience, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> Some of the pleasures the Haas network kindles constantly are the many connecting threads between and among artists separated by significant temporal and cultural distances. Discovering the parallels, associations, and echoes is endlessly interesting for me. So to pre present a quick overview of the range of artist homes in the genre of artist built environments, I'll begin with the Palais Ideal of the facteur or postman, Ferdinand Cheval, who built an astonishingly complex and original sculptural architectural complex between 1879 and 1924 adjacent to the home he also built in O'Rive, France, a few hours south of Lyon. And that's the facteur in the center. The Oedipus presents a curious physical paradox, seemingly monumental and humanly scaled simultaneously. One can experience the entire structure intimately, walking around the exterior, through the interior, and up sinuous stair staircases to terraces. Cheval wanted to be buried on his home property at the Palais Ideal, but it was not allowed in Eau Rive. So he spent the last eight years of his life from 1916 to 1924, building his final home or final resting place, his tomb of eternal silence and rest in the local cemetery. Artist and architect Carl Juncker studied and then returned from a grand tour through Italy to his home city of Lemgo, Germany. And in 1889, made a formal application to build a house. And he's shown here many years later with the model. Unlike many builders who work extemporaneously, Juncker meticulously planned his home down to the finest details. The house combines Palladian massing, Italianate features, and windows that feel kind of Venetian. The exterior is exquisitely detailed and polychromed with hand carved bony shapes. And entering the house, you become encompassed within an overwhelmingly carved space. It's almost like being in a Grimm's fairy tale where the house feels like it's growing around you. Juncker filled the home with a fantastic amount of handmade furniture and the caretakers, the custodians can't fit it all in the house, including a child's room, all for a family he never had and didn't plan on having. So it's a home that's symbolically, emblematically, and maybe psychically about the layered ideas of home and is one of the most intensively handmade places that has echoes with Edgar Miller's work that we'll hear about next. The site is expertly preserved and interpreted. Visitors move from a contemporary orientation space and museum through a breezy bridge on the left to the back door over expanded metal that takes the dirt off your shoes. And instead of velvet ropes, they have platforms so people can be in rooms without impacting them. 
Back in the US, the complex built by Italian immigrant Sabato or Sam Rodia, known as the Watts Towers, is as improbable as it is stunningly beautiful. Rodia was born in 1879 and very, very, very long story short, he began building his opus in 1921 and continued for 34 years when he deeded the property to a neighbor and walked away. I'm gonna show a clip from the film, The Towers from 1958. And this was a graduate school project. And you can find the full 12 minute video on the LACMA website. And apologies for the pixelated quality. It's the best I could get. Sam Rodier, how celebrated. Italian born. Can you put the volume up a little? Builder of the final tower. For 30 years, a man lives alone in a house with a bed, a chair, a table, with the music and the faded symbols of the time when he was young. So I'll mention here that um, at some point, someone showed Sam Rodia a postcard of um, Gaudi's Sagrada Familia. And, and, and Sam looked at it and said, one man, one man built that. <laughs> so at any rate, the image, the clip ended with this image of Rodia's embellished fireplace and framed photos. And here you see the image on the lower left is a postcard of the Dickeyville Grotto in southwestern Wisconsin, which is closely related to the Grotto of the Redemption. Rodia claimed to have worked on the Dickeyville Grotto, which is hard to substantiate and roundly debated, but I'm going to take his word for it. And that's Father Werneris, the builder of the Dickeyville Grotto. And it's just another one of the tantalizing threads between and among artists separated by great temporal and cultural distances. Years later, vandals burned down his house and only the fireplace remains. And here's a restored view. The towers were listed in the National Register of Historic Places in April 1977 and became a National Historic Landmark in 1990. Before showing a few more elaborate sites, I'm gonna show a few more modest but no less marvelous home projects. Isaiah Henry Robertson was born in 1947 and grew up in St. Thomas, Jamaica. When he was eight, he asked his mother what Jesus did and she told him he was a carpenter. So he decided that's what he would be. Known as prophet Isaiah Robertson, he began ornamenting his second coming house in Niagara Falls, New York in 2005. He worked on it and animated it with commanding oratory performances until his death in 2020. And here you can see that it's in an ordinary single story front gabled vernacular house in an ordinary neighborhood that's compositionally sophisticated and flat out original while retaining its basic houseness, reflecting Robert Venturi's concept of both slash and, who wrote, quote, I am for richness of meaning rather than clarity of meaning. I prefer the both and to either or. And that was just a partial quote of his much debated conviction. I like to let the artists have a little bit of their own voice included. So I'm going to show a clip from this video by Fred Scruton to give you a sense for how the house isn't merely decorated, but each element is symbolic and it's a stage for the prophet's rich and heartfelt exhortations. 
Now you see all these stars here. Praise the Lord. God take Abraham out of the tent. And he says to him, look in the sky. Abraham looked in the sky. He said, you see those stars? Abraham said, yes. He said, can you number them? Abraham says, no. He said, I'm going to multiply your seed as the stars in the heaven. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. So this is what these stars represent. Praise the Lord. And all of us is a star. Praise God. You see these candle lights here? Praise God. Jesus said, you cannot light a candle and put it under the bush. Praise God. So here is a reminder with symbols. Just before the Bible time, God used symbols. Thank you, Fred, and thank you, Prophet Isaiah Robertson. This is a little bit of a rough cut here. Um, no one expressed their love for beer more ardently or recycled their empties more artistically than John Milkovich. Beginning in 1968, the retired upholsterer began altering his home and garden at 222 Malone Street in Houston, one beer can at a time. After 18 years of work and God knows how many beer cans, he transformed a typical bungalow into an elegant and original show place that can still be clearly read as a typical bungalow in beer can clothing, both and. The beer can house, which looks much different today than when I took the previous slides in 1982, is preserved and open to the public by the Orange Show Foundation for Visionary Art in Houston. And you can visit that today or tomorrow. I'm always excited and humbled to try to introduce any of these artists in fewer than three hours, especially Mary Knoll, who created work in many mediums, including sculpture, painting, printmaking, jewelry, ceramics, drawing, illustration, writing, journaling, and exceptional placemaking. Born in 1914, Knoll was raised in Milwaukee. She went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago from 1933 to 1937, which jump-started her lifelong creative practice. She returned to her family cottage on the shore of Lake Michigan, and when she finally had the house to herself, rather than engaging in the professional mainstream art world, Noel poured her creative energy into a private home-directed life, shaping and animating her home inside and out. She enlivened the surfaces of the house with a technique of sponge painting using pieces of pile carpet to achieve her patterns. And her work was integral to and incorporated within her home environment. Um, apparently, there are only five objects in the entire house that weren't made or altered by Mary. In terms of the life-specific home-based aspect of Noel's artistic path, it's worth mentioning that choosing not just to work at home, but to have home be the entire context of one's work is the th single thing that may makes most artist-built environments seem so remote from the mainframe art world. But actually, this mode of working is in cadence with, and in many ways anticipated or anticipates contemporary mainframe concerns. Home studio environments like Mary Knowles challenge notions of where art was or is supposed to take place, where it should be experienced after it was or is made, not even mentioning the idea held by some that art gains its true value only when it's a commodity. Quite surprising to some, Knoll's participation in the artistic community came after her death with her bequest of over $11 million to the Greater Milwaukee Foundation, establishing the Mary L. Knoll Fund for Individual Artists. The site is preserved by the John Michael Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, notably by artist Alex Gardelman, who has spent four years living there, and he still lives there, working on every square inch inside and out. And the site was listed in the National Register in 2005. 
S.P. Dinsmore was born in Ohio in 1843. I don't have time to outline his biography, but after a number of occupations in the Midwest, he moved his family to Lucas, Kansas, where he built his cabin home out of post rock, limestone, and concrete. And this house is really amazing. He built it as a show place, and the family lived in the garden basement. People could tour the interior and see doors, windows, and trim made of California redwood. And for some reason, a display of virtuosity, I guess, no two doors or windows are the same dimension. Then at age 64, he spontaneously combusted into a placemaker extraordinaire, creating an expanded spatial narrative expressing his social, political, spiritual, and deeply personal beliefs around the cabin home. Moving through his sculptural spectacle, one enters through an Adam and Eve concrete arbor, and then arriving at his final tableau, The Crucifixion of Labor, which was a kind of late 1920s Occupy Lucas social political statement, which is considered to be unfinished. Would love to see where he would have gone with this. And many scenes in between. Dinsmore's Garden of Eden is an inversive, immersive, open work panorama surrounding his remarkable home in the post rock limestone region of the dusty Great Plains. Like Ferdinand Chabal, Dinsmore wanted to rest eternally at his home in the Garden of Eden. He built his own stepped pyramidal mausoleum and took this double exposure, gazing at himself in his homemade coffin, where you can still see him today. The site has a long, rich preservation history, and it was listed in the National Register in 1977, 15 days after the Watts Towers. The Garden of Eden, Inc. are the devoted site stewards. Eddie Owens Martin was born on July 4th, 1908 in Glen Alta, Georgia, near Buena Vista, and that's the way they pronounce it, where he eventually built his colorful kingdom. At age 14, he ran away, eventually landing in New York City, where he led a spectacularly wild and colorful life. 35 years later, he tired of New York and the various hustling scenes he engaged in and returned to Buena Vista, having inherited his mother's farmhouse. He set up shop as a fortune teller, he was very successful at that, and began transforming his mother's 1895 vernacular Georgia farmhouse into a rambling compound that retains its identity as a vernacular house while becoming something else entirely, both and. The site is divided into garden spaces with walls filled with ceremonial bas-relief imagery and other structures such as his elevated pagoda. And I always thought this must have been this you know, kind of spiritual meditation space and it was his beadworking studio. Eddie Owens Martin became Saint Ohm, called the site Pasaquan and he became a Pasaquoyan. He had an elaborate belief about an invisible network of nodes in the body that give one radiant power called power suits and the cone atop of, of his head is upswept here. And here's a little clip of Eddie speaking. Hello there, all you people. This is Marin County in Buena Vista, the county, and I made it mod to live here. I created and draw and sculpture and build walls and everything. And with it on my heart, I always had a hope that my dream would dream. And it's run so true. Thank you, Eddie. Sorry to cut you off so soon. Pasaquan was listed in the National Register in 2008. And in 2014, the site underwent a two year preservation project by Kohler Foundation and Columbus State University. Um, the university is the site custodian, and they use Pasaquan for all manner of academic programming, and they welcome the public for tours and other experiences. And I won't go into other experiences. I wish I had time to relate the extraordinary life work of Noah Purifoy as a designer, artist, co-founder of the Watts Towers Art Center, responder to the Watts Rebellion, curator and radical arts administrator, before his last chapter or encore. 
In the late 1980s, Purifoy moved from Los Angeles to the Mojave Desert and spent the last 25 years of his life creating 10 acres full of large scale sculpture around his trailer home in the high desert of Joshua Tree, California. And the red lines are the approximate footprint of the site. Now I'm just going to spool through images of the landscape animated, animated by Purifoy, which is a 10 acre installation of sculptures and structures which grew organically with no particular plan, but have many, many narratives by the artist and play, placemaker who expressed critical aspects of his lived experiences with the junk and stuff of ordinary life, including an expanded Quonset hut, which is a museum um, holding many of his earlier works a representation of the gallows from the film High Noon. And this is the remains of the trailer home where Purifoy lived and died in a fire in 2004. The artist Ed Ruscha bought the adjacent property so Purifoy would have a house with more creature comforts, which he lived in for the last few years of his life. The Noah Purifoy site is owned, preserved and maintained as a museum by the Noah Purifoy Foundation in Los Angeles. So I'm thrilled to reshare the news, which Valerie shared yesterday, that the Noah Purifoy site and St. Ohm's Passaquan both became members of Haas this year, significantly expanding the diversity of Haas's representation of the nation's art historical legacies. And I'm going to close by briefly mentioning a kind of flip scene scenario in which four visual artists, Rashid Johnson, Adam Pendleton, Julie Mayritu, and Ellen Gallagher acquired and are preserving renowned musician and civil rights activist Nina Simone's childhood home in Tryon, North Carolina, supported in part by the National Trust's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. They have amazing plans for the place and are an example, and I hope not a rare example in the future, of visual artists, not just as placemakers, but as place savers. Thank you. And on to Zach. Hi everybody. Thanks Lisa, that was as always amazing. Um, let's see here. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here. I think this is my first time speaking in front of a live audience in several years. Um, so this is really exciting. Thank you to Haas and to the Grantwood Art Colony, University of Iowa and everyone that um, put this together and all of you and us for being here. Um, I know it's it's actually, this is really exciting. Um, and I'm excited to introduce you to the work of an artist that I love, and I hope you'll come to love if you don't know much about him, um, who was another visionary artist um, and placemaker. Where do you do the, um, do you do this? yeah. So James Edgar Miller was a prolific American artist designer whose work consisted of a wide variety of mediums, including painting, sculpture, stained glass, tile, and other forms of craft work. He is also most well known as a visionary placemaker who was one of the driving forces behind the creation of a handful of artistically rehabbed artist colonies on Chicago's near North side during the city's interwar era. His practice consisted of both fine and commercial art projects architectural and built environments, and philosophical writing. Closely associated with 1920s to 30s interwar era Chicago art and cultural movements, Miller was highly regarded as a leading modernist in many creative fields. He became well known as an architectural art designer and artisan, and was highly influential upon vernacular 
artistic rehab architecture on the near north side of Chicago throughout the mid-century era and beyond. His artistic built environment projects, the Carl Street Studios and the Kogan Miller Studios, which were primarily constructed from 1927 to 1936, were Victorian homes transformed into studio apartment buildings for artists and other creatives. Miller achieved the completion of these buildings at the peak of his ability in his young adulthood. Not only did they influence Miller's own practice and the trajectory of his professional career, these built environments also influenced the lives of many other artists, creatives, and socially conscious activists for decades to come and continue to do so to this day. Edgar Miller's work immediately resonates with a wide variety of audiences, but perhaps the most common first impression is, how have I not heard of this artist before? Of course, there are many undiscovered artists who are only now becoming, quote, rediscovered, but perhaps what makes Miller's obscurity so surprising is that Miller was at one time a prominent artist who was widely recognized by his peers and critics. And he worked in Chicago during the early 20th century by then a city that was not exactly a remote outpost and that was a place where many artists from before Miller's time and since have risen to much wider acclaim. One of the simplest explanations for Miller's general obscurity has to do with the relatively low accessibility of his work as most of his work was built into architecture and either remains closed off to the public or has been destroyed in the city's rapacious need to constantly demolish its past in ill-conceived market-driven real estate development decisions. Miller was born and raised in Idaho Falls and came from a pioneer family and community tradition of self-reliance and artistic entrepreneurship and was encouraged from a very young age to develop his skills as an artist. His parents encouraged, encouraged all five of their children to read and be creative, but Edgar stood out and seemed to have a preternatural ability to learn and excel in any artistic medium with simple practice and with little or no instruction. Miller also was encouraged to visit and learn from an older multidisciplinary artist in the Idaho Falls area named Joe He, who ran his own shop overlooking a bend in the Snake River and where he made paintings and sold furs, metalwork, embroidered saddles, taxidermy, and many other artistic objects and oddities. This formative experience for Miller, when he was less than 10 years old, would influence him and his approach to self-education and to have a do-it-yourself attitude for the rest of his life. Miller began working in Chicago in his late teens when he came all the way from Idaho Falls to attend the School of the Art Institute in 1917. Already technically masterful of the basic arts of drawing and sculpting, printmaking, and wood carving, Miller did not find art school to be challenging or intellectually rewarding. Miller left SAIC and pursued his own projects, first at the Hull House Studios, founded by Jane Addams, and then in the employ of artist designers Alfonso and Margaret Ianelli, with whom he worked and apprenticed through the mid 1920s. The Ianellis were also masters of many mediums, with Margaret being an expert in avant garde modernist graphic design, and Alfonso, a multidisciplinary artist who could paint and draw, sculpt, fabricate stained glass, and even forayed into industrial design. Miller's interest in becoming a commercial artist and much of his modernist graphic design art aesthetic can be traced to this time working with the Ianellis. While Miller's time spent at SAIC was not particularly fulfilling, the connections he made there would prove invaluable. Miller met some of his greatest influences like the muralist John W. Norton and the painter George Bellows amongst likely dozens of other formative teachers and lecturers who graced the halls of what was perhaps the most prominent center of official American art education at that time. Miller would speak often throughout his life about a chance encounter with Bellows, a conversation that likely involved a precocious teenage Miller pushing his way in front of the esteemed artist, and that this single encounter taught him a fundamental lesson 
and was a turning point for him conceptually about what it means not just to create art, but to form it by using the unseen perspectives and lines emanating from a canvas's edges. Miller also took this learning with him as he expanded into three-dimensional sculptural art, transparent art like stained glass and metalwork, as well as into the artistry of architectural design, which he began to dabble in beginning in the early 1920s. It was also at SAIC where Edgar Miller met Saul Kogan, who would end up being his creative partner several years later in the Near North Side Art Colonies project. Around the time of arriving to Chicago, Miller also almost immediately became involved in the Bohemian artistic community known as Tower Town, which was then the epicenter of all kinds of radical thought and expression on Chicago's near north side by the Chicago Water Tower. Quickly after the Great Chicago Fire in 1871, this area had been rebuilt as a wealthy enclave north of the Central Business District. But by 1900, the area was already evolving into a lower rent district as the wealthy elite moved further outward, allowing landlords to buy up their mansions and townhomes and divide them into cheap boarding houses and apartments. By the early 1900s, the neighborhood had already become an epicenter of a diverse group of writers, artists, and radical activists. Washington Square Park, directly in front of the Newberry Library, became known as Bug House Square, so-called because of the dozens of soapbox orders and their audiences who populated its grasses on any given day for decades. At one point, thousands of people would flow through this park per week to hear from all manner of radical activists and organizers preaching different varieties of isms that they believed would advance society away from the societal horrors of the Industrial Revolution. By the time Edgar Miller arrived, much was already underway and the social movements he got caught up in, political and artistic, had been brewing worldwide for some time. Miller's main focus was artistic expression, but he found kindred spirits in many other types of artists and activists in Tower Town, likely because of the anarchistic and self-determining ethos celebrated by the community. Not everyone agreed on which way the world should be going, but they all agreed that the past had its major flaws and to get the best out of the future, a free flow of ideas and creativity for creativity's sake was paramount. Miller was highly involved in the area's art centers, such as the Dill Pickle Club, where rousing programs were put on, experimental plays were performed and avant-garde art was displayed. The pickle was also welcoming to people of all racial backgrounds and sexualities. And from about 1917 to 1927, it was perhaps the most avant-garde venue in the United States at the time, certainly for a large and vibrant consortium of working class artists and thinkers. After briefly opening and managing the Dill Pickles gallery and print shop around 1925, Miller founded his own studio and gallery in 1926, just around the corner and called it appropriately, the house at the end of the street. There he fabricated and showed his own work as well as work by contemporary modernists such as Albert Bloch, Blanche Lazelle, Lionel Feininger and Eric Mendelssohn. While Miller was a polymath artist who worked in a variety of mediums by this time and was philosophically and practically rooted in arts and crafts traditions worldwide, he was also influenced by the great European and Mexican modernists who were still considered avant-garde by many of the more conservative Midwestern audiences at that time. He also kept himself employed by taking contracting jobs like plastering, painting, and tiling, experience that would come in handy only a few years later once the artist colony project started in full. As noted previously, revolutionary ideas were all about and in the art, social, and cultural spheres that Miller was working, there was continuous calls and strivings to push away from the previous worldview as it related to creativity and social organization. One of Miller's mentors, Jane Adams, had founded the Hull House in the late 19th century, not only to provide social and educational services to immigrants from all over the country and the world, but she also brought to Chicago a new approach of the arts and crafts movement where an everyday quote unquote low arts 
were intentionally cultivated and taught in order to allow artistic expression to become a less elitist function of society. And these philosophies aligned with Miller's views. Miller was concerned with moving art forward into the modern future, but he also felt strongly about the deconstruction of the idea that art could only have true meaning if it were considered refined, academic, or intellectual. For Miller was in search of a national American art which would blend all the world's cultures into a unified and distinctly modern expression. And he strongly believed that to instill a national art, the quote, high and low arts, both needed to be practiced by its national artists. In 1927, Miller teamed up with his art school colleague, Saul Kogan, to create an art colony at 155 West Carl Street, now Burton Place, called the Carl Street Studios, endeavoring on what would become a lifelong project for Miller. Later in his life, Edgar wrote in his memoirs, in 1927, an opportunity presented itself, the opportunity to create an environment that inc could include all the lesser arts. Through enjoyment and curiosity, I had gathered most of the ingredients of my idea of an environment. I had done work at the terracotta factory, overglaze I had done in the school years, stained glass and textiles I had investigated. I had a Logan medal for both stained glass and batik by 1923. A long apprenticeship had given me experience in sculpture, casting, stone, stone cutting and wood carving, as well as mural painting. All I needed was a project. Kogan had just returned from an extended trip to Paris where he had visited similar artist enclaves and became inspired enough to try out a similar mode of real estate rehab at home. With Miller's craftsmanship and building expertise, they transformed aging dilapidated Victorian homes into live work studios for artists, other types of creatives and their supporters and admirers. Built to provide artists with a more affordable, welcoming and secluded community than the rapidly commercializing tower town just to the Southeast, the Carl Street Studios blossomed nearly overnight and within a year, another Kogan and Miller, uh, Kogan and Miller began building another art colony at 1734 North Wells Street, now known as the Kogan Miller Studios. Miller took on the role of art director and chief artist craftsman on the project, while Kogan established himself as the financier and general contractor. Within the walls of each unit and the courtyards, Miller installed hundreds of unique and complementary art pieces using materials as varied as paint, stone, wood, metal, tile, glass, and terracotta. Miller is also credited with being the architectural designer for many of the interior and exterior spaces, though he did not possess any official credentials. Another prominent modernist architect named Andrew Rabori signed his name to the paperwork as the consulting architect, though he claimed later in life that he was rarely consulted. <laughs> However, Rabori must have had an influence on Miller because they became lifelong friends afterwards and worked on several projects together into the 1930s and 40s. Miller was very much in his prime and had been doing interior remodeling, murals, stained glass, and woodworking for many years. He had already worked with prominent architects and designers like Howard Van Doren Shaw, who was also the father of artist Sylvia Shaw, as well as the Ianellis and Barry Byrne, both one-time associates of Frank Lloyd Wright, to name a few, to install major artwork into public buildings, churches, and homes. However, all those projects had been very specific installations, like a sculpture here, a bas relief there, or a set of stained glass windows. Here, Miller was given the opportunity to have free reign over all creative decisions and to have abundant materials and an entire structure to work with, dismantle and recreate out of his own imagination. Miller could not have been more excited to get to work right away. Though, Miller did have the impression that he was also going to receive some of the income from the buildings too, once they were ready to be rented out. He also seems to have lived rent free in many of the empty units before they were finished. Miller's main mailing address for many years was 155 West Carl Street. At some point, possibly in the late 1920s, 
Miller moved into a room at 1728 North Wells Street, just a couple doors down from 1734 North Wells, the address of the Kogan Miller Studios. But to be clear, Miller often worked for no pay on these projects, and in his spare time, while taking paying jobs like designing covers and gift packaging for major department stores like Marshall Fields or painting portraits of prominent Chicagoans. Eventually, Kogan reneged on whatever deal he had made with Miller, which soured Miller on their friendship and partnership for the rest of his life. Though later in life, long after Kogan passed away, Miller admitted the whole enterprise would not have occurred were it not for Saul. Nonetheless, for many years, a magical creative environment existed for Edgar Miller, and the imprint left on him and so many other artists cannot be understated. Though Miller's practice during these important years, designing and executing the handmade homes, the artist honed many of the artistic skills he would later employ in his future career, while fleshing out large-scale ideas in various materials that he had only dabbled in before. The studios were Miller's raw expression of the ideal home for an artistic community. And as artists flocked to these buildings, over the decades, the neighborhood around them transformed into one of the most artistic neighborhoods in Chicago by mid-century. Miller's ethos was one of fearless creativity and he used materials in such resourceful and interesting ways that merely passing by them going to a gathering at one of them or living in one of them strongly influenced other local artists and architectural rehabbers. After Edgar Miller had essentially moved on by the 1950s and was living on the far north side in a neighborhood called Edgewater, newer residents and visitors to the studios had no knowledge of Miller's contribution to the endeavor. And yet the work spoke for itself and still inspired imitators. Certainly, during the period in which he was working on these projects, Miller's identity was tied intrinsically to the studio spaces. He also lived in and around the project during that time and used the properties as workspaces for himself and his collaborators. For Miller, the Artist Colony project was both a work of art and a place to exhibit art and to be surrounded by art, incorporating it into one's daily life. Writing in 1936 for Architectural Record on the subject of his last handmade home building, the Fisher Studio Apartments with Andrew Rabori, Miller made his philosophy all too clear. Quote, home life, whether in an apartment house or residence is not a mass production process, but a social adventure, which demands the leavening influence of grace and beauty. In spite of his relative obscurity, there in fact were always Edgar Miller supporters carrying the flame with and for the artist. In the 1930s, Miller was asked to help with several WPA related projects in Chicago and the Midwest, both as an artist himself and also as a teacher, manager, and jurist. Often selection of artists involved working with other jurists. It's unclear from spotty records of Miller's when he met Grant Wood, but given the context of this talk, it's important to note that they were acquainted. Miller encountered a great number of professional artists throughout his life, and especially those who at any time studied, exhibited, lectured, or lived and worked in Chicago. Miller was always at some kind of epicenter of art culture in Chicago, whether it was at SAIC in the late teens, Tower Town in Carl Street Studios in the 20s, or the WPA projects of the 30s. It's most likely Woods and Miller's paths crossed during the 30s, and hopefully new research in the coming years may reveal more of a connection. By the late 1930s, Edgar Miller had more or less moved on from the artist colonies he founded with Saul Kogan a decade before, but he wasn't really that far away from it, either geographically or in terms of his art design practice. For the next 15 years, Miller set up a live work studio and salon atop a restaurant known as the Normandy House at 800 Tower Court, directly across from the historic water tower. So essentially back to the neighborhood where he used to live in the 1920s. 
At the Normandy House, Miller continued his personal mission of creating dazzling artistic environments. Miller painted murals, installed sculptural reliefs, carved wooden awnings and furniture, fabricated stained glass windows, and created a high relief sculptural fireplace. He also designed their menus, postcards, placemats, matchbooks, and even the server's clothing. The owners of the Normandy House were also artists who Edgar Miller had met in the early 1930s, perhaps even at the artist colonies he created. And this restaurant and Miller's home-based salon were in many ways extensions of the artistic social scenes, which were cultivating a Chicago artistic renaissance in the interwar context of Chicago's near North side. Over the years at the Normandy House, Miller mentored many young artists, younger artists, and entertained and had philosophical conversations about art and life with hundreds of other exceptional creators working then in and around the Midwest. Later in Miller's life, when he and his second wife, Dale Holcomb Miller, moved to Clearwater, Florida, they tried to establish another artist colony there out of a motel. Unfortunately, health problems dodged Dale and she passed away in 1977, only several years after they arrived. Even though this later artist colony experiment ended in failure, it still showed Miller was constantly thinking about creating, how to create places for artists to congregate and to feed his interest in all things new and stimulating. Remarkably, Miller came back to Chicago again and the artist colony project in the 1970s and 80s and executed many more art pieces during an extensive and intensive rehabilitation and preservation period. In 1969, an important behind the scenes civil rights activist and philanthropist named Lucy Montgomery bought the Kogan Miller Studios and began to rehabilitate the property. She eventually met Miller in the late 1970s after his return to Chicago and Montgomery commissioned new stained glass windows by Miller. In the 1980s, a young entrepreneur and businessman, Mark Mamelin, who full disclosure was also my late uncle, purchased the Carl Street Studios at 155 West Burton Place and worked with Miller to incorporate new stained glass windows, carved doors, and other artistic rehab work. It is no understatement that to say if Miller had not reconnected with Montgomery and then Mamelin and spent years more in and around the Chicago artist colonies that it's not likely we would even be talking about Edgar Miller today. That connection enabled the younger generation, led by Mamelin's efforts, to spearhead preservation efforts after Miller's death in 1993. Mamelin would go on to rehabilitate, rehabilitate Miller's masterwork, the Glasner Studio, at the back of the Kogan Miller Studios, and underwrote the publication of the seminal book, Edgar Miller and the Handmade Home, Chicago's Forgotten Renaissance Man, by Richard Cahan and Michael Williams, which was published in 2009. Mamelin, who died suddenly in 2013 at age 67, also was instrumental in the founding of the nonprofit Edgar Miller Legacy, which was formally incorporated in 2014, several months after his death. Edgar Miller's prolific career spanned almost the entire 20th century and consisted of thousands of individual art projects, big and small. Yet it's these handmade homes he created in the interwar era that have come to define his career more than any other project. These artist colonies were the apotheosis of so much of Miller's creative capacities and artistic philosophy, such that he was delighted to see later generations venerating his work there, perhaps at the expense of many other projects he completed in the years before then and afterwards. Miller understood that the artist colony project had affected him tremendously and that it had inspired so many others and would likely continue in that vein for many years to come. His approach to art and life and through his work, Miller, Edgar Miller continues to dare artists to throw themselves into a project out of the enjoyment of it rather than as a purely intellectual pursuit. Many artists continue to this day to find themselves visiting the artist studios and becoming reinvigorated by Miller's radical vision for a way of incorporating art into one's life. But going back again to the 1930s, Alice McKinstry writing in the August 1930 issue of the Woman Athletic commented, 
A place to live is a place to live. Walls, ceiling, stairway, kitchen, porch. Mankind has to have them if he is to continue his ordered habits. Sometimes it makes no difference whether they are beautiful or not. There is a kind of decent comeliness that suffices very well for many homes. The clean, cheap rug, the comfortable chairs, the uninspired covering of a wall with loopings or bedraggled flowers. If you feel that a home should only be this, and a springboard to leap lightly toward movie or baseball game, stay away from the Edgar Miller Studios on Carl Street and Wells Street for they will fill you with the haunting surety that you are missing something remarkable and lovely in this world. Thank you. So we're running a little bit behind time, not because of our speakers, but because we got started a little late and then I went on a long, little too long, but I wanna make sure we still have time for questions. Maura, do you, can we extend uh, start our break a little later? We will end the day a little earlier. We had a, a last minute cancellation. Julie McGee, and you might want to be talking to the online yeah. people. Um, Julie McGee canceled at the last minute. So we will be ending on time, if not early. So I think it is okay if we extend the Q&A a little bit. We will still have time for a break. And then we'll have the last two speakers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to kick it off then with one question, sort of the one common theme is this, this notion of rehab, because it's another one that Grant would love, but it manifests itself in so many ways. So um, I don't know who wants to start off with that, because you've both told, I mean, it's obvious from these things that what appears to be something suddenly becomes something else in the hands of these artists. And also resources are not always uh, as rich as one would hope. So, so Lisa, do you wanna? Uh, oh, there's supposed to be a mic. Yeah. Well, you're getting that together. Yeah, go ahead. Dive in and um, comment actually for not for Zach, but about Edgar Miller's. It may not not have been as impar uh, apparent if you don't know how much Edgar Miller and Saul Kogan and others took. 19th century buildings and just completely it wasn't even rehab it was reinvention reimagine and um turn them into you know kept the bones somewhere but they're not even hardly visible and that is really extraordinary to me i think it's a really good question um especially you were talking earlier about the difference between an urban artist colony or artistic environment and a rural one. One of the things that we know drives urban environments uh, tremendously are these real estate markets where uh, prices become so inflated that the artists that were say living in that tower town neighborhood because the rents were very cheap were suddenly getting pushed out of this beautiful community that they had, been, they had created um, and then had to go find other places where they could move that were more affordable of course, there were people living there who then end up getting priced out by the influx of sort of the more middle class folks that followed the artists. And so um, the rehab that was going on in the 1920s and 30s, of course, we're also you know, not commenting about the big deal that was going on then called the Great Depression, um, was something that was driving these a lot of these uh, the, the, just the materials and things that were being produced for Edgar Miller and his cohort of artists to make these spaces. And so without thinking about that bigger context, you don't really understand maybe why this was all happening or just how it happened, mm -hmm. was allowed to happen. Right. But, but again, speaks to the artist's resourcefulness yeah. in the sense that they're not going to stop creating just because they don't have the perfect materials. They're going to take what's at hand and, and, and live with it and use it. So we, we don't have as much time for questions. So uh, who would like to kick things off out in the audience? John. I have a question. So what stands out to you about how these artists funded these renovations and creative spaces within their homes? Because if, if they weren't nationally known in selling art, how do they go about doing that? What stands out to you about how they funded these creative exercises? <laughs> Um, 
I think, well, I showed so many places that it's hard to generalize, but I think in terms of um, so many of placemakers that were using their home um, as a starting place, they just worked with what they had and um, somehow figured it out within the rest of their lives. Um, many of the artists, maybe half of the artists worked other jobs. A lot of the projects that um, I showed were done in retirement years and or you know early retirement years and um we're not I'm trying to think through everyone i showed um sites that took a huge amount of of money um edgar miller projects are much different and in urban setting but with with buildings that um, could be acquired during the great depression as zach mentioned right and i think that it's also important to mention that you know, through all through the thread of all these different artists is someone like Edgar Miller or someone like many of these other artists that Lisa shared with us that they're putting in all this effort for the love of it. And so how do you quantify that financially? You really can't. Um, you know, in, in the case of Edgar Miller, Saul Kogan was very much the person managing the finances. Um, and in some ways, I didn't go into all the details, but not always properly. Um, but it was the 20s and 30s. And, you know, so he was sort of playing. Um, Miller was so uninvolved with making, I mean, he would make money in order to survive, but he wasn't thinking about himself as a financial uh, engine at all. And so that disconnect from, you know, which is perhaps fantasist, like a lot of artists are, you know, they don't want to live in the real world or what we call the real world with money and obligations. So they just keep creating and hope that money eventually comes. And in Miller's case, that happened. Um, but also he never really got compensated for the work either. I'll just mention one follow-up thing, the facteur cheval or the postman in um, Ulry, France, worked as a postman for most of the years leading up to building and many of the years of building. He had a 32 kilometer route um, that he would go during the day and then he'd set rocks aside and stone and and actually there's this you know he tripped over a stone and I think that's a French thing and then had the idea <laughs> it's not the only example but he was working and thinking and thinking and thinking and then finally so he's building it in his mind gathering materials while being employed and then finally even though um, he would dress up in his postal outfit after he you know completed the the um, palais and kind of show himself as a working person. Trip. I, yeah. She's got a mic. Oh. So Lisa, a lot of these uh, um, creators that you're talking about would have in an earlier generation been referred to as outsider artists. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of that term and why um, you know, it's not really, uh, I've noticed that you've, you certainly don't use that term in terms of thinking about these environments. Um, how have we sort of moved away from that term if we have? Uh, some of us have, and some of us never will. Um, I really, really reject the term as being paternalistic. And um, first of all, the artists in question would not call themselves outsiders. So end of, end of subject. Um, but also, I mean, the term serves the market really well. Um, it doesn't serve others, other situations too well. And certainly, I don't think it serves the artists well. Um, but it seems to um, be a fallback. And it's there have been so many generations of people using it that young students today, when I was teaching, I would be really um, vigorously say, I do not use this term. I'm not talking about outsider artists. I'm talking about artists from all different kinds of of relationships um, to the so-called mainframe. And I think the major um, difference, if we could generalize between artists, many of the ones that I was discussing, is that they weren't making work directed at the acad academic mainframe, whether or not you know, the larger world discovered their work. Um, I've kind of given up 
fighting <laughs> fighting the term but um anyway is that I, I think we have time for one more question in the middle here just to follow up i think i was so interested in the um the grotto artists because they weren't purely working in isolation but they were looking at each other and there was almost like a, a history of art that could be told I think, unless I'm misunderstanding your presentation, that sort of has like an alternate model from the sort of the binary of insider and outsider, when in fact there are these whole networks of quote unquote art outsider or visionary artists. And I'm wondering if that's something that you've detected in your in your research and that I, I haven't seen your book, so I apologize for that. But uh, I would like to hear more about sort of this alternate history of art of sort of against this idea of isolation. Thanks, great question. I can only um, really go into that in terms of Midwestern um, grotto builder history and with the grotto of the redemption in, in begun in about 1912, which it shocked me that I like never kind of put it together that um, the, um, use of concrete in the ca in the castle um what am i <laughs> why am i blanking out on on yeah on font hill castle and the museum and the moravian pottery exact same time and people are discovering uh, new technology the very recently availability of concrete to um not only um you know, builders of grain elevators and so forth, but to, you know, homes and grottos and so forth. But in a kind of real quick nutshell, the Grotto of the Redemption um, presented this, you know, sort of city block, um, very large presentation of heavily embellished concrete. In the Dickeyville Grotto, um, a little bit closer to Madison, Milwaukee, Chicago, and um, other more urban areas, um, was an example where the builder didn't need to have precious stones and minerals, but he would use broken glass and crockery. So like everyone can go bust up a China cabinet and do that. So, I mean, not everybody, but <laughs> you don't have to go and get train car loads of geodes and so forth. So that the Dickeyville Grotto had a major impact on a number of builders and a couple of generations of builders in primarily Wisconsin, definitely Iowa, a little bit of Illinois. And, um, and it just became a matter of, of influence. And so it has its own, um, it, it really developed into a tradition. And there are lots of other ways to explain things that have happened in that kind of um, of casual way in other areas of the country of seeing things. You know, I always tell students, if you find something really interesting, look, explore the area, because you're gonna find a lot of other things. And then, you know, with a little bit of open mind and discovery, you're gonna see how things um, evolve in an area in a more in a kind of rhizomatic way. Mm -hmm. So do you have anything to add? No, I, I just, I just want to add that I think that was a great way to end on that art is never created in isolation. Even if the artist is working in isolation, it's because they're attuned to their environment. And so it's always an interaction of the two. I, I think of that work in prayer, that sacred and vernacular again, that there's much more of an intersection. So we're going to break for 10 minutes, right, Maura? And so grab them for more questions because they, they were packed. And I want to thank our speakers for really, I mean, what two, two, two fascinating but connected <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to share. The, I'm Lauren Lessing. I'm the director of the University of Iowa Stanley Museum of Art. If you uh, noticed a, a beautiful new building right on the corner of Burlington and Madison Streets in Iowa City, that's our museum. And um, I'm just gonna put in a plug for our opening on August 26th. I hope that you can make it back to Iowa City next year um, to see our inaugural installation, which we're titling Homecoming. Um, welcome to this third session, which is titled Labors of Love. 
um, are very, it's a real honor to be able to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, um, Sarah Rovang. Sarah is an architectural historian based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. As a program officer at the Toma Foundation, she oversees grant making initiatives and research related to rural arts and education. Born and raised in New Mexico, she holds a PhD in the history of art and architecture from Brown University. Before joining the Toma Foundation, she taught architectural history at the University of Michigan, traveled around the world as the Society of Architectural Historians H. Allen Brooks Traveling Fellow, and was a research fellow at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Rovang. All right, hello everyone. Okay, I'm gonna assume you can hear me um, unless I am told otherwise. Um, it is a delight to be with all of you virtually this afternoon. And I really wanna start by thanking Lauren for that lovely introduction and the organizing committee for so very graciously making the arrangements for me to present virtually. I know this isn't exactly what George O'Keefe had in mind when she referred to the far away nearby, but I am thankful that in this pandemic moment, uh, we have become more flexible in the ways that we allow technology to collapse space and bring us together. So I wanna start here today. In 1964, American artist Georgia O'Keeffe knocked out the exterior wall of her sitting room in Abiquiu, New Mexico, and replaced it with an expansive picture window, framing a feathery tamarisk tree in the garden beyond. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this window because it was one of the areas that the team working on a conservation management plan for the Abiquiu House asked me to focus on when I was a research fellow at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in 2019. We might explain O'Keeffe's design decision here in a number of ways. Executed after nearly 15 years of occupancy in her sprawling adobe home and studio, it might be linked to her increasing passion for entertaining. The influence of friends like Alexander Girard or the late Frank Lloyd Wright, or the desire to bring the outdoors into her home as her age made gardening more difficult. But to me, the most compelling explanation links this window directly to O'Keeffe's evolving artistic practice. In the early 1960s, O'Keeffe began to paint larger canvases, often depicting the sky as viewed from an airplane window. These works frequently graced the long gallery-like walls of her sitting room. In 1962, O'Keefe told a reporter about her idea to paint one of these compositions as a panoramic mural wrapping the walls of this space. While O'Keefe never executed this mural, the window can nevertheless be seen as an extension or architectural adaptation of this concept. Viewed through this lens, the window signals a blurring of the artistic practice and home environment that challenges established understandings of the relationship between O'Keeffe's home and her work. To give a brief sense of geography and context, Piku is a village about 45 minutes north of Santa Fe. The main plaza of the village sits atop a mesa and O'Keeffe's house sits on the edge of a cliff on that mesa overlooking the Chama River Valley. Now, previous scholarship on the two New Mexico homes of Georgia O'Keeffe has emphasized how her houses were arranged to support the artist's rigorous creative practice. These narratives, including some promoted by O'Keeffe herself, frame domesticity as something to be minimized in order to support artistic practice, highlighting the architectural separation of the studio from the rest of the domestic spaces. O'Keeffe's investment in labor-saving devices and her employment of a large staff. 
But building on the work of Wanda Korn, I argue that O'Keeffe's domestic environment and creative practice were more intrinsically connected than existing research has recognized. But let's get back to the 1960s and O'Keeffe's living room. How did O'Keeffe get to this moment of being an established late career artist with two homes and studios in New Mexico, knocking out a wall and considering covering the walls of her adobe living room with a mural evoking, with a mural evoking her paintings of the sky above clouds? Well, to get there, we're going to need to talk about walls, like a lot about walls. So I've framed three different but connected artistic modalities in O'Keeffe's creative practice. The first comes from the words of the artist herself, thinking on a wall. That is the use of walls as testing spaces to see how her paintings occupy physical and architectural space. Next, we'll explore the idea of thinking with a wall, plumbing the patio door series to discover how architectural texture played an undervalued role in some of O'Keeffe's most iconic paintings. And finally, we'll come to the idea of thinking as a wall, the blurring of art and architecture in O'Keeffe's longstanding and largely unrealized vision of creating mural art. Throughout her career, O'Keeffe's painting practice took account not just of the two-dimensional image on the canvas, but the relationship between the painting and the frame, including its shape, depth, and material, the position of the framed painting on the wall, and the wall's relationship to the rest of a fully designed architectural space. From very early on, O'Keeffe was attentive to the way that her works occupied and interacted with the built environment. For O'Keeffe, walls were creative and contemplative devices. As the artist stated, quote, I like empty space. If you have an empty wall, you can think on it better. To achieve visual and architectural clarity, O'Keeffe routinely altered her habitations and creative spaces. Upon arrival in Canyon, Texas, the young O'Keeffe found a room to rent, bedecked in patterned wallpaper and rugs that matched. The artist quipped that the room made her feel, quote, like a pink pill with wheels in my head, end quote. She relocated to a white-walled room with a better view and asked the owners of the room if she could paint the trim black. In New York, O'Keeffe again reconfigured her environs to suit her creative practice. What the artists found calming, others often found a little harsh and unwelcoming. One contemporary writer quote, quoted by Wanda Korn in Living Modern disparaged the artist's minimalist apartment at the Shelton as quote, a cloister or the reception room of an orphanage. So austere it was with its cold gray walls and its white covers over dull upholstery. Her renovations continued at Lake George, where she removed a closet wall and painted a floor dark green, ostensibly without anyone's permission. In the penthouse apartment where O'Keeffe and Alfred Stieglitz lived after their time at the Shelton, O'Keeffe hung her art on the walls, which became a kind of proxy for that of the gallery or museum walls where her work would meet the public eye. You can get a sense of this attention to detail in her 1937 show at an American place, where every frame has been thought through individually and the placement of each work on the wall carefully planned. Later in her career, she was even attentive to the spaces where buyers or potential buyers intended to hang her work. In envisioning how her work would look in larger public spaces, O'Keeffe frequently used the walls of her own houses in New Mexico as test galleries. In her first New Mexico house at Ghost Ranch, O'Keeffe hung paintings in the dining room such that visitors would see them from the table and the painter could gauge their reactions. Maria Chabot, O'Keeffe's friend who later designed and supervised construction on the Abiquiu house, also recalled the artist hanging finished or nearly finished paintings in her room at the ranch to test what it was actually like for another person to live with the piece in question. In a draft of the memoir recounting her time living with O'Keeffe, Chabot wrote, quote, of the long white dining room wall, you said simply, we will leave it so. I can think my picture upon it. 
at wall. It served even as the cell of a monk does serve, end quote. The look of the paintings against an adobe backdrop became so critical that in 1946, O'Keeffe suggested that her major MoMA retrospective be set against the same color walls as her ranch house. However, on the whole, the ghost ranch house had relatively little open wall space. Accordingly, in an early iteration of the plan for Abiquiu, Maria Chabot even imagined the home becoming a regional museum after O'Keeffe's occupancy there. But while O'Keeffe was living there, five out of 16 rooms would be used as picture rooms. Chabot allocated a few to the work of O'Keeffe and a few to that of her friends, including Arthur Dove and John Marin. Though the picture rooms quickly vanished from the next floor plans, in reconstructing the adobe ruins that would become the Abitou house, Chabot included expansive stretches of uninterrupted wall space. Though Chabot may have intended these walls as testing spaces or potential gallery space, O'Keefe was highly discerning about what she allowed to interrupt the sanctity of the wall in the early years, often only hanging a single small Arthur Dove in her large sitting room. As Chabot noted, quote, the plain wall, the silence, the receptivity, the reason for this was that we sought an inner life, not an outer one, end quote. Well, having now explored the important relationship of paintings and walls, let's turn to the walls themselves. We've alluded to the particular tone and quality of the walls when we talked about O'Keeffe's desire to replicate the tone of her adobe walls at Ghost Ranch for the MoMA show. But now I think it's time to get very up close and personal with the walls themselves. One of the most well-known aspects of O'Keeffe's creative process was her propensity for working in series. This was also true of her homes, where she frequently copied the same architectural motif in multiple contexts, such as the corner wrapping windows that appear twice at Ghost Ranch and in her studio bedroom at Abiquiu. Among her paintings, one of the most iconic series is that of her patio door in Abiquiu, a subject she painted two dozen times over the course of her 35-year occupancy. The door became part of the essential mythos of the house, something that attracted her to it initially, as described in this quote that contains the very famous line, the, that, door with a, that wall with a door in it was something I had to have. Indeed, there seems to be something about this topic that just kept eating at her. This painting is titled My Last Door and was painted in 1952. But despite the rather definitive title, it was not O'Keeffe's last door. In 1955, O'Keeffe wrote to her sister Anita, I hope that now I am through with that patio door idea. But as you probably guessed from the fact that I'm showing you a painting from 1956, she was not done with the patio door idea. Her last pink oil painting of the door was created in 1960. And notice I said oil painting and we can get back to why in the Q&A. And that was white patio with red door. It's interesting to note that O'Keeffe kept both red door and my last door and hung them both in her houses frequently and moved them around. There's also a picture of um, my last door in her bedroom at Ghost Ranch. So why did she stop painting the door? Had she simply worked out everything that she needed to? Well, I mean, that's a possibility. Um, but I have another theory, which has less to do with O'Keefe feeling finished with the door and more about the changing physical environment of her home. In 1959, O'Keefe decided to stucco the exterior of her adobe house at Abiquiu. Previously, O'Keefe had employed local workers to apply traditional adobe mud plaster to her house. Depending on the weather, she would have to get her house replastered about once a year. But 1958 was an incredibly wet year in New Mexico, and O'Keefe ended up having the house plastered several times. The plastering process was quite disruptive to her art and meant having a crew of workers up at the house for several days. O'Keefe had deep misgivings, though, about switching to stucco. In September, she wrote to Anita, 
I am sorry you could not have come out while my house was adobe. I am having stucco put on it. The mud is too hard to take care of, but it was very pretty. I plastered three times in four years. That is too, too many, so I'm moving to stucco. It will probably be horrid. If you've seen traditional adobe mud plaster, you know that it looks very different from cement stucco. This is due both to the material and how it is applied. Adobe mud has a lot of character in terms of color and the way that light hits it. Depending on where the mud was sourced from, it can vary dramatically in color. Archival sources indicate that the original adobe used for the exterior of the house was actually more of a rosy color, leading one visitor to dub the house the pink hacienda. And if you are so lucky to get a chance to look inside O'Keefe's garage, you can get a little bit of a, a flavor of what that um, rosy colored adobe actually looked like. In 1950, O'Keefe wrote to a friend praising Adobe's visual and haptic qualities, saying the walls are the soft, warm adobe that one always wants to touch, or one sometimes feels it is too fine to touch. One should just leave it there, alone, remote, untouched, end quote. In New Mexico, adobe mudding is traditionally women's work, and it is done literally by hand, which is registered as a fan shape where the artisan took the mud and smeared it across the adobe bricks. A friend visiting O'Keefe at Abiquiu described watching the renowned local plasterer named Della at work. Quote, her small bony hands were responsible for much of the elegant patina on O'Keefe's walls, both inside and out, end quote. This method of a, applying adobe plaster also has a practical purpose. The fan shape of hand application also helps the building shed water. Aesthetically, this pattern creates a dramatic, almost velvety backdrop, as you can see here in this classic portrait by Yusef Karsh from 1956. It seems hardly coincidental to me that O'Keefe only created a single oil painting of her door after the house was stuccoed. The flat brown colored stucco is a pale imitation of mud plaster. And we know that O'Keefe was never very fond of imitation. With Adobe mud plaster, form, function, and facture merge organically. Along these lines, Rather than trying to replicate in paint that fan shape created by hand applying the plaster, O'Keeffe's Patio Door series gives us, give us paintings that do not pretend to be anything other than oil painting. We are confronted very directly with these vast abstracted painted surfaces on canvas. I would even say that the real focus of these paintings is not the door, but the area around the door. The fact that O'Keefe went back and added another coat of white paint to my last door in 1954, but not the door, to get an even more opaque matte finish on the white parts of the painting representing the walls, to me is pow powerful evidence of that fact. But though the outside changed significantly with the transition to cement stucco, the interior of the house retained the hand-finished adobe plaster. For O'Keefe, maintaining her adobe walls was a major source of pride. Jennifer Owings Dewey, daughter of O'Keefe's friend and neighbor, architect Nathaniel Owings, remembered that when visiting the Abiquiu house, quote, everything was clean. There wasn't any dust. The walls were beautifully maintained inside and outside. I noticed that her walls seemed to be perfect, always, end quote. The walls of the house and even the floors of the house became canvases for the exploration of color and texture. Maria Chabot observed that in the first few years after construction, there were quote, few colors in the house. The walls were white or they are the natural earth with which the walls were raised. Sand, sometimes red sand or yellow sand, but a wide expanse of natural color of sameness that is quiet, end quote. The dirt used in plaster was sourced from different places in the area, mapping an extractive topography only accessible to local insiders in the know. 
As time passed, O'Keefe grew more experimental, and as Wanda Corn has noted, the artist occasionally painted her doors, the walls of guest bedrooms and bathrooms, and the floors in bright primary shades of red, yellow, and blue. The floors and walls were thus not flat, neutral surfaces, but canvases for nuanced expression in their own right. By understanding the walls in this way, we might start to interrogate the distinction between O'Keeffe's paintings and the walls upon which they were hung. This brings us at last to the concept of thinking as a wall. Earlier in her career, O'Keeffe had explicitly sought out the opportunity to execute a mural. In 1929, O'Keeffe reached out to several friends with the idea of doing a mural for the Century of Progress exposition in Chicago. In 1932, she was invited to participate in a curated show at MoMA of mural studies by established artists in the United States to show that US artists could rival their Mexican counterparts in muralism. O'Keeffe's contribution led to her commission to execute a mural in the second story powder room at Radio City Music Hall. While O'Keeffe might have otherwise risen to the challenge of addressing the architecturally complex space with its canted walls and circular mirrors, the commission came at a time of great personal difficulties and O'Keeffe abandoned the work to prioritize mental health. But I would argue that this desire to paint a mural did not vanish in the next decades of O'Keeffe's career. In the 1940s, O'Keeffe began to experiment with paintings at a larger scale. The one on the left, Pelvis with Shadows in the Moon, O'Keeffe gifted to Frank Lloyd Wright, and it hung for many years at Taliesin, and, in the theater, and then in the theater space at Taliesin West. A few years later, O'Keeffe painted Spring, as in Manhattan, both of these works combine a variety of symbolic motifs, escalating the level of compositional complexity as the canvas size correspondingly expanded. The average scale of O'Keeffe's works increased again in the 1960s as the artist began to paint abstract skyscapes inspired by her frequent airplane travel. Despite O'Keeffe's protestations that she preferred a blank wall and that, quote, Having a painting up is like looking at your own thoughts, end quote. The artist frequently displayed these cloud paintings on the expansive walls of her sitting room and studio. When journalist Ralph Looney visited in 1962, sky above the flight, a flat white cloud two was hanging in her sitting room. As I hinted in the introduction for O'Keefe, this was a scaled down version of her original idea for the space. Quote, I thought for a while about doing it on a wall and just painting it completely around the room, but that would take too much time. So I settled on this one, end quote. But O'Keefe was clearly still mulling on the idea of an architecturally specific cloud painting a few years later, when the artist's friend, designer and architect Alexander Gerard, invited her to complete a matching set of two wall-sized wall cloud paintings to complement his own three-dimensional assemblage at the John Deere headquarters in Moline, Illinois. This is a story that I've told elsewhere in, in detail, so I'm leaving a lot unsaid here, so pardon me for the abridged story but I think it serves as a fitting conclusion and resolution to O'Keeffe's lifelong dream of directly merging architectural space and painting, thinking as a wall. At first glance, the marriage of the late era Saarinen's aggressive and almost industrial John Deere building and O'Keeffe's buoyant clouds seems like a strange match. However, the space where Gerard imagined O'Keeffe's two paintings was a vision of mid-century corporate precision and finesse, the foyer of the building's executive dining room. Flanking the dining room's main lounge space, the paintings would have offered a fittingly aerial and cosmopolitan image for the Deer Corporation's jet set. With white Siamese silk ceiling panels hovering over Portuguese marble walls, the architectural effect is already rather atmospheric, even cloud-like. But beyond thinking on the white marble walls of the dining room itself, the artist was also likely thinking of her recent sitting room remodel and her original idea of painting a panoramic sky mural. 
In communicating O'Keeffe's vision for the space, architect Kevin Roche, who had taken over the Deer Headquarters project upon Saarinen's death, urged William Hewitt, the president of Deer and Company, to see O'Keeffe's cloud paintings in person hung in her house. Quote, I hope you will find it possible to give this serious consideration and perhaps visit Miss O'Keeffe to see what she is doing and what she has in mind for the panels, end quote. But sadly, like the Radio City Music Hall Commission before it, O'Keeffe's vision for the Deer headquarters never came to fruition. Yet clearly, that desire to create a very large cloud painting persisted. In the summer of 1965, O'Keeffe executed the largest canvas of her career, the eight by 24 foot sky above the clouds four, which today hangs in the Art Institute of Chicago. A mural executed directly on an architectural surface may have carried too much weight of permanence for an artist with a restless and relentless compulsion to iterate, to experiment, to put up paintings for testing, and then to take them down again to think on the clear plain wall. Yet it seems from archival evidence that O'Keeffe's habits and way of visualizing her home environment were catching. Those who visited or spent time at the Abiquiu House or Ghost Ranch were inspired to clarify their own spaces. Jennifer Owings Dewey remembers as a child, quote, I decided to make my room over like O'Keefe. I had this fixation with the idea that you have absolutely minimal things in your house, but you have what you absolutely love, end quote. And to conclude, Peter Lopez, who worked for O'Keefe during her lifetime and serves as the historic properties manager at the O'Keefe Museum, recounted, you go into my house and you don't find too many things on the wall. And it feels better to me. I couldn't be in a cluttered house. Visitors come by O'Keefe's house and they say, I'm going home and I'm going to throw out everything I don't need. But her home is very reminiscent of her life. The simplicity, the clean lines, and the elegance. It's very much like her work. Her paintings are very much like that. Thank you so much for having me virtually, and I look forward to your questions. Question, but then I don't want to um, monopolize because I'm sure many of you have questions as well. Um, what a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm also really interested in the relationship between art and the domestic sphere and have been for a long time. So this dovetailed really wonderfully um, with some of my own research. And I wonder if you have thoughts, uh, you know, my, my research really focuses on the 19th century and the way at the end of the 19th century, art and domesticity were separated by a new generation of mostly male um, art professionals. I'm wondering if you have thoughts about why Georgia O'Keeffe herself, you know, supported the narrative of separation between her art making and her domestic life. I thought that was really interesting early on when you pointed out that, you know, she herself sort of said she needed to have her working space separate from her living space when that clearly was not the case. That's a really good question. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I mean, I think, I think as you alluded to, that is, it's bound up with a lot of connotations of, of gender that persist even through the 20th century and today. Um, and I think the idea of having an artist who portrayed herself as, as fully invested in the domestic sphere um, for her might have risked feminizing her work too much. Um, you know, there's a famous quote where she says, you know, I, I don't want to be known as a, a great woman artist. I just want to be known as a great artist. I'm paraphrasing. But um, I think that had a lot to do with the fact that she made such a statement about the separation of her workspace from the rest of, of um, her living environment. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Are there other questions? Um, hi, Sarah, this is Wanda Korn speaking from the audience, so we can't see one another, but thank you for that really wonderful 
paper and um, keep up the good work. It's terrific. One thing I've never known until right this moment was the Maria Chabot idea that perhaps the house could serve as a museum after O'Keefe was gone. But, and that's fascinating, I don't know if you can tell us more whether she, she O'Keefe ever bought into that idea or whether it stayed with Maria. Um, but I also, because of this audience, has been talking about preserved artist homes and studios. Um, and I know you, you know about this, but I think our audience might not, which is this is one of the first homes and studios that I know of where the artist herself uh, thought about preserving it for public visitation. And even for a moment worked with the National Park Service thinking it might be turned into a national property. We know that didn't happen, but she herself could imagine uh, a day when the public would come in to see the space and all the implications that that suggests. So that's sort of a loaded question. Well, thank you so much, Wanda. And I'm, uh, as, as I'm sure it was evident, a great admirer of your work. So wonderful to hear from you. Um, to the first question about Maria Chabot's idea to have the house be a museum. Um, I think part of it came out of the initial, just sort of on the ground, working out what rooms would be used for what purposes. Um, and having 16 rooms, Abiquiu is, is a, a pretty massive property. Um, for those of you who've, who've visit, visited, you probably have an idea of that. Um, and I think, you know, if you know any of the backstory about Maria Chabot's relationship with O'Keefe, there was a lot of resistance to other people coming to visit her and spend time there. And so the fact that O'Keefe ended up with so many guest bedrooms because, you know, despite having this public perception of being a hermit sometimes, she actually did like company um, sometimes at least. Um, and so many of those rooms that originally Chabot had blocked out as picture rooms became guest bedrooms um, or served other purposes like art storage. Um, that idea did go to O'Keefe. Um, this was like when they were first starting to um, communicate O'Keefe's in New York, settling Stieglitz's estate. And so Chabot is sort of sending her these iterative floor plans one after the other as she sort of thinks through and works out what the house could be. And some of the suggestions like the idea of rebuilding um, the outbuilding um, into a studio um, and bedroom space for O'Keefe separate from the, the, the rest of the house, that stuck. Um, but many of them, like the idea of having all of these picture rooms, did not stick. Um, and then to the question of the sort of O'Keefe's idea of the house, you know, becoming a preserved artist studio and interpretive space. I mean, I, I definitely, I think that she was already kind of creating the mythology around that later in her career. Some of the things like the, the um, door and the wall quote um, and others that kind of build this mythology of the house and sort of naturalize her occupancy and intervention there as part of that. Um, to me really speak to her, you know, she was always conscientious about her legacy. And I think, the, um, the architectural qualities of the house were part of that. So I, I hope that answers your question in, in broad strokes, at least. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. This was a wonderful paper. I so enjoyed hearing it and I know it, you will all join me. And... Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Daniel Belasco. Um, Daniel is an art historian and executive director of the Al Held Foundation, a specialist in post-war and contemporary art. He has published essays and curated exhibitions on the work of Helen Frankenthaler, Roy Lichtenstein, Brady Walker Tomlin, or uh, sorry, Tomlin, Mary Reed Kelly, and many more. He previously surveyed or, or, oh, sorry, he previously served as 
Henry J. Lear, Associate Curator at the Jewish Museum and Curator of Exhibitions and Programs at the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art at SUNY New Paltz. In 2010, Velasco co-curated with Sarah Lewis, the Dissolve, Site Santa Fe's eighth international biennial. He holds a PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Velasco. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, sticking around. I'm just getting myself oriented here with the tech. Um, how do I advance? Use this. Okay, great. Thank you. So thanks, Maura, Valerie, uh, boards of the Grantwood Artist Colony, and. Uh, and Haas, it's really, uh, it's been a privilege, an honor to be here. Uh, I've never been to Iowa and I've really been excited to kind of steep myself at least for a couple of days in, uh, in Grant Wood and all the people that he pulls around him uh, even uh, many decades later. Um, this conference brings together a number of personal and historical incidents. Um, in some ways I'm here today like everyone because of uh, a deep passion and interest in artist studios, um, going back to early visits to uh, Pollock and Krasner's studio for me. In fact, one of the central reasons why I left museums to become the director of the Al Hell Foundation um, was because of the stewardship of his, his extraordinary studio. So I'll just lay out the compound here. Um, this is the main barn studio. Um, this is the smaller, bull barn studio. This is the, the bridge that he constructed. This is the domestic space, another former barn. There's a warehouse that he built in the 90s. Uh, this is the dairy uh, that functioned where people would come and buy cottage cheese and whatever when, um, when it was functioning as a dairy farm. And now it's um, work uh, residence. Upon entering the vast hayloft of this former dairy barn, my jaw dropped, my heart leapt. It's a wow feeling that formed the kernel, sorry, the kernel of my vision for the foundation to activate the space as a site of learning and of inspiration. That elation upon first entering the hayloft with its trust supports almost 30 feet above the floor at its apex was first experienced by the artist. Held called it my shatra, and later reflected, quote, it was like God was looking after me. Such lofty spiritual sentiments from a Jewish red diaper baby reveals the studio's power of place. And another full circle. The barn was built from architectural plans, hardware, and equipment supplied by a company located only about 60 miles from here. Loudon Machinery Company of Fairfield, Iowa, operated starting in the 1860s as a manufacturer of hay carriers, then opened its architectural office in 1906. An estimated 25,000 barns of Loudoun design were built across the country. That's according to Wikipedia. I have no ability to verify that. Um, around 1919, Harry Bailey, a wealthy New York City ice merchant, decided to play the gentleman farmer and established a dairy in the Catskills with a prize-winning herd of Guernsey cows. He worked with Loudon, uh, most likely their Albany, New York office, uh, which is a little over an hour from Boyceville where the foundation is located, uh, to construct scientifically advanced barns with modern equipment and designs to promote air circulation and moisture control. Uh, these plans and isometric cutaway views of some of Loudon's standardized buildings uh, can be seen in a 1915 catalog. The rafter structure, window placements, concrete foundation, and overall proportions here are nearly identical to those of the barns built by Bailey. So this presentation will examine Held's acquisition and renovation of just one of these barns, the 115 by 36 foot um, largest barn, um, and its relationship to his painting practice. The edifice's stark geometries and long vistas appeal to Held's complex, multi-perspective aesthetic. 
He preserved many original interior details while modernizing the facility during his 40 year ownership. Born and bred in New York City, he came to identify his art with the genius loci of his country studio. Oh, there it is, a little blurry with his father. Um, so Held painted big, really big. Works like Circle and Triangle at 12 by 28 feet pushed the vertical limits of his rented city studio on Fifth Avenue across from the Flatiron Building. The massive shapes are compressed, not just by the edge of the canvas, but by the envelope of the physical studio. At this time in 1964, Held was beginning to earn steady income from galleries in New York and Europe and teaching at Yale School of Art. When looking to buy his first summer studio, and he needed big and he needed cheap. That brought him one snowy February, 1965, to the abandoned remnants of Harry Bailey's beloved Beechford Farms. So you can just see the, uh, again, that's what became the painting studio, the residence. That's a ceramic clad silo, which is fascinating in its own right. Um, two other silos, the dairy, um, just another view. That's the main studio, residence, bull barn. Uh, the driveway was dirt, the property overgrown fields with a fenced corral. So you can see the fence and the buildings in disrepair, but the well-built old dairy farm possessed great potential. So Held bought the four buildings, which are set on two and a third acres for $8,000. The decision represented an optimistic leap of faith by a man whose immigrant parents had never owned real estate. They still rented an apartment in the Bronx. He took the hayloft of the largest barn as his studio and his partner at the time, artist Sylvia Stone, took the hayloft of the bull barn as hers and the family converted the third barn into the residence. That first summer, Held bartered with Yale alumni, Robert and Sylvia Mangold and Paul Brown and Susan Shatter to paint the exteriors red in exchange for living there rent free. This arrangement was typical of Held's DIY, sorry, DIY ethic. A high school dropout, Held worked in various trades to support his painting practice as a young man in the 1950s. Thanks to his friend, Nick Krushnik, he learned carpentry and obtained a, a union card. This allowed him to get a job when he was in San Francisco in the mid fifties to construct the wooden molds for the concrete forms that were used to build the Embarcadero Freeway much reviled, uh, which is later torn down. Uh, these experiences contributed to his workmanlike or builder's approach to creating art in the world to foster it. Held's improvements to the barn studio unfolded incrementally. The first 25 years, the barn interior remained largely raw space. Here we see it from 1966 when Held moved in and started painting. A table and a minimal wall the storage spaces uh, over the right were, whoops, sorry, were soon removed. Um, and here we go. By 1968, a partition in the back um, enclosed the space somewhat and added another painting wall. In these photos, the array of roughly nine and a half foot high paintings from this early black and white period uh, distinguished the immense volume of the country studio uh, as compared to uh, the same studio they had in the city uh, with its confined ceilings. So uh, without climate control or insulation, the studio became an oven in the summer. Held coped with the heat, and we have photos of him just in his underwear and flip-flops, which I decided not to show, but uh, <laughs> come visit the archive and I'll show you them. Um, uh, and he built successively wider and taller walls to accommodate the increasing size of his mural commissions. Um, so this photo is, the image is a little dark here. Um, we see it from 1970 when Held was painting a 90 foot mural commissioned for the modernist Empire State Plaza in Albany. Uh, this photo is a rare view of how he began to uh, work. So you can see these like rough outlines in graph and uh, charcoal and graphite, which um, later became the sub-basis of uh, these very refined, um, finished, uh, hard edge abstractions. So, uh, also visible is the, the skylight. Uh, to permit the natural light while preserving the rafters, 
he removed a section of the roof and replaced it with translucent corrugated fiberglass panels. Right, so after a 12 year black and white period, Held's paintings returned to color in 1978 in order to accommodate greater visual depth and illusionistic space. This drive to open up the picture plane to insert more imagery in each painting influenced additional alterations to the studio. So by 1983, Held extended the height of the studio wall to nearly 15 feet to paint Montaigne's Edge, 1983, a 14 and a half foot high by 50 foot wide commission for Dallas office building. So this is an early state. It doesn't look like this anymore. And in fact, the paintings now with the Boca Raton Art Museum. So um, I encourage you to, to go there. Um, so noticeable in these photos are some of the uh, retained barn features. The Y-shaped wooden ventilation ducts are prominent. You see those here. Uh, their inverted diagonals cutting across the ribbing of the rafters created two overlaid patterns. So I'm not proposing a direct correlation or that held consciously transposed the barn structures into his own work. But I am suggesting that there's a parallel sensibility, a shared eye. The same artist who respected the integrity of the original structure is also painting some of the most spatially oriented abstract works in the history of art. This dual approach of rigorous modernism in his paintings and historical adaptation in his studio stems from Held's contextualist position towards the relationship between art and architecture. From the start of his career, his paintings strove to engage the world beyond the flat picture plane. Quote, the space between the canvas and the spectator is real, emotionally, physically, and logically. It exists as an actual extension of the canvas surface, he said in 1958. This attitude stemmed in part from his early admiration of social realism, spite, uh, site specificity, and the Mexican muralists, uh, especially Siqueiros, with whom Held hoped to study in San Miguel de Allende before uh, his whole studio. He bought, uh, Held had served in the Navy, had the GI Bill, was hoping to use the GI Bill to go to Mexico, but um, the US government, because uh, Siqueiros was a communist, um, no longer allowed him to use his funds in that way. So he went to Paris. That's an aside. Uh, Held's three-dimensional thinking about two-dimensional surfaces necessarily brought him into conversation with some of the current trends in architecture and sculpture. This is the only photo we have of, of Held at Yale at the time, um, which is revealed, uh, which is, sorry, which was in the revalued vernacular built environment to counteract the bulldozer approach of international style urban renewal projects. So at Yale, Held was exposed to the ideas of art historian Vincent Scully, architects Robert Venturi and Bernard Rudofsky, all proponents of the postmodernist integration of contemporary design and local context. So from, from about 1965, 67, Held was deeply engaged with ideas around art and the environment. One of his seminars put his ideas to the test, assigning his students to create work to be installed in unusual locations, such as stairwells, uh, uh, throughout the controversial uh, Paul Rudolph Art and Architecture Building, which perhaps was his protest against the fact that the graduate studio studios were considered tiny compared to the spaces allotted to the architectural students. All right, so the enormous interior volume of Held's painting studio permitted him to test his idea of, quote, scale as content in his own painting. An early example was how he utilized his barn's spaciousness to mock up the site-specific settings of his first architectural commission, a pair of 21 and a half foot murals for a Walter Gropius designed office building in Ohio. Attentive to the embodied experience of painting, Held worked as both carpenter and artist, built a frame and scaffold about eight feet above the floor to mimic the murals locations over doorways. So something only possible in the barn studio. In 1974, Held incorporated his studio into a business which he called Beachford Incorporated, naming his professional practice after the farm and recapitulating the owner's, original owner's pride of place. The expanse of the barn facilitated the opening of space within his paintings, 
We see this when he recreated the architectural setting of another public commission for a state office building in Ohio, unusually situated on two planes that meet at a right angle. He constructed a framework to build the 40 foot long canvas Roberta's Passage. The frame was set on wheels, allowing it to be rolled around the studio as the light conditions changed. One could examine the imagery in Held's paintings and identify structures that resemble elements of barn architecture. Um, but such comparisons are really besides the point, even if they can be evidenced. One could say the same about the area's mountain landscapes, subtly influencing Held to the point that some critics called him a contemporary Hudson River School painter. So these connections are in the work, for sure, and Held wouldn't deny them. Uh, nor would he admit that that was what he was up to. For Held, it was the idea or the concept of architecture, space, and structure as a visual language to explore our paradoxical reality that animated his art, and for which he found such a conducive location in the barn studio. So as Held evolved as a painter and aged as a person, the work became both more hermetic and more optimistic. Thus, by the early 90s, his desire to improve Boyceville into a year-round studio led to the further obscurance of original barn features. On the floor, radiant heat and linoleum tile covered the wood boards. Uh, two new sheetrock walls ran floor to ceiling on both ends of the studio. So going all the way up to the, the roof there. Um, so shorting the overall kind of horizontal length by over 40 feet and eliminating a sense of the deep space and the void. Uh, light was better controlled, and the studio, though still massive with the power to awe, was now a bit more compact and somewhat domesticated. Um, let's see. Right. He also appropriated some of the original barn features in his renovations. A hyphen linked the main painting studio uh, with the smaller, so this goes down to the garage, uh, this goes up to the smaller bull barn studio. This was Sylvia's originally, um, but he uh, took it over to use uh, as a drawing studio. Um, as you can see, the structure, which we have called the bridge, uh, recreates the wood trusses and seamlessly integrates the two studios. So this is the old original, and this is the new from circa 1990. Uh, another new element, a track system, so here's this new track system, linking the studio to the recently completed warehouse uh, elsewhere on the property, seems inspired by the barn's original Loudon hay moving equipment, uh, which you can't see, but it's all the way at the, the peak of the, uh, the ceiling line. Held's track permitted large paintings to be slid out through an 18 foot high door. So the color one is 15 feet high and uh, 30 feet wide stretch. So we can store all these on site and move, one or two people can move them. For Held the Builder, the old barns elements, which may have first made a formal and spatial impact in his work, were now valued more for their functional abilities. The studio setup, especially the two large end walls, led to a new painting format, enormous triptychs. In this work, Ima Ima from 1992, the central panel, actually the same one we saw in the more contemporary shot, 15 by 30, hung on the long wall and the two wing panels, 15 by 20 feet, were painted on the side walls. Totaling about 70 feet in length, these triptychs were not commissions. Now a successful artist held, enjoyed the luxury of painting entirely for his personal pleasure. At least this scale, uh, smaller works uh, did go to the market. Um, it was not uncommon for modern artists like Jackson Pollock to retrofit art, uh, agricultural buildings to serve as painting studios. It held brought a uniquely constructive approach to his barn studio and its surrounding landscape. So there's another view of here's the track, the new warehouse, bull barn, the bridge, and then right here is the main studio. Um, finding commonality between the geometries of postmodernist abstraction and agricultural architecture. As quote, Deborah Solomon wrote in Architectural Digest, Held's art, as much as his house, is informed by a builder's instinct. So 
So thank you. Please come uh, come and visit. This is a workshop we're have, we've we've had in the past. So now we're doing a lot of educational programs using the space and the gardens. So future uh, opportunities. Hope we'll have a chance to discuss the other elements of the property. But for now, we wanted to look at the studio and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was really a wonderful talk. I was writing as fast as you were. You just... I have a pretty loud voice, but I will. I, I see. Um, thank you so much for that. I was writing as quickly as you were speaking because I'm so fascinated by this idea that the space really shaped the painting, you know, that he was in some ways. And his paintings are so architectural themselves that he's, you know, creating these almost fantasy spaces on canvas, but is constrained or inspired by the actual space of the barn. And I wonder um, if you could speak a little bit about, you know, what the archive reveals um, about his, his decisions to leave even though he made a lot of changes to leave the basic structure of that um, hayloft as it was, you know, did he know about the original designer of those barns and what that designer's ideas were? Did he look at that as a kind of, um, you know, proto-modernist structure? Like, how did he feel about the space itself? And was he aware of the impact that it was having on his own work and how crucially important it was to his practice? Um, great, yes, thank you. So um, interestingly, he kept some remnants of Beechford Farm. There was a stack of uh, black and white, like gelatin silver print photos of cows, which I think were taken uh, as part of an inventory for an auction that uh, Harry Bailey had in the, the 1930s. Um, so there was that, there was that, there was this booklet that I showed of one of the prize bulls uh, who died. It was like a memorial booklet. Um, and then uh, there was also some oil paintings of cows. There were a couple of architectural plans. That's how I, I knew that Loudon was the designer of these barns was because um, some of the original architectural plans were kept. So, um, so Held at some point consciously made the decision to save all these things, I think to maintain this connection with the original use of the barns. Um, in terms of his own thinking and feeling about the space, uh, we don't have a lot of like contemporary records. He was not a writer or a diarist or anything like that. We really only have like oral histories. So either recordings of his own thoughts and musings or other people's uh, recollections. Um, so then really the building itself is the archive. Uh, I think more than, you know, other present presentations we've seen, they're like works of art, but I think for us, it's truly an archive and there is an indexical relationship between these evolutions of the physical space and his own shifts in his work. And so trying to establish as, you know, precise chronologies as possible, um, looking through our archive with whether it might be you know, like bills or other types of like business records to help establish, you know, what was it, you know, 81 or 82 or whatever that he, you know, made these changes. So, That's fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure there are people with other questions. Thank you for that fascinating presentation. For those of us who know Alice paintings and have never seen a space, it's transformative. Right. I mean, it's Thank like you. so to point what this whole thing is about. It right. now makes me look at the work totally differently. You had a huge painting in Detroit. And mm -hmm. now I'm thinking of that in a very different way. Right. So as a foundation that's from an artist, mm -hmm. are you well endowed? And so are you able, do you have a sustainable um, budget for your program and projects? And I asked this too, because you mentioned something about a dairy farm. And I'm wondering, are you doing some side marketing on that? <laughs> no. Do you revive any of those cows? Yes. But, but, you know, like, how are you integrating with the community that's yeah. there? So I just be curious about that. Yeah. So we have a collection of Held's work still in the warehouse, which we usually use mostly for educational purposes. But we do release some paintings to the market. Um, we're represented by White Cube. And so it's very important 
for artist foundations, even those with substantial endowments and you know the hundreds of millions, we were not one of them. But it's nevertheless, it's still important uh, for all artist foundations to be in the market because that's how uh, future, or not just current future, but current generations of you know new critics, curators, collectors are exposed to the work, um, and hopefully you know gain a more international presence. Uh, I joined the foundation about five years ago, and it was my charge to uh, imagine and then implement our what our public programs could and should be. And for me, the barn and the studio is very much the center of that. And so initially, I just wanted to bring students in and work with some of our local colleges um, for educational programs. But the last two years or so, we've been uh, having contemporary art shows um, in the drawing studio. So we can have an Al Held presentation in the painting studio and then a contemporary art show in the drawing studio. And we've been doing some outdoor sculpture presentations. So yes, yeah, so we use the grounds as well. So it's evolving. Every year is a little bit different. Thank you, Mara, and thank you, Danielle, for what I think was a discovery for many of us here in the room who even consider ourselves to be pretty well-versed in preserved artist homes and spaces. Um, you focus a lot on the studio with some really wonderful um, connectivity. I'm just curious, um, personally, um, was his imprint, how did he view that um, in terms of its relation to his domestic space? And was there um, a pronounced imprint on that space? And if so, what it was? And if not, how did he sort of separate out his, his life work mm -hmm. integration? Right. Um, so a couple of layers to respond to that. Because he had multiple buildings, there was a clear physical separation between the studio and the domestic space. Um, so one of the smaller barns was initially set up to be a residence, um, and there was interesting connect, sorry, connection between the architectural design of the floor plan um, when how he divided the, that first floor was modeled on one of his paintings. Uh, it's sort of like a Greek or Maltese cross. So he, at that point, there were he and Sylvia had three children. Um, from previous marriages and they were both more or less around or at home so they needed to create uh, four bedrooms and so each corner of uh, the ground floor uh, they cut out a um, you know a space uh, for a bedroom and then actually the doors were painted primary colors uh, similar to in fact it was actually I was reminded of this seeing the, the slides from the O'Keefe presentation uh, but that was only in the 60s uh, but then it, it continued to change uh, the residence uh, was constantly remodeled as his personal life changed through, you know, various divorces and marriages. Um, and this was only his summer residence. He had, he was, I mean, a whole other conversation would be about uh, him being a pioneer in Soho. And he and Alex Katz and a few other people were among the first to co-op a loft building in 1968. And then they moved in in 1969. And Alex Katz is still there. And Stephen Antonakis, his studio is there. Um, Held was there until the 90s when he sold his loft. But, you know, Mara, Al's daughter, who's at the foundation, always liked to joke that the barn studio was his smaller studio. And by square footage, it was. The Soho studio had about 7,500 square feet. It was, it was enormous. Um, but since it was sold in the 90s, and it's not a part of the foundation's uh, property, he also had a home in Italy from the 80s uh, to his death. In fact, he died there. So kind of interpreting his work through his spaces is, is like a really important project that, you know, I guess I'm grateful that, you know, this could, these kinds of conversations kind of help frame, uh, you know, the work that I need to do uh, to interpret Held's work, you know, more carefully, like through, through his particular spaces. But he also divided um, by medium. So there was the painting studio, which is the main studio, and then there was the drawing studio. And then when he was in Italy, he primarily worked in watercolor. So each of the sort of has like sort of compartmentalized his mind and his imagination um, very, very site specifically. Yeah. 
earlier today, Jane was talking about the Iowa idea. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that Helm only had a high school education, which makes me think about Grant Wood coming here and teaching with a high school education in the 90s. Mm -hmm. and the drama that ensued around that was held commercially or um, critically acclaimed. How did he get the appointment at Yale with only a high school education? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good question. That's a mystery to me. Um, he was critically acclaimed. He was starting in 1960 or 61. He was considered a leader of the new hard edge abstract painting, which was sort of the next generation after the abstract expressionists. And uh, so he started to be in major shows and was championed by Clement Greenberg and sort of can go down the list. Um, the Yale appointment was that he needed money and he heard there was, there was a lot of um, back and forth between New York City and Yale and uh, Jack Torkoff was uh, running the department at that point and he was really interested in bringing in New York artists. And so actually Alex Katz, who was an important friend of Held's in the 60s, was already teaching there and um, Held asked him if he can get him an appointment and as a visiting, he was never a full-time professor. He was always like a visiting critic, eventually rising to the rank of professor, but in an adjunct capacity. Um, so Held, I had, there's actually Katz tells, tells this very funny story, or maybe it's Irving Sandler, that Held had a great deal of anxiety about how, who, he never even actually graduated from high school. He, he dropped out when he was 16 and joined the Navy when he was 17, right after the end of World War II. Um, so he had a lot of anxiety about how could he, who dropped out of high school in the Bronx, be teaching at Yale to the master's students, who wasn't even the undergrads. Um, and Kat said that these Yale kids, like they're a bunch of punks and you're a real gangster. And that was, <laughs> and that was sort of gave him the encouragement that like he was the real deal and that he could hold his own. Uh, and he was, someone mentioned about being auto, he was an autodidact, um, so that was an important element of his self-study. No, Albers had left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In that whole history of black on college, you know, the speech at Yale, who did the previous MFA debate, who had the first MFA at Yale? Uh, right. But uh, I think Twarkoff really had a big influence with bringing in a lot of professors, including Held. But then Held was able to continue and solidify his status there, um, even after Twarkoff left. Uh, so others have uh, asked about how the barn space affected Al's work and how um, domestic space, you know, vice versa. I'm going to ask about how that vast Catskill landscape might have had some kind of interaction with his work. Kind yeah. of within the confines mm -hmm. of a closed in barn. It's right. Interesting. Yeah. You know, that property had always been praised as being the, like a particularly beautiful site. I mean, long before Held moved there, when there were the first articles in local newspapers in the 20s and 30s about Beechford Farm, they just said like, these were like the most beautifully sited barns and you know, in the whole region. So there was something special already about that place. And he was fortunate enough to be able to acquire it. Um, he was always, I think he's a very cerebral artist. And so he's always working out kind of very formal issues and problems with his own painting and relationship to whatever was kind of happening in contemporary painting. So I don't know if he was ever really looking at the landscape, but I think he probably absorbed it to a certain extent. But it's interesting because other people made a huge impact on them. So like Robert Mangold, who I said, spent that summer there in 66, mm -hmm. you know, um, he gave an interview once where he talked about that made an enormous impact on him, just gazing at these rolling hills uh, or these gentle, gently curved mountains and all of a sudden the curved line became a form that was interesting to him. And that took his art in a completely different direction. So there's never a moment where Held ever makes that kind of connection between the landscape in the same way that Mangold did, even though Mangold was only there for a few months. Thank you so much. Just one more. I'm sorry, it's hard to scan the room. Thanks. In, in the period that you were describing where Held, uh, you know, finally had the ability to sort of 
really good painting um, for himself rather than for you know major commissions. It's it's ironic that that's the point in which the barn begins to look most like a gallery. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the, with the walls and the, the new floor. Mm -hmm. um, were people making pilgrimages out there to see his work, or was this a gallery for one? You know, we never thought of it as a gallery. People came for business, um, but I think he was more active in the 70s and the 80s uh, when he was still establishing himself in terms of having a lot of visitors and people coming up. And I think by that, he became much more self sufficient uh, socially. And, it just, and artistically um, by the early and certainly by the later 90s and even his own process because as you know he had had that place in Italy and the Italian Renaissance became this really important source of inspiration for him and so he was painting watercolors in Italy that became the sources for paintings in Boyceville so he was very much tied into art the history of art at that point. And I think, you know, like the Piero was almost more alive for hell at that point than, you know, other contemporary artists were. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. So many creative outlets. Just hope we don't go back into lockdown because I might have to break into my China cabinet or buy some concrete or I guess invest in some farmland. Um, so many ideas. Uh, <laughs> I wanna once again, thank our speakers, our session leaders, as well as our audience for such great conversation today. So give yourself and everybody a round of applause again. Thank you so much. Um, but it's not over, we still have tomorrow. Uh, so this is, these are some instructions um, that I'm going to read. Beginning at 11 tomorrow, uh, the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art will be offering tours of Five Turner Alley, Rantwood Studio, um, to symposium attendees. That's opening early for us. Uh, despite the photos you've seen making the space seem very large, it is actually quite small and we actually need to go in groups of 10. So what the plan is, is that you can come to the studio, we'll split you up into groups and we'll do our best to get everybody through. There's an introductory video on the first floor and then we'll take turns. Well, I won't. <laughs> Sean and Kate, uh, their curator, will be taking groups up and you guys will be getting a really special experience in the studio space. Uh, there is parking right by the studio. There's a surface lot, but also there is a adjacent uh, parking ramp that you're welcome to park in and it is free up in Cedar Rapids. And then um, the closing plenary is actually located at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. Oh, let me give you the address. It is in the information, but the address of the studio is 810 Third Avenue, Southeast Cedar Rapids. The second, I looked it up. Oh, second, I thought that was weird. Okay, Second Avenue. Thank you, Sean. Uh, the closing plenary, however, is uh, which will be featuring Sean Ulmer speaking about the Grantwood Studio, Victoria Monroe speaking about the Alice Austin House, and Helen Harrison, who is going to be speaking on the Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner uh, home. That will take place in the auditorium at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, which is a few blocks away at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, and that is located at 410 Third Avenue Southeast, correct? For that, the parking is in the back. You actually access the parking off of 2nd Avenue. If you put it into your phone or wherever, it'll get you there. It's, it's not as confusing as we're making it sound. Um, so, oh, the last bit is that you will be able to get to the auditorium without any kind of museum pass or anything. Um, you can arrive after noon when the museum opens and the closing plenary begins at 1230. And you won't need a pass to get into the auditorium. However, the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art has been generous enough to provide passes for those of you that want to continue and explore the galleries there. And if you have the time after the plenary to do so, I highly encourage it. It is such a wonderful museum. I grew up going there, so I'm a little bit um, biased, but um, I do encourage you to take advantage of that. So with that, we're actually finishing a little bit. Or, oh, yes, question. How long does it take to get to Cedar Rapids? Uh, 40 minutes, 30, 30 to 40 minutes because we're just getting to downtown and, it, and they and actually the signage off the off the interstate is quite decent um, to get to the Museum of Art. Any other questions? Yes, Karen. 
Sure. Well, Sean, <laughs> is it 810 Second Avenue? That's the studio. And then the museum is 410 Third Avenue. And if you do the math in your head, you can actually park at the museum and walk if you want to, if the weather's nice. Um, you don't necessarily have to drive between the two, but you can. It's only a few blocks. Yeah, there's an exit on the interstate that'll actually say to the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. I don't know that there'll be time for lunch in between. Right. <laughs> Sean, do you have any ideas? Eat a big breakfast, maybe, or a late breakfast? <laughs> Because it is, it had to do, we timed it this way because of flights and everything like that. And we appreciate that it is kind of compact. Um, and so I, I think that's the best we can do is try to eat as close to 11 and then do the tour and then have a late lunch. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can you give a thumbs up if you can hear me? Great. Um, good afternoon to everyone here at the wonderful Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, and good afternoon to everyone joining us online. I see from Zoom that there are a number of people from the Haas family online, so welcome to you. Um, I need no introduction to you, but I will reintroduce myself slightly. Um, I am Valerie Valance, and I head up the Historic Artists Homes and Studios Program, which is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This is a consortium of 55 independent um, museums and historic sites that are all open to the public in 25 states in this glorious union. Um, and all were the former homes and working studios of um, American artists. And collectively, we draw 1 million visitors a year. And those artists represented in the network sites span three centuries and collectively represent the artists of the legacies of over 300 artists. And of course, I want to extend my thanks to Maura Pilcher um, for It Takes a Village, and she's one person to create um, something as um, amazing as this three-day experience. I want to thank the Grantwood Art Colony, and I also want to thank um, the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, and in particular, a uh, speaker who will come up shortly, but Sean Elmer, who is the executive director here at the museum, who just gave all of us an incredible um, experience, along with curatorial staff here at the museum of the Grant Wood Studio, proving once again that no matter how great these papers are, it is a poor imitation of standing in the space. It never gets old, the awe and wonder is always the same, and I urge everyone to use this as a jumping off point to go and discover not only Grant Wood Studio, go back again, but also any number of other places um, represented in the Haas Network, but beyond. I want to just say that this closing plenary includes staff and scholars from three Haas sites. So we've heard throughout the three days, papers that include sites within the network, sites without the network, but today is from practitioners working and inhabiting and activating those spaces today. And the selection is a great representation of the breadth of Haas. One is a converted loft uh, in a carriage barn, one a former fishing shack, and one um, of pretty typical vernacular Victorian home with a dark room in the closet. And why that's important is it is a reminder that these works of art that are so incredibly well known and that we revere as part of American art and culture were often produced in incredibly humble spaces. 
Likewise, these three particular artists, I think, represent sort of the core of the diversity in Haas. So you have Pollock, who should just be Pollock. <laughs> Whether you know paintings by Pollock or not, you've heard the name. You have Grant Wood, who's American Gothic, almost everybody knows, although perhaps not that it's Grant Wood or anything about the artist. And then you have Alice Austin, an incredibly compelling and um, just that story is going to draw you in someone you may discover for the first time today. And the sites themselves also represent Haas and its diversity. To stand on the floor at the Pollock studio is transformative, it is something that cannot be replicated anywhere else in terms of understanding process. To be in the Grant Wood studio is to remember that artists consistently tinker and expand their spaces using other types of disciplines. And in terms of Alice Austin, the environment itself and the context in which she created her works in terms of her views just across the Verrazano Narrows to New York City, they say context is everything and Haas is about context and you will learn more about that through these wonderful papers. I'm just gonna introduce briefly each of our speakers right now in turn and then allow them to come up to the podium. Sean Ulmer, as I said, is the executive director of the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, which are the owners and operators of the Grantwood Studio. And prior to becoming executive director in 2014, he served as the curator of collections and exhibitions at this same museum for nine years. So a former curator of my own heart. He has more than 25 years of curatorial experience, including over 120 exhibitions and inquiring numerous works of art. And he is also responsible for several exhibition catalogs. And for a longer um, example of the biography, I urge you to look in your um, program. Victoria Monroe is the executive director of the Alice Austin House a nationally designated site of LGBTQ plus history and the only museum in this country to represent the work of one woman photographer, Alice Austin. Victoria is an art and art history educator, maker and photographer, and she consults and speaks on LGBTQ plus curriculum development, historical and current LGBTQ interpretations in public and private institutions. And lastly, um, I have Helen Harrison, who is the uh, Eugene V. and Claire Ethaw Director of the Paula Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton in New York, and is a former New York Times art critic and NPR arts curator, commentator, excuse me. She has been a curator at the Guild Hall Museum and the Parish Art Museum, also um, out on East End of Long Island and taught at the school of visual arts and currently holds an adjunct faculty position at Stony Brook University. Um, I like Zach, this is the first time I have been in an in-person convening since March of 2019. And I am just so grateful for the energy and um, hospitality that we have experienced over these three days. And um, I look forward to hearing these last three papers. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Good afternoon. I thank you for inviting me to speak with you about the Grant Wood Studio. Um, before I begin, I'd like to take a moment, to, uh, just a moment to thank uh, both the Grant Wood Art Colony uh, for organizing this symposium and the Historic Artists Homes and Studios Program for sponsoring uh, this afternoon session. The Grant Wood Studio was never meant to be a studio at all. It is at its very core, a hayloft. This rather compact 975 square foot space with its sloping ceiling and exterior staircase was nothing more than the second story of a carriage barn, which housed several carriages and horses uh, and used to draw them. It was a brick structure uh, built to a company, a Georgian revival style mansion constructed in the mid to late 1890s 
by George Bruce Douglas Jr. George Douglas, along with his brother Walter, were the co-founders of the Douglas Starch Works, an important early company in Cedar Rapids, which by 1914 was the largest starch works company in the world. He was also the son of industrialist George Douglas Sr., a Scotsman who with Robert Stewart founded Douglas and Stewart Cereal Mill, which eventually became known as Quaker Oats. George Douglas Jr. and his family lived in the house until 1906, when they arranged a rather unprecedented house swap with Carolyn Sinclair, widow of Thomas Sinclair, founder of the Sinclair meatpacking plant. Mrs. Sinclair felt that her home, an 1886 brick Victorian, uh, then outskirts of Cedar Rapids, was too large for her family, and the Douglases, in turn, wanted more property in order to plant formal gardens, which they did, as well as installing servants' quarters, greenhouses, and caretakers' cottages. They renamed the property Bruce Moore, using George Douglas's middle name, Bruce. The 26-acre property is now part of the National Trust, to which it was donated by George's daughter, Margaret Hall, upon her death in 1981. But back to the Georgian Revival home, now occupied by Mrs. Sinclair and her family. It was during the Sinclair's time at this property that they decided to have the carriage house moved about 40 feet away from the main house. They owned the adjacent lots, so they, were able, so they had the space to expand. But the exact reason for the move is unknown. In 1917, 11 years after the house swap, Mrs. Sinclair passed away and the property was occupied by her son, who in turn sold it in 1923 to John B. Turner, a local mortuary owner whose nearby funeral home had grown too small for his business. John B. Turner and his son David employed a friend of his son's, one Grant Wood, to help convert the mansion into a funeral home. The Turners added a large wing to one side of the mansion and Wood designed, among other things, the rose-colored bay window in front of which the bodies were laid. It was John B. Turner and his son David who invited Grant Wood to use the hayloft as a potential studio for they no longer needed the space uh, as a hayloft as their hearses were all motorized by this period. This was a critical moment for Grant Wood. The hayloft reminded him of the garret he had occupied with his good friend Marvin Cohn on their trip to Paris in the summer of 1920. No sooner had he stepped inside the hayloft uh, than he started to think that with a little clever remodeling, he could transform this space to be not only a studio, but also a place to live. Drawing upon his arts and crafts background, that's exactly what he did and he moved in full-time in 1925, bringing along his aging mother and frequently housing his sister as well. Not having to pay rent or a mortgage allowed Wood to give up his teaching position at McKinley Junior High School and paint full-time. Wood lived and worked in the Grant Wood studio until 1935, when he moved to Iowa City to assume a teaching position at the University of Iowa. It was in the studio that Grant Wood created some of his most famous and iconic paintings, including American Gothic. The Cedar Rapids Museum of Art received the Grant Wood studio in 2002 as a gift from the Lingy family. They own and operate Cedar Memorial, the successors to Turner Mortuary. However, as they say, there are no free puppies. Since that time, the studio has witnessed two major renovation projects. First, to shore up the structure and to convert the first floor garage into a visitor center, including the insertion of an I-beam between the first and second floors to keep the second floor up on the second floor. <laughs> then, several years later, a second project to restore and preserve the exterior envelope of the structure, removing all of the lead-based paint restoring the original windows, gutters, downspouts, and securing the cupola. Neither project was inexpensive, 
but with the help of various donors, foundations, and historic preservation grants, we were able to accomplish this vitally important work, which totaled approximately $1 million. Despite all of this work, however, the interior of the studio itself remains relatively unchanged. We have been exceptionally careful not to make any significant changes to the studio proper until we determine all of the interior work that needs to be done. We have had analyses conducted of the various paint layers and later modifications, for the studio was more or less continuously occupied by tenants from the time Wood left in 1935 until as recently as 2000. These tenants made changes to suit their needs, including modernizing the kitchen, inserting an air conditioning unit, uh, as well as other updates. We have been in the process of removing some of these changes slowly, as well as discussing to what moment in history to return the, to return the interior. Significant to these discussions is the fact that the studio suffered a major fire during Grant Wood's time there forcing him to replace the original floor, which had been scored and painted to look like ceramic tiles with the one that is seen today. Since we have no intention of tearing up the present floor, something Wood laid himself, that provides us with the terminus post whim of 1932, the date of the fire. What does that mean for our visitors? How do we provide a rewarding experience to a in a relatively empty space? Our efforts to provide an engaging educational experience are perhaps best demonstrated by walking you through a visit to the Grant Wood studio. After parking in the lot or walking the three short blocks from the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, the visitor is asked to enter the visitor, service, the visitor center first. Here a staff member greets the guests and, the, uh, and explains that the tours for the studio are by docent guide only and that they are welcome to watch the introductory 30 minute film on the life of Grant Wood or view some of the other materials available in the visitor center for their perusal. We ask them to sign in, but we take no fees for the admission costs to the studios have been subsidized by a significant grant from the Esther and Robert Armstrong Charitable Trust. The film screen, Grant Wood and Me, was something we produced for our major 2005 exhibition of the work of Grant Wood, celebrating the acquisition and opening of the Grant Wood studio. It provides a nice overview of the life of Grant Wood and introduces viewers to some of the better known works as well as many other works, uh, such as his early metal pieces, which the docents will speak to more directly on their guided tours. It also allows the docent to concentrate less on the biography of Grant Wood and more on, the, uh, on what he produced while in the studio. Other materials in the visitor center include copies of newspaper clippings and books about Grant Wood. At the conclusion of the film, the docent who has just finished up his or her previous half hour tour upstairs appears and gathers up the next group. This requires leaving the visitor center in which, which, at which time the docent discusses uh, the nearby Turner mortuary and Wood's role at that place. Rounding the corner, the visitors proceed up the modern stairs, and stop at the top to look at Wood's unique door. Originally, wooden stairs had been built in the opposite direction, and the access to them was from the alley, which is how the studio also became known as Five Turner Alley. The door, a facsimile of the original housed at the nearby Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, was fashioned from a coffin lid obviously readily available, in which Wood crafted a dial to inform prospective visitors whether he was in or out, and if the latter, when he was returning. It also let visitors know if he was having a party, out of town, or even taking a bath. Not only does this door betray Wood's sense of humor, there was a practical side for this as well. Since Wood was a very popular man about town, making friends wherever he went, the people of Cedar Rapids, many of whom supported Wood's work, felt almost as if they owned him, and oftentimes felt no hesitation to walk right into his space without knocking or being invited in. 
So this door, with all of its whimsy, served both as an artistic creation as well as having a very practical function. Upon passing through the door, the visitor is required to navigate a half story of narrow stairs with a modern day railing to assist. For many years, people used the more rustic chain link railing opposite until the faux black end plates began to deteriorate. They are not forged of wrought iron as they appear, but rather are painted cardboard, no doubt saving the frugal artist some expense. At the top of the stairs, the visitor enters a single large space, which served as a living, eating, working, and sleeping quarters for Grant Wood, his mother Hattie, and on occasion, his sister Nan Wood Graham. The volunteer docents share several of Wood's modifications that transformed this hayloft into a home and studio for 11 years. These include the installation of a fireplace to warm the space. The hood is a metal bushel bucket turned upside down. Originally, they heated their tea on the hood. The so-called hot dog stand, a drop down eating space for Wood and his mother with a pass through from the kitchen. A seating area, although the table is a later addition. The sleeping area, where the single beds would be tucked under the eave and shielded from view by curtains during the daytime. The storage cabinets above could house not only painting supplies, but also clothing and other household goods. The docent uh, that the, I'm sorry, the dormer that Grant Wood created by punching through the roof, allowing uh, a Western light and providing room for a desk. Painting storage racks can be found to either side of the dormer. These slide in and out to conceal and reveal the works that Wood was painting. These possess original wrought iron poles designed by Wood, as well as a full studded leather surface that wood fabricated by using simple upholstery tacks and fabric that he then painted. Original wrought iron lighting fixtures designed by Grant Wood. A modern easel where his original easel stood. The telephone stand on two levels, since one of them liked to stand while talking, but the other liked to, liked to sit. The north windows where the hay used to come in from the alley. They now have a window box seat covering the radiator that was installed during Wood's time. At some point during his occupation of the space, Wood punched through the roof on the northeast corner, creating a separate sleeping room for his mother. The large arched opening is able to be closed off by a hinged metal divider held in place by a clasp. Between the main room and Hattie's new room was a radiator to heat both rooms with stylized floral grill work on the living room side of the radiator. Hattie's room was heavily modified uh, after Wood moved out uh, and thus now houses a couple of display cases holding a few artifacts, mostly metalwork of his time at the studio. Across from the entrance into Hattie's room is the bathroom, replete with built-ins and a sunken tub this tub neatly fills the hole where the original internal ladder to the loft was and where the hay would be dropped down to feed the horses. It also allowed for both a bath and a shower in a rather confined and sloped space, thus serving both occupants, one of which preferred to take baths while the other showers. The last small room is the kitchen, which has been heavily modified and is in a state of disrepair. There was no stove during Wood's time, only a hot plate, but a small stove in his, was inserted by a subsequent tenant. In addition, the more modern refrigerator has been removed since Wood only had a modest icebox. The skylight, however, was original, which was still quite a novel thing in the 1920s and 30s. The docent giving the tour has a few props to assist during the tour. First and foremost, we are fortunate to have several black and white photographs of the space as it looked when Wood lived there. These are used and shared by the docent to help make the space come alive for the visitor. These historic photographs 
aid the visitor's experience greatly. They demonstrate how Wood used the space and how the visitor can see how the space was then and how it appears now. And there are occasional details in the photographs that do not appear today, such as the curtains that used to hang, separating the sleeping area from the rest of the room. Not only would these draperies allow for cutting down on drafts and the more efficient heating of the sleeping area, they also served as stage curtains for the small theatrical productions Wood and his friends would write and perform in the studio, thus establishing the first community theater in Cedar Rapids, known today as Theater Cedar Rapids. In addition to the historic photographs, the docents may also use reproductions of a few of the works that Wood created while he lived in the studio. We had these made to their exact dimensions on masonite, a particle board frequently used by Wood and used with these same pieces. These reproductions include Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, Daughters of the Revolution, Young Corn, Woman with Plants, which is a portrait of his mother, and of course, American Gothic. These five works represent a nice cross-section of the works he created while living and working at the studio. Each has a different story and, uh, to tell, and the docent is prepared to tell that story. Looking at all of the changes Grant Wood made to the hayloft, it is clear how he transformed the space to make it into an efficient home and studio for himself. One that would also accommodate his elderly mother uh, and often his sister. It was during his 11 years in the space that he created some of his most significant works of art, which resulted in achieving national renown. This is due in large part to the studio. Transforming the hayloft into a studio and home was transform transformational to Grant Wood's career. By living rent-free in the hayloft, Wood was able to give up his teaching position at McKinley Junior High School and paint full time. This allowed him to take on serious commissions, beginning with the 1925 series of paintings he created for the JG Cherry Company in Cedar Rapids. While Wood had been able to take on the occasional commission, this was an important series of nine paintings used by the Cherry Company at various trade shows to display the dairy machinery that they were able to manufacture. The success of that commission no doubt prepared him for several future commissions, including the successful commission for the stained glass window for the Veterans Memorial Building. This commission, in turn, led to a transformational trip to Germany in the fall of 1928 to oversee the manufacture of the window. His first-hand exposure to Northern Renaissance masters, including Hans Memling, helped to transform Wood's painting style from Impressionism to his harder-edged mature style. His trip to Germany, in turn, resulted in the creation of compositions such as Woman with Plant and American Gothic. There were other contributing factors, of course, but the trip to Germany in the fall of 1928 is often cited as critical to Wood's development. And all of, the, all of this starts with the work on the Grant Wood studio. It seems highly unlikely that the sequence of events precipitated by the transformation of the hayloft into a home and studio would have unfolded in quite the same way. The studio, therefore, was not only transformed by Grant Wood, but was also so very transformational to his career. It is remarkable that this small 975 square foot hayloft had such an enormous impact on Wood's life and career, one which resulted in one of the most iconic American paintings of all time. Thank you. Are you going to give me a time warning? Yeah. <laughs> it's five and a two. Okay. It's five and a two. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. As Valerie so kindly introduced me, I'm Victoria Munro, the Executive Director of the Alice Austin House. Um, this has been a truly wonderful weekend, my very first time in Iowa. As you can hear, I have an accent. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm originally from New Zealand, um, but I've been living in America for 25 years, um, fairly much all of which uh, spent living in New York City. Um, today, um, I'm standing here to give you a presentation that I wrote two years ago. And we're essentially in a very different world. And a lot of things have happened at the Alice Austin House. Oh, we need. Can you speak up better into the microphone? How is this? Much better. Great. So, and, and video is okay if I'm over here? Great. So, yes, we've experienced uh, a massive amount of change. And, you know, this idea of home and what that means to us has become incredibly significant, I think, in lots of different ways. And I really want to acknowledge all of the presentations of my colleagues um, this weekend and the various notions of home and connection for artists to home um, and how that's made me think of so many different things uh, in relation to my own presentation. So I'm quite lucky to be um, having this Sunday positioning. And, you know, it's time for a little lesbian period drama. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Austin House. It's located on a four acre park um, on the waterfront of Staten Island. So it overlooks, as Valerie said, the Varanzano Narrows uh, with a view of New York City, Brooklyn and also Hoboken. The house itself appears as a Victorian Gothic cottage and was originally a two room Dutch farmhouse built in 1690. So it is one of New York's oldest homes. Now, originally when the Alice Austin house was saved, it was slated for demolition during the 1960s and a group of concerned citizens came together and Friends of Alice Austin was formed. And this was quite a formidable group, including people such as Edward Steichen, Bernice Abbott, Margot Gale, um, and such. And they really had this incredible vision to create a museum that would be a living, breathing, photographic museum. And some of that vision got lost along the way. And part of that is very much due to um, the interpretation of the museum's namesake, Alice Austin. Here we see Alice at 22 years old in her striped dress, one of the most famous photographs of Alice taken by her uncle Oswald. Uh, she was already an accomplished photographer by this stage. And I know it would be, I know some of you in the room know Alice and her work, but it would be remiss of me not to explain to you that she received her first camera at age 10. And that was a gift from Uncle Oswald, who was a Danish sea captain and traveled the world and brought back lots of fantastic things. The other thing that you need to know is that Alice Austin resided at this very address because her mother was abandoned by her father when she was an infant. So the two room Dutch farmhouse, which had been extended over the years was purchased in 1844 by Alice's grandfather. It was intended to be a holiday home, but because the sanitary conditions in New York City were really horrific, um, the Austin grandparents had lost two of their sons and decided to move the family to Staten Island for healthier living. Um, Alice was not born at the house, but would move there when she was very, very tiny. So therefore she grew up in a world where she was surrounded by adults. Her grandparents lived in the house. Of course, her mother was there with her, her aunt Min, her uncle Oswald, and also her uncle Peter, who was a chemist and very interested in the, the chemistry of photography and taught Alice some of that. So Oswald and Peter would then transform, and when I say transform, that's kind of a rich word, 
they made a closet in the upstairs of the Alice Austin house, a small closet into a dark room for Alice. It never had any running water um, and or electricity. So Alice Austin left us a legacy of around about 8,000 photographs of a changing New York City. Now, whilst it wasn't uncommon for women to take up photography at this time, it was very rare for them to work outside of the studio. So Alice is essentially one of the first uh, photographers to take her camera onto the streets and she would take up to 50 pounds of photographic equipment on her bicycle into the city and, and photograph what we see as a period of massive immigration and various roles changing in the workforce in New York City. Um, this is Alice's partner, Gertrude Tate, standing above. Alice is seated. It's a penny portrait taken just up the road from the Alice Austin house. The pause that COVID has given us has been phenomenal for the Alice Austin house. I'm going to talk about some of the transformation within the house that was achieved by 2019. But one of the benefits to us perhaps not being open to the public, redistributing um, labor amongst our staff has meant that we've been able to achieve projects within our collections and understanding of Austin's life that we had always wanted to do, but had always been chasing our tails. Um, we now know we had always thought that Austin and Gertrude had met in 1899, but in fact, it's 1897. And every year is very significant in this history. And of course, as uh, Valerie mentioned, we are now a nationally designated site of LGBTQ history, which was an achievement um, that we were awarded in uh, 2017. So of course, it's really important for me to show you a quick few photographs of Austin. So this is a rare image that I really like to show because Alice is actually smiling. Um, so this, uh, this is Alice and her, both her friends named Julia. Um, they are situated just in the front of the house on the side by the porch. And what's really interesting um, about Austin, uh, Austin's work is a lot of it is located inside or around her house in terms of these personal photographs that weren't necessarily meant, well, definitely weren't meant for public consumption, which, which are so interesting to us now in understanding her and the life of her and her friends. So she really used the home as a backdrop. She used the entire gardens as an outdoor studio. Uh, and that's something that I, I'm very, very, very interested in today. And I'm interested in the way that Austin used the space as a safe space for her queer friends and for women. So what does queer safe space look like? And how did Alice set up mechanisms to have it be very functional for her and her friends to have as much freedom as possible and explore creatively? Here are some interior shots, not, not taken inside the Alice Austin house, but Austin did also photograph men as well as um, her woman friends. The 1890s were her most prolific period. She was traveling around the world. She was upstate. She was having multiple relationships with women. Um, a very interestingly, uh, a wonderful photographer named Jeb, who some of you may have heard of, said, well, now that you've outed Alice and Gertrude, you get to talk about bad Alice. What did she do before the 56-year relationship? Um, so this is Alice and her friends. They were called the Damned Club, nicknamed so because they did not allow men into their clubs. And this is on the edge of the lawn at the Alice Austin house. Um, 
the photograph in petticoats and short skirts, incredibly irreverent with fake, fake cigarettes is actually taken in the rectory of St. John's Episcopal Church just <laughs> up the road from, from the house. Uh, in fact, the church where Alice was christened. Uh, and Alice takes multiple photographs of her fan, friends in uh, affectionate poses and often um, switches each member and tries all different compositions, a lot of them with a very Victorian eye towards geometric shapes that, that the bodies form. Um, but impressively, you know, the garments, the neckties, um, these people would have had to have posed for quite a long time. So she really has this very distinctive eye. Um, but what is incredibly clear after going many scholars, but also including myself, working for years and years with Austin's work is you know very definitively when you're looking at an Alice Austin photograph. Um, this is a photograph of, of her relatives on the beach. I love this composition. And here's Alice perched on a fence post to capture the moment of a a race, a motor car race. Alice was the first woman on Staten Island to own a car and she knew how to fix it. She rolled with a toolkit. And looking out at the photographer who's taking this photograph is Gertrude Tate. And it's like they're sharing a joke. You know, look at what Alice is doing. Um, this photograph is referred to um, in uh, Heresies, which is a publication that came out at Heresies number three, and it was the lesbian art issue. Anne Novotny published an essay. Now, any of you that have done any research into Alice Austin, tried to find books on Alice Austin, might realize that there's really only one book that came out in 1976, and it's by Anne Novotny. Anne Novotny was a lesbian um, researcher and author, and she could not have published Alice's World had she outed Alice in that book. She did say that it was her hope that people understood that Alice was in a loving relationship with Gertrude Tate when they read the book. But what she did do was in that same year was publish a multi-page article in, in the lesbian art issue, which included a notation about this photograph and this very, uh, you know, insider joke that seems to be going on with Gertrude and, and the photographer. And just quickly um, to say, Alice Austin also photographed the quarantine stations, um, which again have come up as a very uh, intense and sensitive issue during our own quarantines. Um, she photographed them for 10 years on Hoffman and Swinburne Island. She was employed and paid to document the sanitation uh, facilities, which were, of course, a new technology. And her works were displayed at the Buffalo World's Fair in 1901. Um, so it becomes, it's triple fold, so many reasons why Austin's work is not necessarily acknowledged in the way it should be. And one of the reasons here I'd just like to say is that uh, a lot of writers have said that she had no ambitions for professional, a professional career. I think otherwise. Um, Austin accepted paid work for her photographs. She went back for 10 years to these islands. Uh, she photographed uh, people on the street of New York City, which she called street types. She copywrote her photographs. She self-published uh, a book called Street Types of New York City. Um, she also sold photographs of her travels to her friends and we have letters documenting them paying her. Um, so, I would say that that's very wrong. And I do know that there's some new scholarship that's coming out and being published that um, does not really acknowledge this and puts Alice back at very much in this amateur category. And one also has to remember that the word amateur had a very different meaning in Austin's time. 
So now we talk about some of the wrong pathways and um, areas where, you know, um, the Austin House had lost its way a little bit, more than a little bit. They stopped acknowledging um, any of uh, Austin's uh, life and activities and friendships and the meanings of those friendships and their interpretation of the house and the site. And it was really only the queer community that acknowledged the truthful history of Alice Austin. And there was a very um, well-known um, march down Highland Boulevard and they hung a dike preserver on the lawn and Barbara Hammer actually included it in her film, The Female Closet. So how did we start to change? Um, one of the things that did happen for us, obviously, was that other groups took more and more of an interest and there was obviously a change in board leadership that became more open-minded at the Alice Austin House. So um, it was really an achievement of um, the uh, New York LGBTQ Historic Sites Project and the National Park Service to rewrite and amend the, de the national designation for the house to become um, a site of LGBTQ history. At that time, the only things that the Alice Austin House was actually doing was um, allowing inclusive weddings to happen on the lawn and allowing the Pride Center to have their coming out picnic. That was it. So we became a site of significance and reinterpretation needed to happen. And that was when I um, took on the role of executive director. There was plans for a complete renovation of the galleries and you do not need to look at the slide closely. It's uh, simply to show uh, all the areas of interpretive um, space that could be gleaned from the galleries. So this is um, what the dining room looked like uh, when I started working at the Alice Austin house. It was filled with antique furniture, none of which was Alice Austin's. Alice was evicted from the house, uh, Alice and Gertrude in 1945. So most of her possessions were lost. Uh, therefore, we don't have a large material collection from what was in the house before. So the board had used a photograph of Alice's dining room and attempted to recreate it. What this did was, um, you know, it took up the entire space, but you might notice that there is only one photograph in this room and it doesn't have a tag. This is the reinterpretation. We're able to cover several of the themes in Austin's work, allow full classroom groups into the space and uh, also display Alice's camera and really tell some of the history of her involvement with photography and the types of uh, glass plates that she worked with. Um, this is the uh, dining room, the, sorry, the parlor before. So we only had two historic rooms in the house. And, um, this one also only had three of Alice's photographs on display. I think in total, there was around about 15 to 20 photographs in the house of Austin's. When I first visited the Alice Austin house, I left, when I left, I did not know that Alice was a photographer and I did not know that she was a lesbian. As a queer photographer and artist, that might've meant a lot to me. And today, the entire entry has been, uh, we've exploded the photographs just for this purpose to sort of create an entry voice. Um, and because we don't have Alice Austin's voice, we have a lot of other letters to her. Um, it was really important for me to use quotes from some of these letters, but also from contemporary um, authors and scholars and people that have experienced the space so that we become a site of active story time. And that is really where we are at today. So all of our programs were redesigned, um, rewritten to be inclusive of Alice's story, 
um, placing Alice and Gertrude front and centre, really focusing on all of the work. And that's programs, whether they're taught, you know, um, K through 12 and to adults. Uh, we work specifically also with gender sexuality alliances and SAGE populations, which is queer seniors. And then we have two contemporary galleries at the Alice Austin House. There's three shows that are presented per year. And of course, as an effect of COVID, we now have virtual tours um, that you can see all of those shows from the last few years. So this is the show that was the opening exhibition um, in 2019 when we reopened the spaces. And believe me, I know if you've worked in a historic house, I was on the end of a paint roller to get this <laughs> through. Um, and also just a note, we are a parks department, New York City Parks Department owned property. So Friends at Alice Austin, the nonprofit, works to preserve the property, raise funds, runs all the programs, and realistically, without these friends groups, uh, the New York City 23 sites would fall into the ground. So what happened during COVID? My park, four acres, it was full. Everyone was looking for a seat outside. One of the things I really struggle with, with museum spaces, is whether or not people feel welcome to come in. Of course, we've all done countless DEI trainings, talked about this, how to become more welcoming spaces, but I felt at the end of the day, watching everything that was happening with COVID and my doors were closed, did I really need to make it that much more welcoming to have them come in the museum or was it that I wasn't recognizing the park as the cultural anchor it needed to be? So reinterpreting the exterior. This requires many, many voices. So I worked with the Pratt Graduate Center for Planning and the Environment. Um, over the last year, I had an IMLS grant to work with also non-traditional scholars um, to really look at what the barriers are to the park, physical, but also um, interpretive um, things that need to actually happen in the park. Like if you come to the park, people don't actually understand because I don't even have a sign that says this is the Alice Austin house once you're in the property. So most people don't even recognize that that little white house the, any of the significance to it. And part of the problem with parks and landmarks is I'm not allowed to do this, right? So how do we think about new and inventive ways to really solve some of these obstacles? I'm not give, gonna give you a full presentation on this because this is just what is happening now. But there are things that I dream of and that is getting rid of the white picket fence. Alice never had a white picket fence. I see it as a barrier, but it also doesn't stop people from coming in the park. It doesn't provide the house with any safety. So increased visibility on the street would also mean openness. At the rear of the property, I have another historic house that's landmarked that's falling into the ground. So the ability to have a larger visitor center that's purpose built for us would help preserve the house but also have the ability to, you know, we would have the ability to run, you know, much more extended education programs. And we also own the side meadow, which could also have an amphitheater for performance and be much more inclusive for the community. We also own a separate garden, which uh, could be developed uh, into a native garden space. That's just one idea. Alice Austin was also the founding member of the Staten Island Garden Club. So creating all of these ways to wander and taking down barriers, my suggestion is not to mess with any of the preservation of the house, to be really, really reflective uh, about what is uh, significant um, in the landscape, but to enhance all of that so that it is a space that people can happen upon and hopefully learn more about Austin without the expectation that they even need to set foot in the museum. So, and of course we have the waterfront. 
So we're really at this point thinking of these moments of invitation and the next step is a pilot project to create a queer garden at the rear of the Alice Austin house with plants that talk to each other, plants that are non-binary, that change sex and really be able to um, have an experience where we can bring classes to it and tell a story with that garden, which is a roundabout a 15 by 25 foot space. Um, so it's all new <laughs> and I hope I was able to just touch on a few things there for you and give you a little bit more of a well-rounded taste of where we're thinking we could possibly be in 20 years. And I'm gonna <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Can you can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, first of all, <laughs> I feel a bit like a caboose that's been trailing after this wonderful, wonderful excursion. We've had so much to learn, so much to absorb, and I'm really grateful to Sean for hosting this event, uh, to Maura for putting it all together, a miracle, <laughs> and to Haas for co-sponsoring it. Um, what I'd like to do is to give you a little insight into the property of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, which is located in East Hampton, New York, in a community, a very small kind of backwater called The Springs. There's a little controversy over whether it's actually The Springs or Springs, but I have chosen The Springs because I'm, uh, I'm Orthodox. As the steward of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center, the former home and studio of Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock, I believe that understanding the relationship between the artist's surroundings and their creative practice is crucial to interpreting their abstract imagery. Actually, I think I'll go back to that first slide so you can get a sense of what the landscape looked like. Uh, this photograph was taken by Martha Holmes in 1949, so it shows you the openness and that little body of water behind them is called Akabonic Creek. By relating their paintings to the indigenous context, viewers can appreciate the strong influence of that place on their artistic vision. And I think this is especially enlightening in the case of Pollock and Krasner because their achievements are essential to the development of abstract expressionism which is considered an urban phenomenon with its roots in the New York City art world. Now, both artists received their training in urban settings. Pollock studied sculpture at Manual Art High School in Los Angeles and dropped out in his senior year, which was 1930. He moved to New York City to attend the Art Students League, where he studied with Thomas Hart Benton, who, of course, was Grant Wood's colleague in the Regionalist Triumvirate. But Pollock grew up on farms and in small towns in the rural West. Isn't this adorable? He's, he's the cute one in the middle. Uh, the, the youngest, this was taken when he was about three years old. He had four brothers. And this was taken on the family farm in just outside Phoenix. Actually, it's where Phoenix Airport is today. So anyway, he had grown up in uh, the rural West and he later attributed his sense of spatial expansiveness to the vast horizontality of the land, which he experienced in his youth in Arizona and California. And the photograph of him with his father taken on the North Rim, his father was an unsuccessful farmer and he changed his professions to become a surveyor. And he was responsible for laying out the road to the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. And when Jackson was a teenager, he went and worked with him on that project. Although he later downplayed Benton's influence and disingenuously dismissed him as, quote, a strong personality to react against, unquote, Pollock gained not only technical know-how from Benton, but also an attitude toward the source of artistic stimulus that would remain with him long after he outgrew his teacher's approach 
to representational subject matter. Benton prided himself on having personally observed every character and situation depicted in his scenes of contemporary life. And he encouraged his students to base their imagery on firsthand experience. Now Pollock took that to heart, but for him, experience provided the springboard rather than the subject. Even after rejecting Benton's regionalist aesthetic, transitioning through the influences of Mexican muralists, surrealism, and Picasso, and developing his distinctive personal style of all over abstraction, Pollock stayed faithful to that approach, only he turned it around. Instead of picturing what he experienced, he expressed how he felt about his experiences, often in response to natural phenomena. Although Krasner was born and raised in Brooklyn and attended high school and art school in Manhattan, she described her East New York neighborhood as rural, not a city. And this Jerome Avenue, or Jerome Street, as it was known then, is the street that she grew up on. She was, she was actually born in Brownsville, but the family moved to New York when she was quite small, and that's where she attended school. And there she is on the porch of their house in, Brown, in Brownsville, in uh, New York, with her sister Ruth. This is Lee, and this is Ruth. On her way to elementary school in the early 1920s, she walked past yards filled with beautiful flowers. I loved it, she recalled. A backyard with irises and wild daisies, bridal veil and lilac, and roses on all the fences and in the backyards. She later credited that experience as the origin of her nature-inspired imagery, which would not develop until she, after she left the urban environment in the mid-1940s. Krasner created no landscape paintings as such, or if she did, none has survived. Her initial training at the Cooper Union and the National Academy of Design was highly traditional, based on figure study from casts and live models, or herself if she didn't have the money for a model. And here you see a self-portrait that she painted in the basement of her parents' home. Uh, she is holding a little flower, and behind her is a fern. So you can see there is some nature reference there. But this was done under the direction of Leon Kroll, who was one of her teachers at the academy. However, she had an epiphany in 1929 when the Museum of Modern Art opened with an exhibition of paintings by leading European modernists. As Krasner's nephew, Ronald Stein, remarked to me, that's when Lee stopped going to temple and started worshiping at MoMA. <laughs> Needless to say, this newfound enthusiasm did not go down well with her instructors at the academy, one of whom was, went so far as to advise her to, quote, go home and take a mental bath. And you can see this very Cezanne inspired still life. That's an example of her transition to modernism. And here's another example. Uh, modeled on a very, very similar Matisse of 1915, I think it is, that was in MoMA's collection. Krasner left the Academy in 1932, and Pollock finished his training with Benton the same year, by which time the Great Depression had devastated the economy. With over 25% of the workforce idle, opportunities for young emerging artists to forge careers were virtually non-existent. Fortunately, thanks to various government employment programs, especially the WPA Federal Art Project, which ran from August 1935 through early 1943, they and many of their contemporaries were able to develop as artists throughout the period. And these are just a couple of examples of the type of work that they were doing while they were on the WPA. But in 1937, while earning her weekly WPA paycheck, Krasner enrolled in the Hans Hoffmann School of Art and learned the principles of cubism, which she applied to figure studies at still life arrangements, as well as non-objective mural designs for public buildings, none of which were executed. She joined the American Abstract Artists and exhibited her neo-cubist paintings in their annual group shows. In 1941, she and Pollock were invited to participate in an exhibition 
of American and French painting. At that time, his work was, as his brother Sanford described it, abstract, intense, evocative in quality. When Krasner saw it for the first time, by her own account, she was bowled over, those are her words, not only by its emotional intensity, but also by its innovative character. And this painting, which is now in the Tate Gallery in London, is the painting that Pollock submitted to that exhibition of American and French painting. The one of Krasner's, which was very like the one I just showed, uh, is now lost. This caused her to rethink her devotion to Cubism and to embark on a quest for a more personal, subjective, and expressive way of painting. This transition continued after she and Pollock began living together in their Greenwich Village, in his Greenwich Village apartment at 46 East 8th Street in 1942 and until the end of the WPA in 19, early 1943, after which their financial picture was pretty bleak. Now the day was saved by Peggy Guggenheim, who included one of Pollock's paintings, and uh, here is the one, now known as stenographic figure, in her avant-garde gallery, Art of This Century, on West 57th Street, and was so impressed, and it's a long story, so I am compressing it, that she became his patron. His contract with Guggenheim provided a $150 monthly stipend and famously a mural commission for her Manhattan townhouse. And that mural will return to the Stanley yeah. Museum, University of Iowa, when it reopens on August 26th. And an annual solo exhibition at the gallery starting in November, 1943. Within a year, Pollock went from, become, from being an unknown artist with no prospects to the protege of one of the foremost collectors and promoters of modern art. To say that this put him under pressure is an understatement. And to release that pressure, he drank. Pollock had been a heavy drinker since his teenage years and had been treated on and off for alcoholism and depression throughout the 1930s and early 40s. Now, the periodic binges that made him unreliable and exacerbated his mood swings threatened to derail his nascent career. And here he is uh, at the home of Thomas Hart Benton on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, Benton became uh, more than just a mentor to him. And even after he no longer was associated with Benton, he would periodically visit and also contacted him right up until the time of his death. So Benton was a really a seminal figure in his development. And I think that that's often underplayed but we really, we really have to acknowledge Benton's influence. So Krasner, uh, who had put down her, her, her own ambitions in order to promote him, not that she stopped painting, but she just didn't promote herself, was desperate to keep Jackson on track. But it was an uphill battle in the thick of the New York art world where diversions as well as drinking buddies were plentiful. Now, Fortune smiled on them in the summer of 1945 when they accepted the invitation of their friends, Reuben and Barbara Kadish, to share a beach shack on Louse Point in the Springs, a rural backwater five miles outside the village of East Hampton on eastern Long Island. And this is, at the time, it was just a fisherman's shack with no plumbing or water, and it had... Um, uh, it was pretty much uh, just a, a leaky roof place to sleep, but now this cottage just recently sold for over a million dollars. So it shows you how times have changed. Anyway, East Hampton had been a mecca for landscape and genre painters since the 1870s, when Winslow Homer and the Tile Club came to town. In 1883, Lippincott's magazine dubbed it the American Barbizon where the Art Students League had established a summer outpost and critiques were held in the village hall. The first custom-made studio residence was built for Thomas and Mary Moran in 1884. And the studio, as it's known, is a National Historic Landmark and a Haas member site. It was soon followed by other, mostly seasonal homes, where artists such as Child Hassan, Ruger Donahoe, and Bruce Crane painted the charming scenery and quaint rustics. 
But by the time Krasner and Pollock arrived in August 1945, the Depression and World War II had taken their toll on the local economy. And the earlier generations of representational painting, painters was dying out. Summer influxes of emigre surrealists escaping from the sweltering city had kept the art colony lively during the war years, but they were transient. Krasner had decided that she and Pollock should find a seasonal rental, only not for the summer. Her plan was to sublet the 8th Street apartment, which would finance a cheap winter rental in the springs, where they could get down to business without distractions. There were no other artists in the neighborhood, and it was 100 miles from the New York art world. And there it is. So this is East Hampton Village is down here. And if you took a horse and wagon up this road for five miles, you would get to Springs. So as I say, there were no other artists in the neighborhood. And it was 100 miles from the New York art world fishbowl in which Pollock felt exposed and vulnerable. He rejected her idea as crazy. But after they got back to town in mid-September, he changed his mind and proposed instead that they leave New York and move to the Springs full time. Then Krasner thought he was the crazy one. Not only did they did isolating themselves from the city's stimulation and opportunities seem risky, but they had no money to buy a house. Pollock was adamant, however, so they set about making his pipe dream come true. As it happened, they did have a foothold in the area. Their friends, the critic Harold Rosenberg and his wife May Tabak, a writer, had bought a summer cottage in the Springs in 1944. The Rosenbergs let them use it while they house hunted. And within a few weeks, they found a property that suited them, a homestead overlooking Akabonic Creek with a barn that could serve as a studio. The asking price was $5,000 which was 5,000 more than they had. But they could rent with an option to buy. And the local bank agreed to a $3,000 mortgage if they could raise the $2,000 down payment, 40% down in cash, which Krasner hoped Guggenheim would lend them. So in November 1945, November 5th, Pollock and the newly minted Mrs. Pollock, they had married on October 26th, moved in with no guarantee that Guggenheim would come through. But a few days later, she arrived to check out the place with one of Pollock's collectors, William Davis, who encouraged her to agree, and the loan was forthcoming. As Pollock wrote to Reuben Tadish, and here you see the letter, after getting Guggenheim's approval, all there is to it now is a hell of a lot of work, and it doesn't frighten me. In April 1946, they took title to the property at 830 Springs Fireplace Road and started customizing it. The shift to country living was, as Pollock put it in a letter to their friend, Ed and Wally Stratton, a little tough on a city slicker. His farm boy years were long behind him, and the house, built in 1879, had no plumbing or central heating. Wartime rationing was still in effect, so they were limited to one bucket of coal a day for heating and cooking. And an interviewer once asked Lee, well, what did you do when you ran out of coal? She said, we went to bed. <laughs> they also had to use wood, which Pollock reported burns like paper at $21 a cord at a time when $21 was about half a week's wages. Thankfully, his new contract with Art of this Central, oh, I should point out, here's the coal stove. And this thing on the side, this is where the hot water was cooked. So thankfully, his new contract increased his monthly stipend to $250. And their mortgage payment was only $37.98 a month. I think I hear some groans in the audience. So that as their bank records show, they were able to afford what they needed, even if the Springs house didn't provide the comforts they were used to in their Greenwich Village apartment, like steam heat and an indoor toilet. But in spite of the hardships, especially during the first winter, there were compensations. 
Writing to her friend Mercedes Natter not long after the move, Krasner described the, quote, trials and tribulations of trying to get settled, unquote, but added, it's very beautiful out here. Pollock echoed that observation in a note to the Stratons, written in June of 1946, to report that he was having the barn moved to open up the view to Akabonic Creek. The country is wonderful, he declared, and asked, when are you coming out? In August, confirming the date for their visit, he informed them, we have a boat and a goat. The most significant advantage was quickly apparent in their work. The isolation, which could have been stultifying, had the opposite effect, and both artists experienced bursts of creativity that signaled new directions. The transition was remarkably rapid, especially given the conditions under which they were working. Krasner staked out a space near the Franklin stove in the back parlor, probably the warmest room in the house. And this photograph was taken a little bit later. But um, Pollock's studio was upstairs in an unheated bedroom, only about 10 by 14 feet. Eat your heart out, Grant Wood. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but it has a north window and another one facing east toward the creek. And that's the view you see here from the upstairs window. Although the view was partly blocked by the barn. And if you look here, you see this concrete pad? That is the original barn floor. And then there's a lean-to section over here that had a dirt floor. And after it was moved over to the north side of the property, that was simply left in place. So the block, although the view was partly blocked by the barn, it evidently had a positive effect on Pollock's imagination. The first group of works he painted in that room became the Akabonic Creek series, a collective title that Pollock himself applied. While their individual titles don't relate to the body of water, which is what you see in the back there, or the surroundings, there are hints of nature influence in constellation, bird effort, and magic light. His imagery was still pictographic and symbolic, but the series is notable for its bright palette and looser structure as compared to the darker, uh, more congested compositions uh, he was creating right before his move. It's as if the expansiveness of the field and the salt marsh and behind the house and the broad coastal vistas at the nearby bay and ocean infused his imagery with color and light. The Akabana Creek series was quickly followed by Pollock's Sounds in the Grass series, a transition to all over jet abstraction, using thick impasto to build up lively surface textures. Here, the painting's titles refer directly to the intangible natural phenomena that inspired them. Sounds in the grass, croaking movement, shimmering substance, eyes in the heat, for example. Without literally picturing those phenomena, and after all, how can you picture croaking movement? Pollock invented elusive imagery to express their effect on his imagination. Now, both series, 16 canvases in all, were shown at Art of This Century in January 1947. In his note for the catalog, Bill Davis remarked on the show's somewhat gayer mood, and the critic Clement Greenberg pointed out that, quote, Pollock has gone beyond the stage where he needs to make his poetry explicit in ideographs, unquote, calling attention to the more upbeat tone and expression in the new bodies of work. Krasner, too, was rapidly developing a novel approach to abstraction, independent of subject matter per se, yet not directly reflecting the natural environment in its imagery. Like Pollock, she abandoned even the most stylized references to objects in space, creating instead hermetic fields of color and gesture that she later called her little image series. Begun in 1946, it occupied her for some four years. Most are untitled, but the titles of the early works in the series suggest that Krasner, who always named her paintings after they were finished, recognized analogies to nature in Shell Flower, a veritable mosaic of agitated paint dabs, nightlife, which could suggest fireflies flashing in the dark, and noon with its scallops of radiant pigment. 
By 1947, after years of experimenting with liquid paint, Pollock adopted it as his primary material, using it to create classic poured paintings that earned him international acclaim. Before he decided to number his works instead of naming them, many of the seeming, seemingly non-objective compositions were given titles with earthly and celestial references, such as Enchanted Forest, Shooting Star, The Nest, Comet, Watery Paths, Sea Change, and Reflections of the Big Dipper. Even during the heyday of his so-called drip style, people saw analogies to nature in his numbered works adding descriptive titles like Autumn Rhythm and Lavender Mist, which coincidentally has no lavender in it. And after returning to more conventional painting techniques later in his tragically short career, he once again used nature as an interpretive guide. The deep, gray rainbow, ocean grayness, moon vibration. It seems clear that the environment continued to play an indirect, even subliminal, but crucial role in Pollock's artistic imagination until alcoholism and dissipation ended his painting career in 1955. The following spring, he had a friend with a bulldozer dig up glacial boulders on the property and pile them behind the house with the aim of carving them, turning directly to nature in a last, dish, a last ditch effort to reignite his creative spark through sculpture, a tactic that sadly failed. The stones remained in their natural state, untouched by the artist who died in a car crash in August, 1956. After Pollock's death, Krasner painted a group of three darkly voluptuous canvases that expressed her anguish and torment combining plant and animal forms in grotesque couplings. They seem to have served a cathartic purpose, for in 1957, during her first summer working in Pollock's former studio, while still mourning his loss, she began a series of upbeat, nature-inspired abstractions. Later collectively titled Earth Green series, they were characterized by one of her friends as an antidote to her grief. Among them are Sun Woman 1 and Sun Woman 2, Spring Beat, Thaw, and The Seasons, a monumental canvas that testi testifies to nature's fecundity and regenerative power. Throughout the rest of her career, and she died in 1984, Krasner remain, would maintain that she could not imagine herself, as she put it, outside of nature. <clears throat> It was part of her, just as she was part of it, and it profoundly informed her creative vision. Although she had a studio in the city, the Springs environment continued to serve as a source of inspiration and imagery, which tended to manifest itself even when highly stylized. She often turned to others to name her paintings, and those who did came up with titles reflecting a range of natural phenomena, from the darkly turbulent cobalt night and night bloom to the lively pointillistic flowering limb and August petals. And I should point out that in 1953, Krasner suffered a broken arm. She fell and broke her right arm, which was her painting arm. So in order to paint, she actually devised a strategy of holding her hand with her left arm and painting, which is one reason why her style became so agitated like that, rather than the sweeping strokes that she was able to do when she had free range of motion, which she ultimately did again. There was a seed series in 1960, as well as major a major canvas dedicated to Gaia, the Greek goddess of the earth. Her final painting, Morning Glory, finished two years before her death, incorporates the first line of a poem of that title by Howard Moss and directly paraphrases the plant's flower and leaf shapes. Visiting the Pollock Krasner property today, it's easy to see why both artists blossomed, if you'll forgive the pun, in this environment. Away from the art world's influence, they responded spontaneously to their surroundings, internalized and synthesized those impressions 
and invented new ways of expressing their subjective responses. In 1946, when Pollock said the country is wonderful, he could hardly have imagined just how full of wonder it would be. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Victoria, and thank you, Helen. I think what was really great about these three presentations is they remind us that these sites remain active and that they are singular and there is no individual model by which they are preserved, created, and function today. So I think if we want, we were gonna have just a few moments for Q&A. Um, I wanted to see if there were any questions in the chat. Pardon me? Okay, great. And so are there any questions in the room? So I have, oh, Lisa, go ahead. Lisa, go ahead. And I wanted to ask Sean if you've written and haven't read it, but if you could tell us a little bit more about the spider and see what happened to Kate told us today that she left. Yeah, Sean, if you could come up to the podium to answer. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do not know enough about the 1932 fire um, in the studio. Um, except that it did uh, allow him to change the flooring there. Um, I, uh, I understand there is a recently discovered film um, in which uh, there's an interview with Dan Wood Graham and she talks about uh, things that were destroyed in the fire itself. But I have, personally have not done enough research in, uh, with regard to that or what caused it, so. I wanted to ask Victoria a question um, because we were talking about it um, uh, in some of our downtime of speakers, this idea of what COVID has meant um, when most of us uh, who are practitioners had to close our doors. Um, and it did create a scenario in which a lot of people were able to work on archival projects and other types of projects that had been put on the back burner for many years and sometimes decades. But in addition, something that Victoria has alluded to, which is the activation of other spaces on your property and what that means, and what that um, thinking is. And so you start um, in deference to time rush through those slides and um, I thank you, but I'd love for you to come up and sort of talk a little bit more about what it means to be a contemporary space that is accommodating visitors today and what it means to then extend out into a landscape that was also such a key part of Alice's work and life. Thanks, Valerie. And yeah, sorry, I ran out of time there a bit. But, you know, um, it's it's really um, the idea of um, sort of working through being inclusive in the interior and inclusive of everyone's histories and stories and, and Alice's uh, complete story. Um, the natural progression is to look at what, you know, the house was really one of her muses. And that includes the park. It's, it doesn't sit separate to the property, right? But the property is really the space because you're looking in that site, which is preservation, where the floorboards are pressure. So you can't have too many people in a space at once, simply because of the preservation of the house and the wear and tear, but also now because of COVID and social distancing, look at ourselves right now in this audience. But um, the park's a different scenario. And being that it is so integrated into her story and her work, and it is part of the studio, I view it as part of the studio, it's then a site where um, it can be activated for community partnerships. And um, actually, it, it's a site that we had already been taking photographs on and with 
groups, but not as fully as we are today, uh, activating all areas where there's uh, this summer, there'll be outdoor exhibitions. Uh, we'll be hosting Staten Island's uh, Photoville on, on the site and throughout the meadow. We'll be having a stage where um, I invite uh, and curate community groups to perform Saturdays, Sundays, There'll be film nights on Thursdays, Tuesdays, poetry, and really um, allow a full breadth of um, creative um, performance and engagement. Um, and of course, you know, we do things like yoga at the site and dance um, and that kind of thing. But it's really to embody that idea that we are a living, breathing museum and we can change and we can be inclusive and at the same time invite those moments, be able to have a platform where we can talk about Alice and have moments where we can educate um, and hopefully be really inspired by her and her world. And like I said, I'm very, very interested in the garden as a safe space um, and how that translates to, to lots of different communities, the North Shore community of Staten Island is extremely diverse. Um, and to really take that a step further um, with Alice as our lead. Um, for as long as you can stay, <laughs> there is a question from the audience, uh, from our online audience of why was Alice evicted from her home? And while I know the answer, I am going to let you. I'll answer that really quickly. Uh, Alice lost all of her money in the stock market crash of uh, 1929. Um, her and Gertrude struggled to stay in the house. They had a tea room. They tried to, uh, apparently Alice wasn't as hospitable as Gertrude. Um, she liked to uh, host who she, who she enjoyed, but um, they were unsuccessful and very sadly um, were evicted from the home. During that process, um, Alice was very fearful of losing all of her glass plate negatives and she gave them over to the Staten Island Historical Society, which Gertrude and Alice had been active with. And so they have the larger collection, which is now known as Historic Richmond Town, but um, in very recent history have not, uh, do not acknowledge the relationship between Alice Austin and Gertrude Tate. And as museum professionals in this room and scholars and such, I'd just like to say that the job of archi archiving and everything else that we end up touching is an extremely precious one. Because when I was preparing the slideshows to celebrate Alice and Gertrude's relationship, I asked the archivist of 27 years that worked with that collection to pull a past perfect on photographs that Alice took of Gertrude Tate. And there was only about eight so I looked through manually because, of course, there were so many more. And this is a person that's identified most people in Austin's photographs and continuously Gertrude was listed as unknown woman. Thank you, Victoria, for bringing it back to something that we discussed earlier in um, the conference. Um, yes. I have a question for Helen. Great. Helen, um, can you tell us if Krasner foresaw the home as um, a museum? It's not exactly a museum, but a pilgrimage site. And was the foundation established during her lifetime? Did she plan for this? Or how did it come about? Yes, try to repeat the question. Yes, the question from Sue Taylor, uh, who did a wonderful presentation, by the way, for us uh, in our lecture series on stenographic figure, that painting that Peggy Guggenheim uh, responded to. Uh, the question is whether or not Lee Krasner foresaw this uh, as a historic site or as a museum, and whether or not her foundation was created during her lifetime. It was not created during her lifetime. She left provision in her will to create it. She envisioned it as a philanthropic organization that gives grants to artists, and that is indeed what it does. The Pollock Krasner Foundation is headquartered in Manhattan. It's been in existence since 1985, 
and it has given millions of dollars to needy and worthy artists all over the world. It does incredible work, but it is not affiliated with the House Museum. Her will specifically separated the two entities and offered the house or the property, which as you see here comprises five buildings, and the, it was offered to any organization, a nonprofit that would be willing to take it over and run it as a quote unquote public museum and library. So she did envision it as a public site. Unfortunately, she didn't leave it any money. <laughs> so they got the money, we got the real estate. Uh, they have been very, very good to us. They've been very supportive. They did help us establish our endowment. And uh, so even though we're not technically affiliated, we are sort of joined at the hip. But we belong to the State University of New York at Stony Brook's private foundation, the Stony Brook Foundation. So those are two completely separate foundations. And the Stony Brook Foundation took over the deed to the property in 1987, and the museum was opened in 1988. And it comprises the house. There is the rock pile back behind it. This is a, an automobile garage. All five buildings were original to the property. This is a little utility building that is now our museum store. Behind it is another utility building that was an extremely important piece of equipment, the outhouse, <laughs> now decommissioned. We actually have a restroom over here in the garage, or one with a flush toilet. And this is the barn that was moved from the area over here to the north end of the property to open up that view to Akabon Creek. And inside the barn, the major change that we made was to remove a floor covering that had been installed in 1953 when Pollock had the building winterized. So that covered the wood floor that he had installed after it was moved, on which is the residue of all of his most famous board paintings. He used that surface from 1946 until it was covered in 53. And then after that, it was just a white, and again, he used masonite. He, like Grant Wood, liked masonite, a nice firm surface, but he had these baseball games that his brother had made on masonite, and there were a lot of them left over. So that's what they used for floor tiles. They were, they were very frugal. They never threw away anything that was remotely useful. So that was put down on the floor in 53, painted white, the walls were painted white. So instead of it being a rough wooden structure, as you see in the photographs of him, the famous photographs of him at work, it became a clean white cube. We took up that floor covering and revealed all of the colors and gestures from his most famous paintings. And on the walls, you'll see the remnants of Krasner's painting. She liked to tack the canvases up and, and work vertically. So you'll see the remnants of Gaia, portrait in green, memory of love, and, all these other pictures that she painted in that space. So it actually reflects the two of them quite, uh, quite significantly. And we have a virtual reality tour that returns some of those paintings to the studio. You put the headset on, you feel like you're in the space, the wood walls come back, the paintings come back, and then the paintings come back on the walls as it was in the 1960s. So it is not the real thing. We don't present it as such. But since we don't own their art, it's the only way we can actually expose people to the art in the environment where it was created. And it's very effective. People really enjoy it. It's expensive, but we got a grant. Thank you. Helen, tell, tell us, or your, your audience maybe, since I am emphasized in my talk uh, earlier, about the journey to get to the site. <laughs> How do your visitors, because uh, I suspect we have some Iowans here, <laughs> know, uh, know where you are exactly. So how do your visitors find you? Well, find us on the internet. <laughs> That's how everybody finds everything these days. But we're uh, in a resort area. East Hampton, of course, is a famous resort area. And one of the things you have to be prepared for when you come is the traffic. And we're open from May to October, so the best time to come is in May and October, because in the summer, the local roads, like if you've ever been to the Cape, you know what I'm talking about, there's one road in and you're on it. So that can be a little bit challenging. But as you can see, our parking is quite limited. And with COVID, again, it makes us rethink things because we, by necessity, and I think, you know, all of us who run historic sites have had to really 
you know, take, take a step back. We have decided to go by reservation only because when we had people popping in and we're right on the road, this, this parking lot leads, leads right out onto Springs Fireplace Road. So we're extremely visible and people would just pull on the curb and park on the, on the road and it, it really wasn't working. But it's a much better experience for the visitors to be able to be taken around personally and it's less crowded, less wear and tear on the property. And so people will go on our website, book a tour, and do it that way. And it really has worked much better. Jane, I think you had a question. Yeah, I had uh, two questions. So with Jack Moore Larson happening, I think we can get there at Belmont And I'm just curious if you are if you have a partnership there and you have this, I know everyone is suffering during COVID. And then secondly, with SUNY Stony Board, do the students get the questions about partnerships. First of all, with Jack Leonard Larson Longhouse, which is another uh, site nearby established by the, the uh, fabric designer Jack Leonard Larson. It's a 16 acre sculpture garden and his own personal collection of decorative arts, which since his death last year, uh, no, I guess it was 2020, yeah. he died. Uh, he envisioned it as it has been open to the public for many years, but he did envision the house being open as well. And they're in a transitional phase now, but you can definitely visit the gardens and it's absolutely wonderful. And part of our, we have a, a network like Haas, but local uh, called the Hamptons Arts Network of about 20 different sites, uh, cultural attractions in the area. People think it's just, you know, all about the beach and the big houses, but no, we have a little more going for us than that. And a lot of these organizations uh, have clubbed together to publicize all the different cultural attractions that are available. Now, as far as Stony Brook is concerned, we are 65 miles from campus. So we don't have a lot of direct activity, but we do have interns. Uh, we have students who do research. And we have a study collection at our Southampton campus, which is about 20 miles from the Pollock House, because we took over the Long Island University campus there about 15 years ago. And we have a beautiful library with the archives. We have the catalog resume archives. We have photographs, we have documents. So that was one of Lee's. Remember, I mentioned that she wanted a public museum and library. So that's the library aspect of it. And we have scholars come from all over the world to use our collection. We'll get the last one, Lisa. <laughs> we'll let no, we'll let Lisa ask Helen or whoever or privately. But let's go to the gentleman right here. I have a question about storytelling, specifically the management of storytelling at, at these great places where artists do so much things. Stories that people would be back to other people and say, Well, what the heck? Um, and I'm curious because there's a short version you write in the brochure, there's a long version you write in the book, scholarship, visitors come with stories, and so there's this interest in stories, and so I'm wondering how that's managed. And I'd like to start with Victoria because I'm, I'm curious. I noticed that visitors to Austin, uh, the Thomas Austin House, have uh, been pretty TikTok videos. They go viral. They're great videos and they're very interesting. So, are you prompting some of those um, efforts or some of those from staffers? Because uh, it just seems like people are so excited about sharing stories from the Austin Austin uh, reinterpretations. Uh, yes, so all of the programs are grounded in storytelling. So, there is a lot of prompting and uh, uh, support for it. Uh, um, being able to make uh, connections and 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 teaching and creating programming in, in a way that is accessible to all um and and so that's what you're seeing and certainly that very viral TikTok was um uh, uh an offshoot from a podcast that i was the very first person that was interviewed for someone lived here but yeah the site is extremely inspirational too so yeah, we try to help that along with the storytelling. Yeah, I, I think I, I'd like to just speak to that in a sort of overarching way is that I think increasingly um, 
the ethos and philosophy of sites across the network, all of which range so much in terms of what they retain in material culture, their location, how easy it is to access, the list goes on and on and on, is to really tap into um, contemporary engagement in storytelling. And I think it, it is the way in which Haas sites differ um, from what is accomplished through exhibitions and catalogs and museum going, but also because for the very reason that it is in domestic space and therefore is a gateway for everyone, I think importantly in, uh, and Victoria has touched upon it and Maura has touched upon it. We have all sought to reevaluate how we commune with our personal space, how we will commune with it in future, which is really just, we're starting to unpack. And so these personal singular environments that were the hub of so much life lived, remember these artists were living in real time. We silo them in segments of um, art historical inquiry or periods of interpretation. But when you go and you stand there, there is that connection back to the personal and the connection back to one's own experience. And I think that coupled with the fact, this is what I always say about Hoslites, the creativity is in the DNA and it's still there in a place like Grant Wood Studio where it is represented in all its materiality because you see the things that he created to live and work sometimes in process, like on the Pollock Krasner floor, sometimes by linking inspiration, like the photographs to specific spaces that you encounter in Alice Austin. There's something else that happens at Haas sites. And this to me is what I would like you all to think about when you go and contemplate whether you would like to make a pilgrimage close or far, <laughs> is that that spark, and that life lived in the confluence of those two things together resides in actually every single person. And when we're small, we embrace that about ourselves and we don't question it. But as we learn, and in my instance, it was the violin, which I pursued for a very long time, even with like important uh, musician instructors from Juilliard, but at a certain point, you make a decision about whether you're going to be an artist with that capital A in air quotes, right? And when we make that shift, we often put all of those aspects of ourselves aside and we start to question them from, should I paint the wall this color? Are the objects I'm collecting okay should i do some drawing or make a tintype or whatever it is and what sites like this invite you to do is to re-examine that questioning and to tap back into that via the people who live there via the contemporary programming and the contemporary artists that these sites actively engage with but something perhaps more important and more visceral is to do it for yourself and that is the message that for me, I want to every one of these sites is worthy of conferences and monographs and exhibitions. And every time you go, it's new and I believe that. And so as the spokesman for all 55, <laughs> I say to you, that is what this is about. And I hope we've captured some of that magic in the last three days that then will force you to go out in the landscape or in a site itself, uh, not just tomorrow, not just next year or whatever these current changing times hold, but really, hopefully, for the rest of your lives. What a perfect way to end this weekend. Um, this has just been phenomenal. And I love all the feedback we've been hearing amongst each other. And it just, oh. <laughs> before I forget, there's one last thing that is going to be taking place downstairs. Valerie's book, um, and it's really Haas's book in many ways. I mean, she championed it right, but it's all about everything we've been talking about 
and it is, it is, a, it is available downstairs and uh, she'll be available to sign them. And also just check out the museum store because it's wonderful. Um, I have to do a few last minute thank yous because I've gotten so much credit from the stage and I'm like, well, I'm not, it wasn't alone. So anyway, I want to again extend my deep appreciation for the speakers and the session leaders and also the people who have attended both in person and virtually because this has been a very dynamic, thoughtful discussion and it was such a wonderful way to crawl back out of quarantine. So thank you very much. Um, second of all, uh, the word miracle was just used. Um, and I think that the speakers and the virtual audience would agree that the miracle of this running smoothly would not have happened if it weren't for Luke McLaren. <laughs> Jim asked for a favor. I met him on Thursday and oh my goodness. So thank you so much. Um, next, I'd like to thank Jim Hayes and the National Advisory Board, especially the committee that was planning this, that collected the papers, that went, that through their networks gathered these amazing scholars and uh, professionals in this uh, in this arena. And those members are Wanda Korn, we've heard her name several, you've met them all throughout this uh, process, but Wanda Korn, Joni Kinsey, Trip Evans, Jay Malosh, and Jim Hayes. So thank you to the committee. And finally, um, this event wouldn't be made possible if it weren't for the support for ha with support from Haas, the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, and the Iowa Arts Council. So thank you again, and thank you guys for coming. This has been wonderful.